We are now streaming live on YouTube. Isn't that something? All right, we're ready to go. Good morning. This is Jonathan Steinberg, State Representative from the 136th District of Westport, co-chair of the Public Health Committee, to welcome everyone to another day of the Public Health Committee's public hearings. We have, I think, roughly 10 bills to uh, accept testimony today, and we'll get started shortly. Uh, just to remind everyone of our general ground rules, uh, you need to make sure that you indicate that you are willing to participate by hitting the blue button at a certain juncture, and that will give you access to our waiting room. And when we recognize you, we will uh, unmute you and make, make you available to speak with us for roughly three minutes. And we will remind you at the end of the three minutes that your time is just about up. We ask everyone to respect that, to keep themselves muted otherwise. Um, and uh, if you have any issues, you can contact our staff. Without further ado, I will hand it off to my esteemed co-chair, Senator Anwar. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Uh, I am Senator Saud Anwar, uh, representing the 3rd Senate District uh, and currently serving as the acting co-chair of the Public Health Committee. Honored to be here. We have some very important bills, a lot of uh, uh, important uh, aspects to these, and I'm uh, joining the entire committee to listen in to uh, people's uh, views, perspectives, and advocacy or concerns. Us and, and looking forward to working with all of uh, my colleagues today to uh, listen in. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Jonathan, you're muted. Okay. You, you, you're fine. You now need to unmute again. Okay. Okay, um, I would just like to say good morning to everybody. My name is Heather Summers. I represent uh, the 18th Senatorial District. I am uh, the ranking member on public health. I'm looking forward to hearing everybody's testimony. And I just wanted to mention that many of us have multiple meetings today or hearings today. Um, so if you see people popping in and out, it's not trying to be disrespectful. It's just that there are concurrent meetings. There's an environment meeting, a transportation hearing, all on the same day today. So I just wanted to let people that may be testifying or watching this today, let you know that all of us um, are wearing multiple hats. So if you see legislators in and out, um, please do not take it as a sign of disrespect. Thank you, Senator. That is an excellent point. We've reached the part of the session whereby we're all double or triple booked almost all day long. So uh, it's important that we hear everybody's testimony, but we also strongly suggest that you submit testimony in writing as well to ensure that we get to hear what you have to say. Good morning, Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And indeed, uh, it, it is another busy week at the General Assembly. So I'm eager to hear everybody's perspective and I'll be reading testimony as well. Thank you very much for the opportunity and uh, let's get going. Well, I do have to at least say hello to Representative Pettit and then we can get going. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ready to go to quote FDR, be brief, be sincere, be seated. Okay. Uh, and so when am I going to hear something? Okay. Uh, let's remember that get, everybody should stay muted. Okay. Representative Zupkis, thank you. Now we, I believe, we're ready to go. Uh, first up on our list this morning, bear with me, is uh, Claire Botnick from the Office of the Governor. Good morning. Good morning, all. Pleased to be here. Claire Botnick from the Office of the Governor. Uh, given how uh, many folks we have on the call, I'm going to defer to the subject matter experts and we'll be very happy to answer questions on the governor's lead bill um, or the interstate compacts bill, uh, House Bill uh, 5045 and 5046. Um, and until then, look forward to your questions. Thank you so much. That was the fastest first testimony I've ever heard, frankly. Um, I think you caught us unawares, Claire. Um, I, I'm not sure any of us. Oh, there we go. Thank you, Representative Pettit, for bailing us out. Now, here we go. Representative Pettit, followed by Senator Summers. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the biggest issue, we've brought up the issue of lead over the past five legislative sessions and I've always been stymied by the issue of bodies, people to implement and money. Can you just speak to that for 45 seconds as to how we propose to do it since that's been the objection over the past five sessions? Absolutely. Um, so you'll, you'll see that the, the bill is a standalone, but the governor has also proposed a separate allocation in the budget of 70 million of ARPA dollars uh, to address your exact question. Um, we know that there are significant constraints on local public health and public health has been um, doing important and grueling work for the last two years. And it's critical that local health has the uh, resources at its disposal in order to be able to execute on um, the bill, which brings uh, Connecticut into compliance with public health guidance on this issue, where we've fallen significantly out of step with both our um, neighboring states and, and with the CDC and American Academy of Pediatrics. So thing one is that you know, we must get uh, into compliance with public health expertise on this issue by dropping the level. And the 70 million allocation is, is really there to support um, lo local health departments in the implementation, cover administrative costs that will be associated with the increased number of cases that we expect to catch when we drop the level um, and to uh, you know, be there to meet that need. Um, and we hope to work collaboratively with the public health department and with local health and municipalities in order to design that portion of the funds. And then, you know, of course, the bulk will be directed towards the remediation project. Um, and unfortunately, you know, the, with the existing funding that we've had, we've just never been able to keep pace with the number of cases. Um, and so our hope is that this, uh, you know, significant allocation will be there to uh, meet the number of cases that we expect will be triggered by, by the changes to this law. The other thing I would like to direct your attention to is uh, section four of um, HB 5045, which um, directs DSS to explore funding uh, under Medicaid authority for um, investigations and also for some case management. And we've been working with DSS on this already, um, and it looks like we will be able to um, potentially seek reimbursement for um, epidemiological investigations, which are you know, what a lot of the labor is um, at the local health level, going out, checking out these homes, making the investigations, and that those actually are eligible for reimbursement. Some of our neighboring states um, have already uh, begun to seek reimbursement for these services. Um, and we think that we may be able to do the same in, in Connecticut. And of course, I'll defer to the uh, DSS my DSS colleagues on this to, to share more. Um, but we're excited that there might be a, a, a sustaining funding source there uh, that we would be able to tap into that might be able to support this more long-term um, than the immediate infusion of funds of ARPA. And that, that, that answers partly the follow-up. So part of it, hopefully it comes through DSS and the governor plans to increase funding over the, over the long haul as this will obviously be an ongoing expense until I don't know when, until all the lead paint houses are are finally gone. I don't know how many years that'll be. Well, again, we expect there to be an initial um, bump in cases, but more and more of these houses are coming offline each year, right? And every time we invest in one of these projects, we're making a lead safe home for a, a family here in Connecticut that will hopefully serve for the long term. So while we expect there to be an initial infusion, and, and that's what this 70 million goes towards, um, over time, more and more of these homes are coming offline. And so uh, we're hoping to make significant progress on eradicating uh, this problem that has just gone on for, for too long. Thank you. Senator Summers. Yes, uh, thank you for being here uh, this morning and um, thank you for the initiative on lead. It's very, very important. I have a question on the um, medical licensure compact. And my question is, could you speak to who that includes for the people that are listening to this hearing and why it appears that nurses were not included in this compact, which we think are really, really important um, on the public health committee. We've tried to have a nurses compact before and, and I feel that if we don't include them, we're, we're really dropping the ball. So could you speak to that please for people that are listening and also for people on the public health committee that may not understand why. Absolutely. 
Thank you, Senator. Um, so House Bill 5046 um, introduces both uh, the physicians and psychi psychologists um, for the interstate com licensure compact. Um, and, and we'll hear more about this in, in testimony today. Um, the physician compacts uh, includes uh, uh, doctors of medicine and doctors of osteopathy. Um, and as you all know, uh, you directed Public Health Department to convene a working group last year um, to explore where it might be appropriate to join interstate compacts. Um, and so we undertook that process. Uh, we studied five different professions over the uh, last year. Um, we looked at nurses, we looked at APRNs, we looked at physical therapists, we looked at physicians, and we looked at psychologists. Um, and after an intense study um, with stakeholders at the table, um, many, many hours of discussion and, and, uh, and expertise brought to bear, uh, we determined that these were the two most appropriate for, um, for your consideration for, for this legislative session. Um, physicians, of course, are important as telehealth uh, continues to expand. Um, after all our docs on the front lines have been through over the last couple of years, we wanna provide them the flexibility to both be able to treat folks who are coming from out of state to seek um, care here in Connecticut, and then also to be able to follow their patients who, uh, you know, who, who may be uh, traveling or spend part of the year in another part of the country. Um, this will really help with continuity of care um, and an improved quality of care overall um, and, and potentially reduce costs. As, as telehealth has, has been shown to do. Um, so we're very excited about um, introducing the physicians this year. Um, same for psychology, which of course, mental health has been on everyone's mind um, and improving access to mental health care. Um, the psychology compact is critical to that. Um, and we're excited that uh, the psychologists um, have the opportunity to potentially uh, work more easily and follow patients more, more seamlessly as they move between states um, Nurses, uh, we we studied a lot, and um, I'm sure that you, you'll hear testimony on this today. Um, but the structure of that compact um, is is a little bit different from the physicians and the psychologists. Um, and although there are many benefits, including addressing nursing shortages, um, there there was not consensus among the group. And so, you know, we look forward to discussing it in session. I'm happy to answer any other questions, and, and I know that um, some of my nursing colleagues will uh, be excited to share their perspective as well. Thank you for that. I, you know, I, I am disappointed nurses are not included. I think they're critical to our continuum of care and, and other states have joined a compact. So I'm hoping that that's something that we can revisit in the future. Thank you for your time this morning. Thank you. Uh, a couple of questions. Uh, following up on, on what Senator Summers just said, I think we all agree that even though the nurses, potential for a nurses compact is a little bit more complicated than for the uh, groups mentioned in this bill, that they are a critical resource and a significant shortage for services across the board. And all I can say is that many of us in the legislature through uh, either this bill or through other bills um, will continue to see if we can find a way to uh, increase the, uh, the nurse workforce in any way we can. So we appreciate your openness to continue that conversation in that you've already had a working group, I think maybe we would benefit from an offline conversation about how you reached where you did and whether there are, are any avenues for increasing uh, nurse availability. Um, getting back to uh, Dr. Pettit's point with regard to lead, I think he, he hit the key point I wanted to make as well. The uh, $70 million in, in federal funds will go a huge way towards addressing what we know is a serious problem with a serious backlog. But uh, I remain as concerned as he that what we've seen in the past is the reason this hasn't gone forward has been a lack of resources within health districts. And that is something that may or may not be successfully addressed with the $70 million. And in fact, really may require an annual increase in the funding of, of every health district. So I am encouraged but nervous about depending on Medicaid dollars to finance this. And I'm hoping that the administration will remain open-minded as well about the possibility of increasing the uh, budget that uh, provides the per capita, whatever funding we give the districts. 
because they made it very clear to us, as a representative Pettit can tell you, going back four or five years, that they can simply not enforce a stronger standard without the staff to do so. And after we get through the backlog, we're still going to have an ongoing problem and only a sufficient budget allocation is actually going to accomplish that end. So uh, we appreciate this. This is long overdue. We're going to solve a lot of problems, maybe fix some pipes and paint, but this doesn't necessarily address the long-term problem of enforcing an appropriately rigid standard. If I may, Representative, one thing I'll just add is um, we look forward to hearing from our colleagues in New Haven today who have already successfully dropped the level and have been living with this new standard. Um, and we're working with them to understand exactly what resources were required in order to accomplish that so that we can really understand the scope of the problem and, and how the 70 million can be parceled to, to allocate towards those administrative costs as well. So um, thank you so much. Thank you for that. And I'll just point out that um, I'm very pleased that New Haven has figured it out, but there are huge disparities in the size and the capabilities of our various health districts. And what may be available in a city with a large department may be very different for a suburban or rural community. Are there any other questions or comments? If not, uh, we wanna thank everyone in the governor's office for joining us today and for putting forward bills that we strongly endorse and expect to uh, move to this committee pretty quickly, if I might speak on behalf of all of us. Uh, it, without further ado, thank you for your time. We will move on next to Commissioner Giutani from the Department of Public Health and her staff. Good morning. Good morning. Um, good morning, Senator Anwar, Representative Steinberg, Senator Summers, Senator Huang, Representative Pettit, and members of the Public Health Committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of the bills before you today. House Bill 5045, an act to reduce lead poisoning, will align Connecticut's lead laws with current public health guidance from the CDC and the American Academy of Pediatrics. Over the next three years, this bill will gradually reduce the blood lead level that triggers parental notification, education, and interventions such as home inspections. And the bill also requires more frequent testing of children living in communities most at risk. It is important to address lead poisoning as lead exposure has been found to adversely affect child health. I'm so pleased that this committee has been so supportive of this measure as has already been heard. And really lead is associated with decreases in academic performance in school age children and can have lifelong impacts on cognitive function. And lead poisoning is really a health equity issue. We know from our data from 2020 that non-Hispanic, Black, Hispanic, and non-Hispanic Asian children under six years old were respectively 2.6, 2.2, and two times more likely to be lead poisoned compared to white children. So there is clear evidence that the data prove that there are existing disparities in lead poisoning in the state that need to be addressed. Now, in terms of House Bill 5046, that will allow Connecticut to join interstate medical uh, licensure compact and psychology interjurisdictional compacts. Both of these compacts will facilitate telehealth and in-person practice across state lines for physicians and psychologists, as we've already heard. And what we found during the declared COVID-19 emergency is that executive orders suspended in-state licensure requirements and these orders enabled out-of-state licensed practitioners to practice in Connecticut, but that these orders are set to expire and these compacts will allow physicians and psychologists in participating states to participate and practice in Connecticut. Expanding the pool for our communities, we hope to grow the number of professions that can join compacts in the future. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. I'm open for questions. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, and it's very nice to say confirmed, Commissioner. Thank you. Uh, let's delve a little bit more into the issue that I was trying to raise with the governor's people, which that even if this bill may be directed to the communities in greatest need, we all know that given the housing stock in Connecticut, which is part of this sort of perfect storm of aging infrastructure, that we've got problems across the board 
it's not just uh, inner city communities, it, it, communities are across the state of all sizes. And I get back to the point about how we have significant differences in the capabilities of health districts. And when there may be enough uh, people to spread around in, in an urban district with a large department, many of our districts are quite small. And unless they get uh, a significant uh, increase in funding, they will probably only be able to address the problems we seek to for a limited period of time until these funds run out. Um, how confident are we really that uh, we will succeed as other states have in securing annual Medicaid dollars sufficient to meet the need? And can those Medicaid dollars be applied to communities where they may not have a large uh, disadvantaged community? How are we gonna make sure this is gonna happen the right way? So I think your points are very well taken as you, you know, expressed with uh, Claire, which I think is very legitimate. This initial infusion is to get the ball rolling in some of these communities. Now, Commissioner Gifford is coming up, I believe, eighth in the list of people to testify. And so I'm going to ask her to address specifically the issues on Medicaid funding because she's best equipped to really answer that. But I do think that a long term plan starting with these funds and then where it can go forward, we'll be able to help address some of those concerns. Thank you. And I think basically many health districts in our state could use a shot in the arm of any kind. So right. uh, this would be very helpful. Senator Onwar followed by Representative Pettit. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to make a comment. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. And then thank you for the entire team for being here today. Um, I, I really, when I wear the public health lens, I really like these bills. Um, uh, the, 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 the return on investment for lead abatement is, is generational. And, and, uh, and it's probably one of the best use of the infusion of funds that we have right now, because we have spoken about this year after year and said, if we had the money, we would fix this. And then here we have the money and we are fixing it. And, and I think it is kept... Uh, in a manner where it is going to be much easily accessible rather than having such stringent rules which would exclude individuals and families. This is going to be a, a generational change for people living in certain communities. And, and I, I, as I was speaking to various groups, I said, look, in your town, start to map out the high risk areas because you need to be ahead of the curve to try and, and say, hey, we need this fund because this is where the, the community is going to have issues. And then, of course, um, the towns have had some of the opportunities to, to identify some of the risk areas. Um, not every town has the resources to have health departments, a robust health department. I think that's where I fear um, if they will be left behind. Is there a way to work out a strategy on that part? Anyone in the team can answer that. And the other part, I think, I just wanted to make a comment on the medical licensure and, and, and some of those in the current environment that we're living in, that's going to be a lifesaver as well. And, and I recognize that you cannot do anything and everything for everyone, but you have a starting point and then you start to increase that. So I, I appreciate that part as well, but I also recognize the nursing needs because uh, that's where we are uh, way behind right now. So a couple of comments and a question. Thank you so much again for Commissioner Ewan and the entire uh, governor's team. Thank you very much for that, Senator Anwar. So I just wanna make a couple comments and answer some of your questions. So first of all, I'm in complete agreement as a physician, as a public health practitioner to address this concern. It is to me still unbelievable that there are children who experience lead toxicity in the state of Connecticut. This is something we need to fix. There's really just no other way to say it. If you look in certain communities and question behavior and acting out and IQ and some of the other psychological impacts that we're seeing through this pandemic, and then you have something like lead that is underlying some of that and is often confounding some of those things in some of these communities, it's just, a travesty that we have not been able to do it before. And so this $70 million, you know, there are two things that are happening here. The lead, the bill changing the language on the levels is one thing, but it's one thing to have an unfunded mandate where we can't even expect people to do things versus 
infusing $70 million now to try to get it started. So this is so critically important. It's generational. It will impact generations of children going forward, which will be able to make a huge difference in many of our communities throughout our state. Now, at the same time as we've got this going on, we are getting an infusion from the federal government that is being addressed in the environmental protection uh, you know, side of things and in that committee regarding lead service lines. And so there's another attack at reducing lead levels, which again is very important because it addresses these same things. Now to your question, I'm gonna go to Lori for a second, but you know, one thing, and then I wanna answer the compact question too. The, you know, in terms of the local health districts, you know, what, or, or departments, what we've seen is that there are certain local health departments that are still too small to qualify for per capita. And one of the things that we've seen over many years is that more and more small health departments are combining. We've seen recently a number that have joined other health districts, which is then increasing the amount of per capita that can go out to address these concerns. And I encourage local health departments to continue those conversations because it does allow for that opportunity. I understand the benefits of both strategies and certainly every community has to think about what's gonna work best for them. But that is at least something that's out there to be able to help with this as well. Now, in terms of the compacts, I just wanna you know, say that I'm fully supportive of doing what we can in terms of increasing the nursing pool in our state. And we've identified through the discussions that have happened so far, some of the barriers to the nursing compact. That doesn't mean the conversation's over. It doesn't mean that this can't be revisited again. So specifically to your, conversa your point on local health departments and districts and getting access to some of this funding, Lori, I don't know if you have other comments that you want to make other than what I've said so far. Commissioner, thank you. Um, Lori Matthew, Branch Chief, uh, work for Commissioner Jatani, Environmental Health and Drinking Water. Um, you no, know, Commissioner, uh, you mentioned the uh, bipartisan infrastructure law that was passed by uh, President Biden in Congress back in November. We're working really hard to move that forward uh, for our drinking water. Uh, lead service line removal uh, over five years, there'll be $148 million to, coming to Connecticut for specifically lead service line removal and specifically under the efforts of Justice 40 and Health Equity, uh, our colleagues at EPA um, have programmed in this money to help the people that need it the most for removals for, for people in um, uh, disadvantaged communities. This funding will go to help remove identify and remove lead service lines. So really very important uh, effort along with uh, Bill 5045 and the in influx of funding as Commissioner Jatani mentioned. Uh, it, it's an interesting time and it's a great, uh, this money's coming together at the right time with a focus on lead. So thank you, Commissioner. Can I ask a quick follow-up? Uh, thank you for your responses. Um, one of the thing is whenever there's an infusion, we know that some of our cities have the worst problem, but I, I also recognize that the problem is also spread throughout. It's, it's not when uh, the, the, the density as much as, as it is also when the construction happened and, and also some of the rural communities are impacted. Is there a way to make sure rather than a first come first serve, there's going to be some a formula to that equal distribution or fair distribution, if you will, because I know the inner city needs it like yesterday, but also some of the other communities need it uh, pretty fast as well. So uh, how can we make sure it's, it's fair across the entire state? So one thing I would say is that there's a specific focus as um, Lori mentioned on, you know, addressing these issues, particularly, I'm gonna just talk about the um, bipartisan infrastructure law for a second, the lead service lines, because there is a focus on making sure we send these dollars to distressed communities. That does not always mean and only mean inner cities. And what we're finding is that if we look at lead service lines, first of all, all the water companies need to do an inventory for us of their lead service lines. And we're seeing where there is a concentration 
of lead service lines. And as you mentioned, many of them are not always in the cities. Some of them are in old industrial neighborhoods where there are a lot of old lines that are in those areas. So I do think some of what we are gonna be looking at is where the inventory is. We're also correlating with lead poisoning levels in children, looking at that as well, which you know we do know our big cities have a lot of that, but there are other areas as well. It's really not just that. And, you know, Lori can talk to this a little bit more. It's not going to be necessarily just first come, first serve. We're going to be looking at the combination of all of these things. You know, what are our distressed communities? What is the burden of lead service lines? What is the burden of lead poisoning that's happening? All of these things put together to be able to, um, to, to create a priority list of who should get these funds. Lori, any other comments? Oh, Commissioner, you said it very well. Uh, to prioritize, um, we're starting to put together the map now. The map's now where we see some utilities are out in front, New, New London, New Haven, the Regional Water Authority, some others are out in front in identifying the location of their lead service lines, or at least what they think they know the lead service lines are, because that's a complicated business. Uh, but be able to focus where those where they believe that they are and focus with our information within our department and what we, our lead program gathers for where we know children are harmed, and then put that together with a mapping on the old housing stock. I think mapping all of that together and providing a focus and prioritization of where we know children have been harmed, where we know that uh, housing stock is old, and where we know possibly where lead service lines are. So that to us is, the, is a prioritization that we're just starting to look at. Thank you so much for for your comments and and you know it, it's a blessing uh, i don't know how many legislators have gone through this space not to have this conversation and now we are fortunate to have a conversation where we have money behind the issue that uh, a generation has waited for thank you so much uh, commissioner thank you uh, laurie and, and thank you mr chair thank you i'm going to beg uh, representative Pettis indulgence to follow up on the line of questioning with uh, laurie um, and, and by the way, we should all go out of our way to express our appreciation at the significant sum of money being applied to this. We don't mean to poo-poo it in any stretch, but we're trying to make sure it ends up in the right place. Uh, the commissioner made mention of the benefit potentially of continued consolidation of health districts. Laurie, I know that you and I have discussed in the past that there's the similar issue with the huge number of small water companies we have in the state of Connecticut, which may be more likely to have the antiquated pipes because they haven't had the wherewithal to do replacement. Maybe not, but um, isn't that still a factor in our ability to do an inventory and to prioritize funds? Uh, and, and don't we still need to find a way in which to make sure every water company in the state of Connecticut is in a position to maintain its infrastructure? Yes, uh, good question. And uh, a struggle has been uh, that in Connecticut, we're a small state and we have over 2,400 regulated public water systems. Um, of those, the community systems and the non-transient, non and I'll get you a list of these, the commu all community systems, which there are 500, and then there are another couple hundred that are non transient like schools and what have you that have to do an inventory of lead service lines. Now, when you get it, the, the larger systems are getting started on this, the smaller and medium systems and even the smaller ones that are tiny um, are going to struggle with the inventory. So one of the initiatives uh, that actually EPA headquarters and under President Biden actually has announced these EPA hubs, technology hubs, uh, which we were just learning about, um, this effort is just now getting started. And um, we would like to bring uh, people that could help the smaller systems conduct these inventories. And that's an effort uh, by EPA headquarters and EPA Boston. And we're working directly on that. This work is just getting started though. Well, at least there's a plan. I I'm there is. Uh, encouraged by that. Maybe we can all come together before the money runs out. Representative Pettit, Father Representative D'Amico. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, this is on, uh, get my number straight, 5046, the uh, Interstate Medical Licensure Compact. 
And as you know, in your testimony, there's 30, 34 states that participate. Unfortunately, as I understand it, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, and New York do not. The people surrounding us with whom we would hope perhaps to have the most interaction does. I, I have a, a couple parts of the question. Does entering into the, the compact and SIPAC preclude us from having other arrangements with the surrounding states in terms of expediting licensure across state lines? So it's a good question. Um, so, you know, obviously, as you've said, um, getting a Connecticut license is, of course, uh, you know, the most straightforward thing to do. Um, I'm going to ask Chris Andresen to follow up with a few follow ups. But before I go to him, uh, one of the other things I would just say is that, you know, in the behavioral health bill that's going forward, uh, we have included some langu language on, you know, expediting sort of uh, reciprocity of licensure for people who are licensed in other states. So at least in that front on behavioral health, we have included language on how we would do that. Uh, for other professions, Chris, do you have any other comments on that? Um, so so the, the, the interstate compacts, they provide another pathway to licensure in Connecticut. Um, you know, we still have the single state license and um, anybody participating in a compact, that's their choice to do. Um, I don't know, I'm not aware of any language in the compact that would stop us from other arrangements to create other pathways or other ways to expedite licensure for folks in Connecticut. And a little, Chris, since you're on, the, uh, the $5 licensing fee that goes to Haven, which provides mental health and other benefits yeah. for professionals to do the interstate compact or the SIPAC, the, uh, the psychology interjurisdictional compact, does that have any negative or impact upon the $5 fee for Haven? Yeah, so we, we definitely looked at that. And in the end, we're still looking at the numbers, but um, we will, we will, you know, there's two different kinds of um, compacts. One is sort of mutual recognition and the other is expedited licensure. So every physician who um, gets licensed in Connecticut through the compact will be paying that $5 fee. And based on past experience from other states, it looks like the increase in physicians is 10 to 15% increase in the number of physicians licensed in the state. So that's, um, you know, that's a good chunk of additional fees that will come in to Connecticut for physicians that are now getting licensed here. Now, the uh, psychology compact is a mutual recognition compact, um, but we, we weighed the number of licensees who are out of state now that are going to, that potentially would um, participate through SIPAC versus being licensed in Connecticut. And the numbers for physicians that will be coming in um, outweighs that. So they're actually, in the end, um, our current estimate is that there'll be, you know, nothing huge, but a, but a slight increase in funding um, that would come in, including fees to Haven. And perhaps to, to put you on the spot, we've at least had some behind the scenes conversations that, and that the, uh, the fee perhaps should be raised from five to $10 uh, per year. So I don't know everyone's licensing fee for physicians, it's upward of $600 a year. So $10 seems to be a fairly, tiny amount, 80 cents a month to pay for the ability to utilize Haven. Have there been any discussions or analysis of uh, what increasing the, the fee slightly may do to help the system? No, that concept just came up to us the other day. So we did, that wasn't a part of our discussions. Okay, and finally, perhaps back to the commissioner putting your clinical hat on, uh, maybe more of a global question in terms of the introduction the continuation of telehealth, and I suspect the different medical societies and docs that come on to testify will talk about this. Do we create some concerns about fragmentation of care? Uh, that is, I'm always getting my care via telehealth. And, you know, one, one day I talked to somebody from uh, Michigan about my arthritis and talked to somebody from Florida about my cardiology and there's some concerns about the overall healthcare system and how it potentially fragments it and perhaps puts people locally at a disadvantage compared to people who are doing telehealth from other places. I know it's a little bit vague, but I just wonder if you've had any thoughts on the, the potential fragmentation for clinical care. 
So, you know, I think at the end of the day, there is the potential for that. But I do think still ultimately that there is a value to inpatient and in-person care. (laughs) I hope we all feel that at some level. And, you know, no matter what happens at some level, that is necessary at some point. And I think for our patients, having that ability to have everything in one place, having that ability that your provider of X can see what Y is doing, other than, you know, letters can always be sent and stuff like that, but having your scans in the same place, having your notes in the same place, having the ability to go from a surgical procedure, follow up to medical, whether it be telehealth or in person, I still think that the driver there on the patient side and consumer side is going to be to consolidate. And really it's going to be when you don't have access to somebody or something that is so specialized or so different that, you know, and they're in some other place, you have an avenue, you know, you have that opening. Maybe there is the opportunity where you don't have to, you know, do the initial visit or something like that and buy a plane ticket or something or go make a big trip, which is what people are used to. So, so I do think that it will help streamline certain things, but also I think given the breadth of healthcare that we have in Connecticut, I don't, Ultimately, my gut doesn't feel that it is going to shortchange us in Connecticut. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Andresen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Just one quick question, uh, Chris. If we were to want to raise the Haven fee, is that something DPH does or does it require legislative action? No, the, the licensure fees and the Haven fees are all established in statute. We don't have the power to change those to consider. Thank you for that. Representative D'Amico. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, Commissioner, for coming uh, today and, and, um, and enlightening us. Um, and I also wanted to follow up on Representative Steinberg. Uh, congratulations on your confirmation. Um, so so I, I, um, I, I wanted to thank also you and your staff for, for providing me with good information with regards to um, one of the um, one of the items on our agenda for, for, for today, it, it's item number 10, uh, House Bill 5277, uh, an act concerning establishment of technical standards for medical diagnostic equipment that promotes accessibility in healthcare facilities. Now, I'm a little bit behind on my uh, reading of testimony, so, so I, I have to ask you, w- was your department able to submit testimony on this particular bill? So I do not believe that we submitted testimony on this bill. We submitted testimony on, um, on. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to tell you the name, the, the, the one. I think it's 5-1, is it 2-1 or 9-1 regarding um, pharmacies? And, I mean, pharmacies administering flu vaccines. But I do not believe we submitted testimony on the one that you're asking about. Oh, okay. Um, and, and, and that, 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 that's fine. Uh, so you haven't had a chance to review, um, uh, five, two, seven, seven regarding medical diagnostic equipment. Um, I'll have to get back to you on that one. I'm not okay. recalling that I did. I have submitted a lot of testimony, so I'm just double checking. Yeah. Okay. Um, but I don't yeah. believe so. Okay. And, and, and I'll just ask one general question then if, if I could, Mr. Chair. Um, um, so, so in, in, in the bill, as it's currently drafted, uh, it, 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 uh, it, it directs you as the commissioner uh, to adopt regulations uh, that establish technical standards for medical diagnostic equipment that meet or exceed the technical standards for accessibility that have been developed by the federal uh, uh, architectural barriers compliance board. So whenever I see the word regulations, I get a little bit nervous. Um, to your knowledge, w- is this going to be a, a, a procedure that's going to take an inordinate amount of time to develop these regulations? Or do you think that you will be able to take those federal regulations and incorporate them in, in a rather expeditious uh, manner? And you're specifically talking about uh, 5045, the lead part, right? That, no, no, that- I... I, I, I'm talking about medical diagnostic equipment in, 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 in medical facilities and, oh, and in hospitals that, and so okay. forth. Okay. 
in in that one okay yeah. um so on that one specifically um we are still reviewing this so i think i'm gonna have to get back to you on that one okay. to, to be able to answer that more fully okay I, I appreciate that. Okay, so I will. I guess we'll we'll talk. We'll talk yeah, later on. Yeah, I, I I apologize for that because no, I think no. it might take some time. So I think it'd be better for me to be fully aware of what all the considerations are before I answer that in terms of timeline. Okay. Very good. Fair enough. Th thank thank you, Commissioner. Uh, thank okay. you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you. And yes, I'll reiterate Representative D'Amico's point. We really do need DPH to help us understand uh, how and if we could implement this bill this year, it is certainly our intention to give it full consideration. So we look forward to your involvement as we try to figure it out. If there are no further questions, I wanna thank the commissioner and your staff and everybody from the governor's office for getting us off to a good start today on some really important bills. And we will now move to uh, Neil O'Leary, the mayor of the city of Waterbury. Good morning. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning to everyone. Good morning to our co-chairs. Uh, thank you very much uh, for allowing me to testify this morning, and I'll get right at it. I know how busy your day is. Uh, my name is Mayor Neil O'Leary from Waterbury, and I'm here today to present testimony in support of House Bill 5044, which would create an advisory committee to allocate a majority of the opioid settlement proceeds. I have reviewed this as has CCM. We believe that this is a well-drafted piece of legislation, but would respectfully request two modifications. I would like to provide the committee with a short- Mayor, you just went to uh, mute. Could you unmute yourself again, please? There you go. Oh yeah, thank you. I'm still getting all used to all this stuff. Okay. Um, as I mentioned, I have reviewed the legislation as well as CCM. And uh, we believe it is well drafted. We're just requesting two modifications to be considered. As the chairman of the CCM Opioid Settlement Committee, we were successful to encourage all 169 municipalities to participate in this settlement. Full participation was essential because under the settlement agreement, the penalty for non-participation was significant in terms of the amount of dollars that would be withheld from the state. For example, if only 75% of the towns and cities had agreed to participate in the settlement, the state of Connecticut would have only received 60% of the funds. As a result of our 100% participation, Connecticut will receive our full allocation. I would be remiss if I didn't mention Attorney General Tong and his staff for their efforts in this historic settlement. General Tong was a leader among state attorney generals in this opioid litigation cases. As mentioned, we would recommend House Bill 5044. Uh, consider two modifications, please. First, the leadership role of the Opioid Settlement Advisory Committee established in this legislation be modified. The committee is equally weighted in terms of representation between municipalities and the state. While we appreciate that equal weight, we note that the cities and towns do not have a leadership role in this committee. I can say that after speaking to almost every local leader representing the 169 towns and cities uh, in the state regarding this issue, the towns and cities believe that we should have a leadership role with respect to the committee because of the significant role the municipalities have played in effectuating this settlement, as well as the true successful impact in combating our opioid crisis will take place at the local level. Therefore, I would ask this committee to modify the legislation and provide that a representative of the cities and towns be named co-chair of the committee. And secondly, starting with Waterbury, approximately 40 cities and towns brought direct legal action against the various opioid distributors and manufacturers back in 2018. Many of those cases commenced, as I said, years ago, and the attorneys in those actions have done a fantastic job. As a result, they deserve to be compensated. Excuse Most me, Mr. O'Leary, your time yeah. is almost up. If you would please summarize. I'm Thank wrapping you. it up. Thank you. Most Thank of the, you. Thanks. Most of the council for the towns and cities have retainer agreements between 20 and 30%. As a result, I would ask that this legislation, legislation grant authority to the committee to award attorney's fees out of the settlement fund. It is necessary that the commission be able to award attorney's fees so municipalities won't have to pay those fees and those fees be capped 
at 15%. This would mirror the judge in the federal multi-district litigation ordered in the federal settlement. This result, if not allowed, property taxpayers would be responsible to pay those costs through their municipality's general fund. I urge the committee to amend the bill to include the aforementioned recommendations. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And thank you for bringing attention to a bill we also feel is very important. And we, we, we share with you our uh, congratulations of General Tong for all of his hard work and leadership. Uh, it, it actually opens up an era where we'll have money to apply to many of the uh, opioid and addiction related services that we know are so important to addressing our ongoing opioid epidemic. And we're hopeful that this will make a real difference. Uh, even though I may be a little wary of agreeing with you to give lawyers money, uh, I'm sure we can take that up with uh, the commission and when we get to that point. Um, are there any other questions? If not, uh, Mr. Mayor, thank you for taking the time to join us and for bringing up the two points that you raised. Uh, these are things we will, we will discuss before this bill is voted out of committee. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Co-Chair. I'm very grateful for your time this morning. Thank you. Next up, we have another mayor, Justin Elliker from the city of New Haven to be followed by Sarah A. Egan from the Office of the Child Advocate. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. Good morning, uh, Chair Steinberg and Chair Abrams, and uh, and to uh, ranking members Wong and Summers as well. Apologize for taking this meeting in my car. I'm kind of zooming around today, but I'm I'm here to speak in support of uh, House Bill five zero four five. Uh, there's been a lot of conversation already about um, the importance of uh, elevating our standard around lead. Uh, I think that the the most important thing here is uh, to ensure that our children aren't permanently disabled by lead poisoning. And New Haven has seen, uh, in comparison to uh, every other municipality in the state, a much higher uh, occurrence of lead poisoning in our young people. And uh, it is our ethical responsibility, but it is also within all of our financial self-interest to actually invest uh, in, the, in our young people and ensure that we have a standard that is based on the most recent um, and updated standards as far as lead, blood lead levels. In New Haven, we've had a standard of, of five micrograms per deciliter for quite some time now. The state's had a standard of 20, and we have been able to make it work. Um, and it's, I think it's important to under, underscore that this problem is very concentrated in, uh, in certain areas of the state that have a much higher percentage of uh, homes that uh, were built prior to 1978. Uh, and, you know, for example, New Haven has 3.7% of our state population, but 12.6% of the elevated blood levels that we see in the state are in New Haven. A lot of important questions about funding. Uh, one thing that's important is I, I understand the governor's uh, looking to put $70 million towards abatement here. In New Haven, we've also added to our local ordinance a mechanism that allows um, us to uh, have a fee structure around uh, property owners helping fund inspector time. Uh, we've also been able to secure uh, grants from HUD to help with remediation. And thankfully, um, with state dedicated state funding, that can help address this. As a, a father of uh, two young children, a three-year-old and a seven-year-old, I can say firsthand the fear that um, my wife and I, who have a house that is was built uh, over 100 years ago, have had around lead, and we're constantly concerned about our uh, young kids uh, touching windows and touching doorways. We're fortunate enough to have been able to um, remediate our apartment, but there's many, many families that live in rented apartments or don't have the funding to do this themselves, and so ensuring that we increase these standards is good for our kids putting money behind it and supporting that uh, those funding mechanisms is also vital. And uh, I, I know that um, the state has been uh, trying to do this for a long time and it's been difficult because of that funding question. Now is the time to act. We've done it in New Haven and uh, we believe everyone around the state, every young person around the state deserves to ensure that they uh, live healthy lives and don't suffer from the permanent disabilities of lead abatement. So thanks for the opportunity to testify and thanks for the work that you all are doing. Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor, for taking time uh, as you're driving around on your busy day. 
Um, you, you heard us uh, express a little concern about having adequate funding and uh, it, it's good to hear that uh, a city like New Haven, which has so many needs, has been able to address this successfully. Uh, I'm not in any way suggesting some sort of new mandate, but maybe you could share with us the language in the New Haven ordinance that uh, collects a fee and perhaps we could enable municipalities on an elective basis to uh, maybe emulate that structure in the event that the Medicaid funds do not prove to be sufficient to uh, allow smaller districts to staff up accordingly. So if you wouldn't mind, we'd love to see that, uh, that ordinance, if you could forward it to us. Would be very happy to do so. And you know, I also think it's important to underscore that the long-term financial cost is significant. We spend a lot of money uh, helping support students that ha have behavioral issues in our schools or um, are not succeeding academically. And uh, those types of behavioral and uh, cognitive disabilities are associated with lead. And so by investing young, it's not only the right thing to do, but it helps save us money in the long run. But very happy to share um, our experience here in New Haven and, uh, and the language of our ordinance. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. You make a good point. So many things that address the public health are best addressed early on versus later on when the problems are significant and tragic in many instances. So again, thank you for your testimony today. We look forward to further conversations. Seeing no further questions, uh, we're approaching near the end of our first hour and then we will start shifting between elected officials uh, and other officials and the public. Uh, but we'll move forward with Sarah Egan from the Office of the Child Advocate and then either uh, Mayor Bronin from Hartford or whomever is next up from the public. I'll get back to you on that. Good morning. Good morning uh, to the committee, Senator Abrams, Representative Steinberg, Senator Long, Senator Summers, and Representative Pettit, all distinguished members of the Public Health Committee. This testimony is being submitted on behalf of the Office of the Child Advocate. The obligations of the OCA are to review, investigate, and make recommendations regarding how our publicly funded state and local systems meet the needs of vulnerable children. Uh, just uh, Mayor Elliker's uh, testimony was a good segue, I think, into our testimony today, which is focused on supporting Bill 5044, an act implementing the governor's budget recommendations regarding the use of opioid litigation proceeds. We wanted to use our testimony to do a couple of things. One is to highlight uh, the impact of the opioid crisis for children in particular and underscore the need for the language of the bill to specifically reference, if possible, given the terms of the settlement, um, the ability to use funds to ameliorate injury as a result of the opioid epidemic and to ensure that the um, task force itself that's administering the funds have folks on it who specifically work for or advocate on behalf of children who are affected by the opioid crisis. Um, so those were two suggestions we wanted to respectfully offer. But for the committee's um, edification, we wanted to provide information that um, one of the uh, groups of children that are dr dramatically affected by the opioid crisis are children who are born substance exposed. We know that there are about 33,000 births in the state of Connecticut every year, um, and more than 1,000 of those children each year are born substance exposed. In 2019, there were 309 babies identified with neonatal abstinence syndrome or neonatal opioid withdrawal syndrome. And these children, same, similar to children who are lead exposed that Mayor Ellica referenced, also face a range of medical, developmental, and social challenges because of substance exposure. Another thing we want to make sure the committee is aware of is that infants who are substance exposed, both pre- and postnatally, are at greater risk for sudden unexplained infant death. Infants remain the largest cohort of children who die for preventable reasons around the country and in the state of Connecticut. Year in and year out, we find through our work on the state's child fatality review panel that a number of these babies are born substance exposed or are affected by substances postnatally. These are all preventable deaths. Every year, the state of Connecticut loses a future kindergarten class of children to preventable infant deaths. Um, one other highlight we wanted to make for you is that another tragic outcome to this opioid crisis is children who lose one or both parents to overdose. During the pandemic uh, from March 2020 to February 2022, the OCA was notified of 39 deaths of parents related to drug overdose and where the death was reported to DCF because of the presence of children in the home or family. 
These deaths impacted at least 75 children, ranging in age from months old to 17 years old. So Do you give any, Miss Egan, your time is almost up. If you please summarize, thank sure. you. I sure can, thank you. We wanted to highlight those areas, those ways that children are profoundly affected by the opioid crisis, and just recommend that in passage of the bill, um, that we, we put as much language in there to specifically reference their needs and to ensure that there are um, members and providers on the, um, on the committee, along with DCF and DMS, that can uh, directly speak to the needs of these populations of children. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, just to follow up on your, on your uh, statement, um, a lot of the focus of testimony to this point has been with regard to the composition of the those who will make the decisions on how to allocate these funds. But um, as much attention if not more should be uh, about how we're going to allocate these funds to be most efficient. And you've touched on a number of areas that really require uh, that kind of support focus. Uh, we're hoping you can work with us to make sure that once this group is constituted, that in the determination of their key criteria and priorities that we have your input. Uh, this may be a one in a generational opportunity to really address some of these longstanding problems, but you've been on the front lines and know precisely what has transpired during the pandemic and before. And we're really gonna rely on you to help us uh, establish a hierarchy of need. Thank you, look forward to that. Thank you, sir. thank you, Representative. I don't see any further questions. So again, thank you for your testimony today for your ongoing advocacy on behalf of everybody in the state of Connecticut. Next up, we have Mayor Bronin from Hartford, and then we're going to go to Kathy Woznoski from the Citizens Coalition for Equal Access. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. Good morning, uh, Mr. Chair, and to uh, all, to both chairs and ranking members and members of the committee, uh, thank you for the chance to testify this morning. I wanted to briefly testify in support of two bills this morning. The first is uh, House Bill 5045, an act reducing lead poisoning, and the other is uh, House Bill 5044, an act implementing the governor's budget recommendations uh, for the use of opioid litigation proceeds. Uh, as uh, others uh, have uh, spoken uh, about this morning, uh, lead poisoning uh, represents a serious threat uh, to the health uh, and well-being of children across our state and uh, reducing the threshold that triggers uh, more intense uh, follow-up uh, and epidemiolo epidemiological uh, follow-up as well as remediation is an appropriate thing to do. Uh, I would uh, strongly encourage the committee and the General Assembly to ensure that as this change is made, resources are also made av available uh, to municipalities to assist with the implementation of this bill. Uh, it is the right policy, uh, but it does uh, require additional investment of resources to ensure that municipalities can effectively implement the provisions of this bill. And uh, it is important that, that that funding follow the policy. Uh, the second uh, bill uh, regarding the, the uh, use of opioid, uh, opioid litigation proceeds uh, is uh, also a very important bill. And I want to, first of all, commend Attorney General Tong uh, for his work in achieving this settlement. Uh, and uh, as others have said this morning, I also uh, want to echo and represent the uh, view of the Connecticut Conference of Municipalities, which is that municipalities should uh, not only have representation on the committee uh, tasked with determining the best uh, way of distributing these funds, but also uh, provided leadership role and that a municipal official be placed in the uh, leadership position on this committee. Uh, as you know, uh, both the, the costs uh, and consequences of the opioid epidemic uh, are felt uh, profoundly at the local level and also uh, oftentimes the responsibility for reducing uh, and reversing uh, opioid overdoses uh, is, uh, is born at the local level. And we believe that it's important to have strong municipal voice in that process. Uh, I'll uh, stop, I'll be providing written testimony, but I'll stop my, uh, my uh, oral testimony there. And I'm again, grateful for the opportunity to testify in support of both of these bills. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, a quick question. Uh, when it comes to the sort of a municipal viewpoint, uh, do you have any general thoughts on how such funds need to be prioritized to benefit particularly bigger cities? Thanks, Representative. I, I, I do. Um, 
although there are plenty of others more expert uh, than I am, uh, I, I think as a state and as a country, uh, we have to do a lot more to expand access to medication-assisted treatment, medication-assisted therapy. It is one of the most effective proven means of com combating uh, opioid use disorders. Uh, and yet, as President Biden highlighted in his State of the Union, there are still some significant restrictions. Uh, while there has to be some change at the federal level, I think there's also uh, work that can be done at the state and local level and with the use of these resources to try to expand access to medication-assisted treatment therapy. Uh, I also think uh, expansion of harm reduction efforts uh, throughout the state can be a very, very important uh, part of saving lives uh, during this this uh, pandemic, the uh, epidemic. The other, the other thing that I would say is that uh, municipalities see the manifestations of the opioid epidemic in many, many ways, uh, including uh, in uh, homelessness, in unsheltered, uh, the, the uh, prevalence of unsheltered uh, um, you know, individuals uh, in our communities, uh, mental health disorders. And so ensuring that there are sufficient funds uh, to address uh, that intersection of problems is also vitally important. Otherwise, uh, I don't think we're going to be effective at helping uh, those struggling with opioid use disorder uh, rebuild their lives. Those are just a few thoughts. But again, I think that um, there, uh, there, there is a tremendous opportunity because of the funding uh, from the settlement bill, as well as uh, other sources of funds that have come in from the federal government. But I do think uh, ensuring that there's a strong municipal voice in that process is important. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, uh, I think you gave us some good points to start with, and I think we're all looking forward not only to having the money, but uh, applying it appropriately. I don't see any further questions, so thank you for your testimony today. Next up, we're going to go to Kathy Wasnowski from the Citizens Coalition for Equal Access, followed by Commissioner Navaretta from the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services. How are we doing with the next testimony? If we're not ready, we can go to the commissioner. I'm ready, would you like me to start? I'm just gonna give them another 30 seconds to figure out what's going on. Hello, this is Ruth Groby. Can you hear me? Representative Steinberg. Yes, we have you I'm on the from list. the Citizens Coalition for Equal Access and Dallas Emerly told me that I could just click on a um, movie that I, a video that I have of Kathy Wanoski and I clicked on it. I guess maybe the screen share hasn't happened yet to, sh to share the screen with me so that I can play this video. We can't even see you, Ruth, so you may need to be doing the more basic step of entering into the as a panelist. Uh, why I, don't you have a conversation with our staff? Oh, there you go. Um, can I so try again? Then? Can, can I try right now to play the video again? We'll give or, it a shot. Go ahead. Okay, thanks. I think her screen share is not working yet because we don't see her screen. Okay. We're going to come back to you. We'll give you a okay. chance to uh, work out the details with our staff. Uh, keep the flow going. We'll go to Commissioner Navarro. Thank you. Good morning, Commissioner. Good morning. Good morning, Senator Arnoir, Representative Steinberg, and distinguished members of the Public Health Committee. I am Nancy Navarretta, the DEMAS Commissioner, and I'm offering testimony on HB 5044, an act implementing the governor's budget recommendations regarding the use of opioid litigation proceeds. This important piece of legislation proposed by Governor Lamont codifies the opioid settlement agreements as negotiated by Attorney General Tong. The bill ensures that proceeds from the litigation against various pharmaceutical distributors and manufacturer Johnson & Johnson, as well as any future opioid litigation are directed to evidence-based strategies focused on eradicating the opioid epidemic. The bill requires an opioid settlement advisory council made up of a wide range of stakeholders, including representatives from state, 
and local governments with subject matter expertise, healthcare professionals, individuals and families with lived experience, and a leader in racial equity in public health. The bill establishes a non-lapsing opioid settlement account. The bill ensures fair and transparent distribution of any settlement dollars with shared legislative and executive branch in insight and oversight. Oversight of the funds includes annual reporting on fund use to the public health and appropriations committees. Demas has been aggressively responding to the opioid crisis, as you know, which has tragically persisted over many years and for, was further aggravated by the isolation and reduction in treatment availability during the pandemic. The opioid settle, settlement monies will augment numerous evidence-based initiatives specific to preventing and treating opioid use disorders and supporting individuals in recovery. The monies will also allow for implementation of new initiatives. The 26 billion dollars in global settlement with Johnson & Johnson and distributors alone will increase the dollar amount invested in substance use services by DEMAS by more than 10% over the next 18 years. DEMAS will serve as the administrative support for the Opioid Settlement Advisory Council and for fund allocation and distribution. As the State Substance Use Authority and co-chair of the Alcohol and Drug Policy Council and an agency staffed by behavioral health experts, Demas is well positioned to serve in this capacity. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on this important bill. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, you've obviously heard testimony from the mayors who preceded you about the importance of a balanced perspective. Um, I offered uh, Mayor Bronin an opportunity to, to emphasize areas that of need, and I think you did a, a great job in emphasizing those as well. Do you foresee that the, uh, the priorities that, that you've mentioned are, are, are consonant with what the municipalities see as well, uh, or is there gonna be a little bit of back and forth about where these funds should go? I, I do, I think they, that we are in agreement at this point in time. Um, the group will make these decisions. The advisory group will make them together. Um, what I have heard previous um, testimonies um, spell out are evidence-based practices. So distribution of naloxone, um, increasing access to low barrier, tr barrier treatment and medication assisted treatment, harm reduction. So these are all things that um, certainly can be amplified with these dollars. Before I hand off to Senator Anwar, uh, one area that we've talked about in the past that's been an issue has been the prevention and monitoring side. And uh, we've, we've had a consolidation of the five regional organizations that we've asked to take that on, but funding for that group has been problematic to say the least. And I know the agency has struggled to leverage Medicaid funds and, and grants in order to keep that program going. Would you advocate for some additional funding to also address the front end of the opioid crisis, which is really a lot of focus on prevention, education, and effective monitoring of, uh, of the various services that are involved? Uh, prevention and um, early intervention are certainly important legs of this stool. So prevention, harm reduction, treatment, recovery supports, all of these are important components of our response to the opioid crisis. Well, we appreciate the bill this year that uh, DEMAS has agreed to that uh, recognizes the, these five entities uh, in an important way, but uh, I hope you also will work with us to make sure they're adequately funded. Uh, next up is Senator Anwar, followed by Representative Foster. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Commissioner, for your testimony. Um, this is a good bill uh, from the governor's office and in your office. I, I can tell you in the Public Health Committee, we were exploring uh, a bill and, and we were going to say exactly what uh, parts of this bill say. We wanted to make sure that the money was going to be used um, in a transparent manner. It would only and only be used for this uh, purpose with the, the lack of use of the tobacco settlement for tobacco prevention has caused us, many of us, some pain. And fear was that, God forbid, something like that may happen over here. So you'll see a lot of tobacco-related uh, 
bills as well, which we are going to be asking that tobacco uh, uh, settlement funds would be used in the same fashion in a transparent way to have prevention strategies going forward. But this bill actually, through the leadership of your office and the governor have already taken it upon themselves to say, hey, this is what our priorities are. And we truly appreciate that at this point. And, 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 um, and the work that uh, your office has been doing in this very uh, difficult situation with the opioid uh, epidemic, now, we know that we need a multi-pronged approach in this uh, um, uh, challenge. And, and we just heard from uh, Mayor Bronin that there is a, a push for a local strategy, which makes sense. But, but to me, it's, there has to be a balance because there has to be a statewide effort. There's hardly any community that has not been impacted uh, by the, the opioid issue. So there's a broader statewide strategy, and then there's a local strategy from the implementation. Have your office been able to look at how the resources will be shared and what would be the central point of coordination of this and, and how frequently you will assess the, the efficacy of the strategies? Um, thank you for those questions, Senator. It's very well spelled out in the bill itself. So the bill spells out the balance between state and local representation. It's going to be very important for whoever is named by the governor's office, by our office, to, to really make sure that they're representing the constituents that um, they represent. So um, I think that it is uh, a nice, diverse um, group of folks, not too large, not too small, that will be able to um, put in policies and procedures regarding these dollars, which would be part of the work. No, no, I, I know the committee makeup, but I'm, I'm looking at, so you, you feel at this point, your office is not ready to say that 70% is going to be central and 20 30% is going to be in, in the towns and communities at this stage. Uh, of the overall settlement, 15% will go directly to the municipalities. Um, but I will not be making the decisions of uh, regarding what gets spent where in terms of what goes through the committee. So I will be facilitating that group, but it will be up to the group to just make those decisions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Look forward to getting some updates and, and, and uh, having a major uh, positive impact on fixing this major issue. Thank you so much, uh, Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. I, I, I agree with you. You may not be responsible for the allocation, but we're looking to you to help us make sure that we allocate it wisely. Representative Foster followed by Representative Parker. Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, Commissioner. I'm so grateful to have you here answer questions about this bill today. My community, um, I think in a lot of ways before I was elected to office, I didn't realize how hard hit um, my community was across the spectrum by the opioid pandemic and uh, epidemic. And I have realized recently um, that in a lot of discussions, there's a lot of family advocates who have lost loved ones to opioid addiction who feel like they are, they don't know where to go. They're like advocating and screaming in an echo chamber, talking to lots of other parents who have lost children and they feel like we're not making quick and expedient progress to bring relief. And I think that in a lot of ways, a committee like this can give a place for those families to talk to where action can be taken. Do you think that that is likely to happen? That these family advocates that have been leading and trying to organize around um, issues around opioid addiction are going to find a place with open ears here on advocacy issues that they can help say this would have made a difference for my child um, and this is something that we're some place that action could be taken. They will definitely both parents and and people with lived experience will definitely be a part of this group and be voting members of this group so they will be represented re represented on the um, advisory committee probably the, the better forum and that is already existing for folks to get involved is the Alcohol and Drug Policy Council. So that is a larger forum where people can um, d uh, address anything related to harm reduction, prevention, treatment, recovery supports, um, and give in input. And we've it's a very active group that is broken down into subcommittees. We also have uh, convene a parent group to get parents input um, so that we know what's going on. Uh, the 
in the municipalities and with parents and families. So I'm happy to connect whoever would like to be connected to that group as well. I would appreciate that if we can connect offline and have that conversation. Um, sure. My my last sort of two comments and questions is related to the opioid pandemic. There have been a lot of conversations happening in our community about naloxone distribution. Um, and I don't know if it would be under the purview or possible with some of the allocation of these funds to see that there is some better inventory management and sharing of resources related to naloxone um, between schools and the police departments. I hear from the East Windsor Police Department that they're taking three doses of naloxone to administer a phase. But then I'm also hearing from the schools that they're grateful that they have it, but they're not using it and it'll expire and then they have to purchase more. I would love to see a group like this or some somewhere um, have a coordinated purchase so that we're getting the best savings and price possible for naloxone and it's being distributed um, to all of these agencies, but that we're also seeing doses not go to waste um, and enough because our, our, our local departments are, are struggling to keep up with the need, particularly since they go through so much in a single phase. Is that something you think would be possible here? Um, thank you for that question. Um, yes, so Demas plays a key role in the distribution of Narcan. And what we've been doing recently because of that issue that you just raised is we will take back before uh, the naloxone ex uh, um, expires, we'll take it back and we'll give that to a fast moving organization like a harm reduction organization that can use it quickly and replenish the original supply, whether it's a police department or a school department. I've talked directly with the commissioner of um, SDE. So um, we have municipalities reach out to us all the time. So we are happy to coordinate that and have have done that um, to date. Okay, that, that would be great. I think, I'm not sure if anything has changed recently with the last conversation that I had had with my local police department, they, that was a struggle that they were really facing. They were having a really hard time keeping up with their need. Um, but I knew that the school within the same district was having, you know, not using it in the school setting. I feel like I should be knocking on wood for that, but um, but I, I appreciate it. So my last question is, I am I am really grateful every time that I see evidence-based treatments um, up, be a part of anything that is related to health and wellness and public health. Um, and one of the evidence-based treatments for the opioid pandemic, something that has a lot of emerging evidence and a sustainable funding model is community health workers. I feel like I might sound a little bit like a broken record in this committee because we talk about community health workers across all sorts of public health crises. They're a low cost, Medicaid reimbursable opportunity to um, have evidence-based community intervention. Is that something that we can shift that dynamic and sort of see some of this fund used to start the movement in that direction of having community health workers? We have um, heard from a, another legislator who had a community navigator model be an evidence-based opioid um, intervention in their community. Um, Representative Buckby's community had an option like that. And I just think that there are communities all around the state that are funding um, through grants, short-term positions that are community health workers. And if we see the shift to Medicaid reimbursement, which I understand is not under your purview, but perhaps the advocacy across departments would allow us to see that transition happen. Is that something that you think that this committee could um, help be the impetus needed to move in that direction? Sure. I mean, I, all suggestions are welcome. And um, I think we have to look at anything that is going to turn this this tide. So we are happy to look at any suggestion brought forward. Okay. I appreciate that. And I look forward to hopefully the opportunity to connect offline. Thank you so much for your testimony today. And thank you, Mr. Chair, for the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Representative. Representative Parker. Thanks, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Thank you, Commissioner, for being here with us this morning. We appreciate it. Um, I have two questions, if it's all right. The first one, um, and, and this may be for you or maybe for someone else, um, just I, I noticed in the language that a few of the members on the committee are designated as non-voting. I was wondering if you can speak to why that is the case, how those decisions were made, if it's important, um, just as we think about what the makeup is and, and why some people have one role versus another. I, I think anytime there is a non-voting member, it's um, probably around conflicts of interest and making sure that the 
um, committee as a whole is weighing in representing um, people that they're designated to represent. That's my understanding. Okay, I, I appreciate that. I know there was a section about committees of uh, conflicts of interest being um, not a reason for people to not take part as long as they were uh, disclosed and discussed. So maybe uh, offline we can get a bit into why some of those <clears throat> folks were not um, had the non-voting designation. Um, thank you for that. The other question is, I don't know if you heard the testimony um, from Sarah Egan a few minutes previously. I guess this is a specific question, which maybe can speak to something overall. She brought up the idea of having funds used to ameliorate injuries specifically for young people harmed by opioids, specifically even substance exposed infants. Does that fit within the scope of your understanding of what's outlined in this bill? I'm wondering, I guess, specifically for substance exposed infants directly who have directly um, negative impact, that's maybe a clearer fit. But maybe now if we're talking about sort of a round out from that of young people whose parents have been impacted directly, can, can you maybe just help us get into how you think about that direct versus indirect connection and if that fits inside this bill? Does, does the question make sense? Yes, it does. Okay, thank um, so thank you for that. So the department um, already works very closely with DCF around this population. We have specific programs for pregnant and parenting women um, who are, um, have a substance use disorder. So this is something that um, we have a strategic plan around. We, um, again, like I said, work closely with our DCF partners. And uh, whenever you have that nice infrastructure around prevention and treatment, it's easy to amplify that, uh, that programming when it's shown to be effective. So um, in that sense, in terms of working with pregnant and parenting women, we're also working with um, women who may go see a PCP and or OBGYN, and we will provide consultation to that practitioner through one of our administrative services organizations and some ex experts in the field. So the work has already begun, and I could see expanding some of that work. Thank you for sharing that. I appreciate it. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Commissioner. I don't see any further questions, but it's clear that we're very invested in uh, helping uh, make the right decisions, and we look forward to your ongoing input. Thank you. No other questions. We're going to go back to the attempt, I believe, to show the video, followed by Commissioner Dietrich Gifford from the, from the Department of Social Services. Give it a one and a two. Here we go. can't hear anything. I can't hear anything. I don't know about anybody else. Neither can I. Okay, I understand that we're having ongoing technical difficulties. Clearly, we do not have a lot of experience with video daily doubles, which you can understand. Um, we will go to uh, Commissioner Gifford, followed by Nancy Alderman from EHHI. Good morning, Commissioner. Good morning, Representative Steinberg, Senator Anwar, and members of the committee. I'm Deidre Gifford, Commissioner of the Department of Social Services. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you this morning uh, with respect to House Bill 5045, an act presenting uh, reducing lead poisoning. I um, uh, wanted to testify in strong support of this legislation this morning, particularly with respect to Section 4, which has been alluded to in earlier testimony. Um, that section of the bill does direct DSS to explore the addition of uh, services to the Medicaid state plan 
that might uh, be in response to the identification of more children with elevated blood lead levels. As uh, I believe Commissioner Jatani uh, testified, a number of other states have already uh, begun to uh, include such services in their Medicaid state plan um, in a variety of different ways. We have begun um, already to uh, explore what might be possible, although uh, we don't know for certain because, of course, we have to work with our federal partners what services might be covered. But examples, we, we already, of course, uh, cover the lead testing for children on a regular basis. Um, but other services that may be able to be covered by Medicaid would include the environmental assessment um, and inspections that are uh, indicated when an elevated blood lead level is identified in a child, and also the uh, case management that would be necessary to help the, the child and their family uh, receive the services um, that they need, and um, both for remediation in the home um, and any medical services that might be indicated. Those are just two examples of things we might be able to cover with Medicaid. As you heard from uh, uh, Mayor Elliker and uh, Mayor Bronin, this is an issue that disproportionately affects um, children of color and low-income children from low-income families. Husky, as you know, covers close to 40% of children in Connecticut um, between Medicaid and the CHIP program. So we would have an opportunity to significantly ameliorate some of the additional challenges, financial challenges of, of this bill. Um, and I'd be happy to answer any further questions members of the committee might have with respect to how um, Medicaid may play a role. Thank you, Representative. Thank you. Uh, along those very lines, um, you've heard about our concern about the likelihood of Medicaid funds being made available in the state. And then, as you said, there may be not certainty, but uh, perhaps you could comment uh, as to your confidence level. And secondly, would such funds come with strings attached that might frustrate our ability to apply them broadly? Um, Representative, uh, the main string that would be attached, of course, would be that the child for whom the services is being provided is uh, receiving either Medicaid or CHIP, is eligible for Medicaid or CHIP. Obviously, we would not be in a position to cover costs uh, for children and families that were not part of the Medicaid or CHIP program. Um, as I indicated, however, the majority of low-income uh, children are covered by Medicaid and CHIP, and we know that this problem disproportionately affects those. So I would, um, I would imagine that a significant proportion of the children impacted by high lead levels would have access to um, Husky funding, although not all. Um, as to my level of confidence, I would say that judging by um, the environmental scan that we've done preliminarily um, and a report from the National Academy of State Health uh, Policy about ways that states are supporting um, lead uh, inspections and lead remediation, my degree of confidence is high that we would be able to receive some funding but I don't want to um, mi misrepresent um, the proportion of the new funding that we might be able to cover with Medicaid because we, we need to do the exploration that is indicated in the bill. I think the thing that's um, probably the most likely, and I feel very confident we could get covered is the, the so-called targeted case management, which is assigning um, a child and family to a case manager through an agency or a local health department um, that would be reimbursed through Husky funding to help uh, do a lot of the, the, the planning and, and assessment that needs to be done. As I indicated, the other thing that we'll explore is how much of the environmental assessment could be covered through Husky. Commissioner, you're a former, if temporary, commissioner of the Department of Public Health as well, including the early days of the pandemic. So you know full well how stressed many of our smaller health districts are. Uh, are you concerned, as at least I am, that we may not have sufficient funds to uh, impact the, the requisite staffing levels in some departments that are already struggling to uh, even provide the most basic sanitation 
uh, sanitarian services and, and uh, inspections that are on their plate currently, uh, with this rigorous standard that we fully endorse, uh, they would need to have requisite staffing in order to accomplish that. I remain concerned that depending on the potential of Medicaid funding or even environmental funding may prove insufficient to maintain a presence on an annual basis to really get out front on a lot of the problems that we have out there. Uh, are you as concerned? Uh, Representative, I think our local health departments would agree with, uh, with you and, and members of this committee and certainly with myself and Commissioner Jatani that this is an issue that needs to be addressed. Um, and that um, it is disproportionately affecting um, certain children in our state. I do, um, I do think it's worth asking and answering the question about whether collaboration between large and small local health departments might be something to explore in this, in this area um, and whether the full capacity to do the entire spectrum of the lead remediation would need, need to be developed in every local health department or whether that might be something that uh, might be able to be done um, uh, in partnership, for example, with a larger health uh, district or department by some of the smaller departments. We're certainly willing um, to try to explore that uh, alongside members of the committee and with the health department. I like that solution, Commissioner. Um, it, it might actually foster greater cooperation between districts, but more importantly, would assure that we have expert um, people uh, who might be able to share that expertise across uh, district borders. Uh, I, I like that idea, it's something we'll, we'll talk about further. Uh, any other questions or comments? If not, thank you for hanging in there with us today, Commissioner. You added value on something we care very much about. And we look forward to working with you to see if we can really uh, address a problem that uh, goes back decades for our aging infrastructure. My pleasure. Thank you very much. All right. We're going to try again. We're learning something here today, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to try the video again, followed by Nancy Alberton. My name is Kathy Wanoski, and I live in Unionville. I am writing in support of HB 5277. I have cerebral palsy and use a wheelchair. And as I get older, I am concerned about the fact that my preventative medical care is hampered by the lack of accessible medical diagnostic equipment in many medical facilities. One of my biggest problems is that I have stopped getting annual mammograms because it has become too difficult to access the machine in my wheelchair and get a good image. It has always taken two technicians to hold me in the proper position and that, and when they let go, I slip a little. Two years ago, the mammography technicians recommended that I ask my doctor and she has prescribed ultrasound tests since then, even though she has warned me that they don't give as good a picture as a mammogram does. Why can't I get the same complete exam that able-bodied women are able to get? Another example has to do with the fact that my primary care doctor's office has been moved into a building with very small, hard to access rooms. But that doesn't always have to do with the fact that he was moved into a smaller building because even when he was in a larger building, there still was not enough room in the larger office to get a lift in there. I just want to add that in because that I have found to be true. Okay. Um, he has to examine me in my wheelchair because the examining table does not adjust and once again, there is no lift. Also, there is no accessible scale, so I haven't weighed myself in a long time. I would say has to be more than two years since before COVID start, started. 
So use that as your your base point. Um, people suggest changing doctors, but I like and trust this doctor and it's hard to build new relationships. I should be given equal access to being weighed as my able-bodied counterparts. Thank you for considering this testimony. I hope that it will help to solve this very difficult issue. Well, first of all, I want to thank our staff for persevering and making this very important video testimony available to us. Obviously, with video testimony, which we really haven't experienced in this committee, it doesn't afford us the opportunity to ask questions. So I will uh, let everybody know that uh, Ruth uh, Groby, who, Groby, who uh, uh, spoke to us earlier, is uh, number 19 on the list. So if you have questions with regard to this, you may ask her shortly. Um, obviously, I don't see any questions or comments. So we will move on next to Nancy Alderman from the Environmental and Human Health Organization. Welcome, Nancy. And with this, I'm handing it off to Senator Anwar. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we you can. Hear can. Me. Thank you. Wonderful. Okay. I am uh, really happy to be here, number 12. As I was dead last uh, last week before the Environment Committee, number 102. So it's great to be number 12. And uh, I say good morning to you all. So we are also extremely happy uh, to be supportive of Bill 255, which is the flame retardant bill. And we are happy beyond belief at what a good bill you have written. Um, and we commend you for it. So this bill is going to do two important things. The first thing it's going to do is it is going to ban flame retardants in infant and children's products. This is critically important. Other states have done it. And what it means is when your seven pound little infant comes home and you now put it on a mattress, a crib mattress, it has flame retardants. And when you then move it to change its diapers, it has flame retardants in the changing table and on and on and on it goes. This is enormous amount of exposures, toxic exposures to this tiny little infant. And so we are thrilled. And the second thing it does is remarkably wonderful, which is it's going to label, if it will pass, which we hope it will, it's going to label all consumer products simply does it have flame retardants or does it not? Now, industry should love this because if industry loves its flame retardants, then they will be very happy that we are labeling or that you will be labeling these products that say they have flame retardants in them. So those people who want to buy products with flame retardants can do it. And those people who would prefer uh, products that don't have flame retardants in them can do that. So we're really happy with what you have done. I hope you all are as happy as we are. And um, we hope this bill will pass. We don't see why industry should not like it um, because uh, it will help them as well, I'm sure. Thank you so much, Ms. Alderman, for your testimony and thank you for your advocacy. Um, you have uh, uh, been in front of this uh, public health committee multiple times to make sure that we do the best thing. And, and uh, uh, one of the good things that's come out of this is that the bill has uh, uh, improved on some of the initial versions. So we truly appreciate your testimony and, and your advocacy around this. So I will have uh, uh, John, Representative Steinberg who has a question or a comment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Nancy, good to see you. Um, you know, this is hardly the first time we see uh, suggestions for legislation brought forward, oftentimes in the Children's Committee with relation to children's products. What's different about this legislation and why is this the time now to adopt it? Well, what is different, uh, if I have a minute, what, what is amazing about flame retardants and the history 
of flame retardants, since we did asbestos years ago, that every time they bring out new flame retardants and find out that they are too toxic to be used, usually because they cause cancer, um, they then get rid of them and they bring us a new set of flame retardants. And this has been going on since, uh, oh my gosh, before the 1970s. And we did a flame retardant report that's still up on our website and is downloadable. And it explains all the different versions of flame retardants and how many have gotten rid of because they're toxic. The ones that they're using now in children's products, these infant products are also toxic. Many of them are TRIS. And if any of you all are old enough, and unfortunately I am old enough, you will remember that TRIS in pajamas was considered so dangerous that as awful as this sounds, but I remember it, they sent all those pajamas to Africa. They didn't burn them or get rid of them, they sent them off. And a lot of TRIS products, uh, flame retardants are in these infant products. We really, really have to uh, get rid of them. So we banned them in children's pajamas, but we did not ban them in mattresses and in changing tables and in strollers and whatever. This bill is critically important. It's not, this part of the bill is not, you're not the first state to do this. So Maryland has done it, New York has done it, other states have already done it. The new part of this bill that is so clever and so wonderful is the second part of the bill, which is the labeling bill. And I've always loved working in Connecticut because it's such a forward thinking state. And it, it is never shy about trying new initiatives that will work. And we've often been on the, uh, on the forefront of really important legislation. So the first part of the bill that bans toxic uh, flame retardants in children's products, you're not the first state to do this. And the second part of the state uh, bill, you would be the first state. And uh, it's and I, as I said, industry should not fight this. Industry should like it because if they think their product is a good product, then they will be proud to have it labeled in consumer products. Does that answer your question? I hope it really does. I'm curious to see how many uh, uh, companies will take you up on on that. Uh, offer to be courageous about their their ingredients but uh you thank you for your answers thank you mr chair thank you thank you representative steinberg uh, the next person is uh, representative foster with a comment or a question thank you so much uh, mr chairman uh, um, thank you so much for testifying before us today i have sort of a question this is an area of, of uh, public health that i'm not as familiar with what are the um outcomes that are associated with children being exposed to flame retardants? What is the concern? Well, the concern is mainly a cancer concern. TRIS is a carcinogenic uh, toxin. So, and these are tiny little babies. So um, does that mean every baby? Uh, no, not at all, but it's adding to the load. And I think for all of us who care about cancer and cancer prevention, we know it's, it's, it's accumulative loads. And we live in uh, an environment, we all know this, that have exposures all the time, all of us do. Um, and so what is our job is really to reduce those exposures. To learn more about this, I, I hate to do this to you, but if you would go on our website, EHHI, and, or Environment and Human Health, however you wanna do it, the flame retardant report is on there. It will tell you all the different uh, flame retardants in the different products and what their uh, health effects are. I, I neither have the time nor, believe me, could I possibly lay out all the names and uh, of them, as I said, we have been through an enormous number of flame retardants, all of them eventually being discarded because of their harmfulness um, to human health. 
Um, and if I had time, but you tell me and I'll stop. If I have time to tell you this, because I think it's important. How do you think we got flame retardants in all these products? It has a history that most people don't know. And I'll just give one sentence. And if you want more, I will. And if you want me to be quiet, I'll be quiet. It started because people were smoking and falling asleep. And the Congress, because there were so many mattress fires and so many uh, fires in couches, which would then cause houses to get on fire, Congress was just about to mandate that cigarettes have flame retardants in them. And the industry, the tobacco industry, didn't want that. And they came up with another idea. Let's put flame retardants in everything else. Let's not put them in cigarettes, you'll ruin the taste. Let's put them in the couches and the mattresses. And that's how it started. So the history of things that contribute to public health crises in, with the impetus on something else is very interesting. I, I was not familiar with the flame retardant li literature and there, I interestingly looked, there's a lit review on epidemiological studies on flame retardant exposure. And actually it, it's associated with diabetes, neurobehavioral and developmental disorders, cancer and reproductive health effects and alterations of thyroid function. It when depends on which flame retardant and they're, you know, but anyway, yes. I mean, when you look at that list though, those are many of our leading causes of children's concerns, including things being prioritized by this committee this year. So um, th that is certainly not a causal study, but a well-designed epidemiological study. So that interesting, thank you so much for your testimony and your time. Yep, you're welcome. Thank you, Representative Foster. I see uh, Representative Pettit has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good morning, uh, Mrs. Alderman. Uh, many years this has been brought before this committee. The One of the groups opposing it have been typically from industry or chemical societies. I don't see any testimony submitted from them. Has some agreement been reached? Are they they're happy with this or will our testimony be coming in later? I'm surprised I don't see testimony from the people who opposed this in the past. wonder what your thoughts on that are. Well, you know, before COVID, when we used to come up to the state, I remember these people. But what I've learned um, over the years, what I have learned is industry can always find um, usually PhDs um, that will come up and testify that everything is safe and wonderful. Uh, they do it before the pesticide group. They do it whatever. They, they find these people, they do it before synthetic turf, they find them and you ask, wait a minute, how, how can that person say these things? But they do. And so, yes, I know I've listened to it all. I know it's been hard, but I think what makes it easier this year, um, and I maybe I'm too optimistic, but I think what makes it better this year is that other states have come before you. And I think, before we were the first state. And I think that for, for this, uh, for banning them in infant products, that was hard being the first state. Now we're no longer the first state. And as I said, the second part of the bill where you are the first state, they should like that. They, if they stand behind their product, then they should like being labeled that uh, a certain product has their good product in it. And so, I think that was really the issue. And so I was so happy to see the new Maryland bill and the New York bill. And you know, the firemen in other states, I'm not saying the firemen in Connecticut because they're a whole another breed, but in all the states that have tried this, the firemen are always behind it because firemen have a higher level of getting cancer than most other um, uh, professions. And uh, what happens is when you put all these flame retardants in everything and then they catch fire, uh, they're out there and they have to come in and put the fires out. And so firemen don't like flame retardants. They know that it doesn't really uh, solve the problem. It doesn't keep fire down and it exposes them greatly 
uh, to carcinogenic uh, products. So uh, both in Maryland and New York and also Massachusetts, um, the firemen have been very vocal in those states. So um, anyway, I, I, I think you've got a better chance this year. I really do. And I'm, I'm very hopeful because you wrote a really good bill. Thank you, Mrs. Alderman. Really appreciate your persistent advocacy over many years. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, you're good, William Pettit. You always answer emails. You're always responsive. I know you're always there. You do your job. And uh, I, I'm a fan. I'm a fan of this committee. I like this committee. It does good work and um, it knows what it's doing. And uh, I'm a fan. Thank you so much. Thank you for your trust in, in this committee and uh, seeing all the questions or comments. Thank you again. And we'll probably reach out to you if any specific question comes to our mind because you've done a lot of groundwork on this already. So thank so you. you take me off or do I just get off? How does this work? Uh, How do I get you out of can here? Act you can uh, turn your camera off and your mic off and, and our staff is going to move you to another place to another and world. you can watch and listen to the rest of the conversation wonderful okay thank you so much all right okay bye -bye. thank you the next person yep. on our list is kathy flaherty thank you kathy for waiting and looking forward to your testimony thank you you're welcome good morning senator anwar uh representative pettit and all the members of uh the public health committee um i want to give a special shout out to representative D'Amico um on this bill because i know that the folks at Citizens Coalition for Equal Access have really been working a long time in partnership with you to, to get a bill brought forward. So thank you all. Um, my name is Kathy Flaherty. I'm the Executive Director of Connecticut Legal Rights Project and we're a statewide nonprofit that provides legal representation to people who get um, mental health services from the State Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services. But I'm here um, as a member of the disability community and uh, a member of the steering committee of the Connecticut Cross Disability Lifespan Alliance and um, really here in support of HB 5277, um, which is a bill that would establish technical standards, which technically are already in existence um, from an Office of Access Board uh, for medical diagnostic equipment that promotes accessibility in healthcare facilities. Um, despite the fact that the Americans with Disabilities Act has been the law of the land for coming up on 32 years, a lot of people with disabilities just cannot get equal treatment at doctor's offices because they lack that accessible diagnostic medical equipment. People with disabilities comprise one fifth of Connecticut's population. People with mobility disabilities comprise about one fifth of that one fifth, which means 4% of Connecticut's population. Um, and data from the CDC, which I linked to in my testimony, show that there are health disparities for people with disabilities. We are more likely to um, have obesity. That's apparently the new way of describing that. Smoke, have diabetes, or have heart disease. You know, for people with mental health conditions, we die 10 to 25 years earlier than the population. And that's not really directly related to the mental health condition. It's related to all the other things that people already die of, um, which is diabetes, heart disease, overweight. Um, and people with disabilities have health needs that need to be addressed. Um, you will hear stories from a lot of people about the challenges they've faced at their doctor's office. We have a saying in our community, nothing about us without us. We're telling you what we need, and I just hope the committee can advance this bill and make things better. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Kathy. Nothing without, uh, nothing about us without us. I love it. I'm going to use that. And and I I know Representative Miko has a question. Thank you. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Kathy, for for coming to testify. And uh, thank you for the shout out. Not necessary, but thanks. So I, I have a question for you, um, um, it, and and it, it it relates to your reference to the Americans with Disabilities Act. And and I I, I will point out that that another piece of testimony that re we received from a fellow attorney uh, said basically the same thing that you you said in your testimony. And, and she says. And I'm going to quote, 
uh, it's really an embarrassment that something this basic needs to be legislated. The need for accessible medical equipment has long been required by the Americans with Disabilities Act, unquote. So I'm confused. Why is it that 30 years later, more than 30 years later, we still need to fix something that, that by law I, I thought had been fixed? Um, that's a wonderful question, and I really wish I had a solid answer to it. I think part of the problem, in all honesty, is the fact that a civil rights law for people with disabilities has this word reasonable embedded in uh, the language and the protection for our civil rights. We don't really do any kind of cost benefit analysis of the protection of other groups' civil rights under the law. We either protect them or we don't. But when it comes to um, rights of access for people with disabilities, um, you know, rights to community integration, there's always this sort of, well, is it reasonable to do or does it represent a fundamental alteration of the, you know, whenever you have to change the ordinary way of doing things. Um, so I think just the fact that that's embedded in the fabric of the law is something that people with disabilities have actually raised as an issue for the better part of the 32 years the law has been around. And that's probably why um, that, and I, I just, because you didn't say it, I recognize that language as Nancy Ellisberg's language. Um, so I just wanna give Nancy a shout out too, because uh, I actually agree with her. Okay, and, and if I could, Mr. Chair, just a quick follow-up question. Uh, so, 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 so Kathy, the, um, I, I, I take it that, that based on your testimony, what you've said here today, that, that, that these reasonable accommodations uh, in many cases don't exist? Uh, well, I, I think the, the, the testimony that you will hear in opposition to this will be, well, this is going to cost us money. And then the, the cost factor what is reasonable for a doctor who's in private practice, you know, a single doctor operating an office, that cost analysis is gonna be very different than if you're dealing with the Yale New Haven medical health system, you know, Hartford Healthcare's network, um, you know, other big hospitals. So, you know, I think that is part of it, but I think, reading the language of the bill this morning before the hearing is what you're saying really is new equipment that you buy needs to meet these standards. Not really saying anymore, you have to fix everything right now, but if you are buying new equipment, you need to make sure that um, it is accessible. I think all equipment has some kind of lifespan on it. Um, and so, you know, I, I think in some ways this bill represents a compromise um, of that. Okay. Um, um, th th thank you, Kathy. I, I appreciate that. And, and again, I I is there anything that we should put into this bill? Anything we should take out? Or, or do you think it's in pretty good shape right now? Or, or maybe we should talk about it later? <laughs> we should talk about that later. I don't want to okay. um, box myself into a corner on that. Fair right enough. So. Okay. Fair enough. Thank, th thank you very much. And thank you, Mr. Chair. Appreciate it. Thank you, Representative D'Amico. Uh, and I have uh, uh, Representative Pettit uh, next on in the list. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mrs. Flaherty. Um, just to back up for a second for the people listening and, and for myself, you haven't been in practice taking care of a lot of people with diabetes, people with morbid obesity requiring bariatric procedures. It, it obviously was an issue that a lot of it's been changed. The weight limits on a lot of machines used to be 250, 300 pounds. Are we, is the issue here at its core that the federal government has not done its job to this day and we're trying to catch them up because they have not established standards and, and regulations that are effective as they should be? No, my understanding, and I would certainly encourage you to, to get clarification of Ruth in case I'm misstating anything, um, but my understanding is that this um, access board at the national level has actually developed standards, but what hasn't happened is they haven't been implemented as regulations, so what they are at the federal level are merely guidelines. Um, and so that's a big part of the issue. So it's not that that work hasn't been done, it's that it doesn't have the full force of the law. 
And that's, but, you know, sometimes you have to wonder, you know, going along with what Nancy Ellisberg said, why do you need to legislate everything? I mean, at a certain point, it should really be a basic understanding that people need to um, be able to go to the doctor and be able to get up onto an examining table safely, um, need to be able to have a mammogram taken safely. Um, and so that is why we are here today. So many of us are here today. And there was a great um, edit op-ed in the Harper Current. It was published today, if you actually get the print paper, um, by Sandra Carpenter, and I link to that in my testimony as well. So I mean, clearly there has been over the past 30 years, a number of things done in terms of accessibility, and especially in the area that I worked in with, with obesity, making things accessible to people and people with mobility issues. But so it's been more of an enforcement and going forward, then the enforcement issue would be upon the Department of Public Health. People would register complaints with DPH and DPH would be responsible for enforcement as opposed to the federal government? I would like to reserve the answer to that in terms of enforcement. I think another possible avenue of enforcement is that failure to have accessible equipment would represent disability discrimination, which means it would then be enforced by the Commission on Human Rights and Opportunities, which enforces discrimination as opposed to the agency that licenses the medical professionals. Thank you. I appreciate your input. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Dr. Pettit. Uh, thank you, Ms. Flaherty. Thank you for your testimony and then thank you for being the voice uh, of uh, a lot of people. Thank you. Thank you all. And with the next uh, person is uh, going to be David Fournier and I believe that's a video. So we will probably watch this video as well. Hi, my name is David Fournier, and I'm a client of New Horizons Village in Unionville, Connecticut, um, a facility for independent living. Um, I became disabled in 2009 uh, due to a accident involving me and my fiance and a drunk driver. Um, and prior to that um, accident, I've worked with handicapped and disabled people charitably for um, Special Olympics for quite a few years and also for a high-risk security company in Hartford where we were trained biannually in a simulation fire drill to remove patients that are physically impaired, handicapped, full body braces out of that burning building. We had a certain amount of minutes to do it, and if we couldn't achieve it, we would have to do it again. So we learned how to do that. And I really didn't pay too much attention to how um, people with disabilities, um, you know, get around and function and everything until after I became disabled myself. Um, that's when I started to notice about all the facilities that I've been in, the hospitals, multiple, the rehabilitation facilities, multiple, emergency rooms, multiple, on how people with disabilities of any kind um, have to face danger in these facilities. Danger with equipment, with um, tables, um, exam tables, and any other um, apparatus that they are put, that's put in front of them and um, I experienced some of that stuff for myself and it really opened my eyes to how bad it really is for people with disabilities to have to endure this just to see their primary care physician or get in, into an emergency room and be seen or to go into a rehabilitation a physical rehabilitation center and, and be treated just because they're disabled. Okay? I've ran into many, many um, apparatus and um, you know benches, exam tables, to where I had problems getting on and my main fear was falling because I have a problem with staying stable since my disability. And um, not only that, also, in businesses, 
in an everyday life, shopping centers, malls, any place I go to, all the hazards that handicapped people, disabled people have to pay attention to so they don't get re-injured. And um, I just feel like um, enough is not being done. That's exactly how I feel. And I appreciate your time on this uh, HB 5277 bill. Um, and I hope that this gets passed. It really needs to get passed. I appreciate you for your time. Thank you for the testimony. Um, obviously, this was a recording because of uh, obvious reasons. So we will move on to the next person on the list. And I think what the questions you may have on some of these testimonies, you can ask uh, our uh, number 19, Ruth Grobe, uh, later uh, in, in, in after a few individuals. The next person on the list is Liani Arroyo. Um, uh, Liani Arroyo, are you here? Yes, I am. OK. We can hear you, but we cannot see you. You may want to turn your camera on if you choose to. Uh, I would love please to go turn, ahead. I would love to turn my camera on, but I don't see the option to. So, I'll, oh, here it is. <laughs> there it is. Good morning. Perfect. Go ahead. Good morning distinguished co-chairs and members of the Public Health Committee. As a public health practitioner for over two decades, I am here today to urge you to pass House Bill 5045, an act reducing lead poisoning. Passing HB 5045 would lower the blood lead level in Connecticut statute to reflect what we now know about the effects of lead poisoning in young children and put us in line with the recommendations of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in the American Academy of Pediatrics. The impact of lowering the blood lead level to trigger additional parental notifications, on-site inspections, and epidemiological investigations cannot be overstated. First, information is the first step in ensuring that children exposed to lead can be identified. Requiring that children with lower blood lead levels be reported to local health departments will allow us to provide information to parents and property owners so the child and the sources of lead can quickly be recognized. Second, this policy change will allow us to immediately provide supports that can ameliorate the effects of lead on a child, such as removal of the source of sources of lead, relocation of the child, and the resources for property owners to remediate units to make them lead safe. Third, detecting lead in children at lower levels will have a positive impact on education and healthcare costs by reducing the number of children who will need intensive educational and medical supports. This is truly a case where an ounce of prevention is worth more to society than a pound of cure would ever be. Lastly, passing HB 5045 is also an equity issue. In Connecticut, the communities with the highest number of lead cases are our urban centers and neighborhoods with high rates of poverty. We know that children of color are disproportionately affected by this issue, and they now also represent over half of all children in our state. I would be remiss if I, not, if I did not mention that passing HB 5045 must be done in concert with the approval of the additional $70 million in the governor's budget. Without these funds, local health departments will not be able to hire the additional staff needed to implement the bill's requirements or be able to offer property owners assistance with remediating their housing units. While HB 5045 will initially increase staffing costs to the city of Hartford when fully implemented, we expect those costs will go down over time as less children are exposed to lead. However, funding is needed now to get the program off of the ground. Further, given the time frame laid out in the bill, it is critically important that the Department of Public Health quickly release funds to local health departments and districts for staffing and program costs and quickly establish a program to assist owners with remediation. This is needed for the effective implementation of HB 5045. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. We hear you loud and clear. Um, I don't see any comments or questions. Thank you, Ms. Arroyo, for your time and your testimony. Thank the you. next person on our list is uh, Mr. Anthony Morrissey. Mr. Morrissey. 
Yes, hello, good morning, and thank you uh, to my friends, uh, Mr. Steinberg and Ms. Gilcrest, Ms. Kushner, uh, all of the friends that I've met along the way over the last three years uh, for uh, allowing me to, to uh, testify today in regards and in support of HB 5044. Um, I did submit some testimony. I don't see it yet uh, on the site, but I do want to just kind of uh, refer back to that. Uh, 940 days ago, our son, Brian Cody, lost his battle with substance use disorder. He was only 20 years old and he was a father of two little girls. He died on Saturday, August 10th, 2019 of a fentanyl overdose. And he was found in a trap house in what our local mayor calls the greatest town in the USA. Sadly, not even the greatest communities in our state are immune to the overdose epidemic, as you well know. In 2021, the Connecticut Department of Public Health website reports 1,447 overdose deaths, setting another record for lethal overdoses in the state of Connecticut for the fourth consecutive year. Since the passing of our son, my wife and I and my family have uh, joined forces with thousands of other grieving families across the state in uh, an effort to remove any impediment blocking those seeking assistance with their recovery journey. During the uh, course of that um, outreach, uh, we have seen firsthand um, the shortcomings of the current system. It's pretty clear, my friends, that our current strategy for battling the overdose epidemic is just simply not working. Since the loss of our son, we have found numerous situations where we have literally let those who tried recovery, we've let them down. Um, time and time again, um, you know, we, we, we run into a, a brick wall where there's no detox beds available. Uh, in fact, on July 4th, the Demory News Times ran an article where someone from Demas was quoted as saying that there was no problems with the number of beds available. On that very day, my organization could not find a bed for somebody who was willing to accept recovery um, and, and start their recovery journey. Um, I think it's time that we invest uh, in recovery and rethink the ways to support those struggling with substance use disorder. Um, the recent opioid litigation settlements are an opportunity for Connecticut to transform how we deliver those services and those supports to those people who are looking for help with the recovery journey. It's critical we use this time to reimagine our programs while expanding our army of resource providers. Let's extend beyond just asking Demas alone to figure this problem out. But instead, let's harness the passion attention and commitment of all the providers across the state to include those families that have seen firsthand the shortcomings of our system and can bring fresh ideas. There are numerous nonprofits that you'll hear from today, friends of mine, people from For Cameron and Demand Zero and Glorious Recovery and Redemption House. Why are these Excuse folks- Excuse me, not Mr. Being, Morrissey, um, your time is almost up if you please summarize, thank you. Why are these folks not being brought to the table? Uh, we'll, we'll clear up right here. Uh, these folks should be brought to the table for discussions on how to uh, promote um, a bunch of uh, ideas that we have shared in our testimony, things like funding the community navigator, funding reliable safe harbors for those who are waiting on detox beds, uh, voucher programs for people who are leaving inpatient settings uh, only to be let go to homelessness and in the relapse cycle to begin again. Uh, this is a lot more than just improving access to Narcan kits. This is a, uh, an opportunity for us to be more comprehensive in, in, in the delivery of services and supports that we, that we are giving to our community. Um, I thank you for the work that you're doing. I, I ask that we continue to, um, you know, to, to work on this matter. It's super critical. We cannot afford another year of record overdoses. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions the, or, uh, the, the team might have for us regarding our uh, outreach uh, experiences. Thank you so much, Mr. Morrissey, for your uh, heartfelt and, and, and passionate testimony. And, and we are so sorry for your loss and, and we truly appreciate you coming and then collaborating to make sure that we become, uh, you, you have your efforts become a voice to protect others. And, and, and we as a public health committee will do our share to make sure that we empower some of your ideas and thoughts and then and collaborate with you going forward so thank you thank you for your testimony i do see there's a question from uh, representative john michael parker uh representative parker thank you mr chair um and thank you tony it's it's nice to see you here today um this is actually just more of a brief comment um i know 
uh, we've been talking a lot about this and this is so then maybe also geared to my colleagues on the committee. Um, this is not the only opioids focused bill that we're going to be taking up this year in, in public health. Um, and there's been some, I hope uh, you folks see it as collaborative work in terms of a number of other policies that will be coming into another bill a little bit later on in this session. Um, and inside of that, we are proposing uh, language around um, better understanding the, the voucher program, um, uh, the navigator, some of the pieces that, that you've mentioned already. Um, so I, I feel really encouraged uh, by this overall uh, funding opportunity. And, and I think the testimony we heard earlier is going to really help us think about setting it up as strongly as possible. And, and maybe there is a role for more family and community advocates, and we'd love to continue that conversation. And I know you'll be back, Tony, and, and your um, the folks you're working with um, another day uh, later this session when we're talking about um, and that concerning opioids, which which we'll be presenting shortly. So just wanted to thank you for your advocacy, Tony, and helping lead the the, the parent um, group. I, I uh, just really appreciate your input. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Parker. Thank you. Seeing no other comments and questions, we will continue the conversation. Thank you. The next person on our list is Ruth Grobe, uh, number 19, Ms. Grobe. Thank you very much, Senator Anwar and Representative Steinberg and members of the committee. I don't seem to be able to put my video on. I'm sorry. You cannot start your video because the host has stopped it, it says on my screen. So I'll just, can you hear my, can you hear my voice? Okay. We can great. hear your voice right next to your. Um, oh, here we go. Here it is. Mic the host. is yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm testifying um, on on behalf of HB fifty two seventy seven, and I am the secretary of the Citizens Coalition for Equal Access, which is a small grassroots disability advocacy organization. Um, I, I am one of the few able-bodied members of the Citizens Coalition, and I'm testifying about uh, accessible diagnostic medical equipment because I have seen my fellow advocates with disabilities, I've heard their stories, and uh, it's a, a health inequity that needs to be corrected. And HB 5277 is a start, but I only a start because it only applies to new purchases of medical equipment um, when, I guess, a, a, a piece of machinery has outlived its usefulness. Um, and you just heard Kathy Wanoski, um, one of the people on tape, people with disabilities on tape, say that changing doctor's offices and changing a doctor with whom you have a good relationship and you trust um, is hard. In addition to that, people with disability, mobility disabilities have transportation issues for, for choosing a medical facility they can't always get to a medical facility that has accessible diagnostic equipment. We need this to be a more comprehensive um, approach to the problem than just new equipment. Doctor's offices need to uh, acquire new equipment. And Dr. Peter Deckers, who has been kind of advising us, the retired CEO of Yukon Health, um, did some research online and uh, at least a diagnostic, uh, 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 accessible scale and exam table. They are not that expensive, he thinks, for most doctors' practices in the state. Um, and the reason I care about this so much is that I, I, despite the ADA, I see the kinds of challenges that my friends with disabilities face every day. And I've never seen a minority group that is more dismissed and more invisible to the wider society. And they need a voice. And um, it, it was very hard to get testi their testimony here today, this kind of system doesn't work well for a lot of people with mobility limitations. Um, so I, I have taken testimony from people with speech disabilities 
they have a speech disability, but they still have a lot to say. I have taken testimony from people with limited control of different parts of their body, and yet they want control of their destinies. Excuse and me, Miss Grovey, but your time is almost up. If you could please thank summarize. You. Thank you. Yes. And I've taken testimony from blind people, but they have a vision of what an equal society would look like. And I ask you to listen to their testimony. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony and thank you for coordinating uh, some of the interviews uh, with, with people. I know it took a lot of effort, but that's very helpful and gives us a better insight. I, I now have a couple of remarks, but I, I'm going to have uh, uh, Representative D'Amico starts with this question and comments. Representative D'Amico, please go ahead. Well, th thank you, Mr. Chair. Traditionally, uh, we defer to the chair, but I appreciate your being gracious and allowing me to go first. Uh, so, so thank you. And thank you, Ruth, for, for your testimony. Thank you for your advocacy. Thank you for your passion and your organizational skills. I, I really give you a lot of credit and, 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 and thanks. So um, you, you had mentioned that, that uh, you know, that, that this bill doesn't go far enough. You had mentioned that that uh, you know that you had received you know a testimony from uh, various many people uh, in the disability community. So I'm just wondering if you would you know if you could if the chair will, will indulge for a minute uh, if you could just describe what you think this bill sh should sh should include in addition to what's in the bill and and maybe you could share some of the um, some of the comments uh, from from the people that you've that you've uh, spoken with uh, about this. Thanks, Representative D'Amico. I uh, the it, it needs to be more comprehensive, and it needs to uh, be a requirement for all doctors' offices and medical facilities to become ADA. It's basically being ADA compliant, um, and there it's not a, a kind of an un. Uh, definable requirement because the U.S. Access Board in 2017 published standards um, for diagnostic, accessible diagnostic medical equipment. So there are technical specifications that could be followed. And the Department of Justice ha is, um, has raised a rulemaking proposal about this very issue. The National Council for Disability has diagnostic medical equipment as one of its four components of a health equity framework for people with disabilities. It's on the national agenda. It was on once before in 2017 when the U.S. Access Board published its um, its standards, but my understanding was that the Department of Justice received an executive order that they could not issue any rules that would cost um, medical facilities a, anything over a dollar. So that so then the Just, Justice Department withdrew its rulemaking back in 2017, but it's back on the national agenda, but Connecticut could lead the way. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I, I, yeah, yes. And, and again, Mr. Chair, if I could ask one more follow up question. So, so, so uh, we, we, we heard earlier, uh, Ruth, um, um, that, that uh, about reasonable alternate accommodations. So in your experience, would you say that, that, that these reasonable alternate accommodations are generally available uh, to, to, to people with disabilities or, or is that not your experience? Well, you're going to hear a whole bunch more people on tape. It has not been my experience. And um, the, the Connecticut Cross Disability Alliance, which is a much larger group of advocates with disabilities, has put this your, HB 5277 as one of the most important bills on their legislative agenda. However, we are also... Um, uh, cooperating with the Yukon Center for Excellence in Developmental Disabilities, and their LEND program is currently um, conducting a survey of patients with disabilities across the state of Connecticut um, about accessibility of medical facilities. And so we're going to have some hard data soon. Thank, thank you very much. I, I appreciate it. Thank you for your indulgence, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Representative D'Amico, and, and, and 
I, and in many of the issues, I think your comments are much more valuable than sometimes mine. So that's why I felt you sh should speak first. <laughs> so, um, uh, Ms. Ms. Grove, I wanted to uh, first thank you for your for your advocacy and in this important issue. I would divide the issue into two broad categories. One is the access to a clinician, and the second is the access to diagnostic tests. Uh, and um, the access to clinician historically uh, for some of the patients historically before the insurance industry's control over healthcare became so significant, people used to actually go to the patient's home and visit them when they had accessibility issues. And that is now a historical issue. And, and, and when you talked about that to medical students and then they're just looking at you, wow, did that ever happen? And the reality is it did happen and it served the community very well. Uh, now uh, with the insurance industry and the big corporation of medicines, they want everybody fish to be seen in 15 minutes. Otherwise, they feel that you're not a good quote unquote quality uh, uh, worker for their perspective because they want to churn more number of patients out, if you will. I think that's part of the issue. So that will require more effort and collaboration and maybe payment modification systems because end of the day, it's going to be time related uh, cost. The the industry, uh, I know you're, you've uh, been interacting with the industry as well because because that's where some of the um, opportunity for engineering is going to be there. Can you share some of that experience? Yes, um, we are currently involved. Uh, members, advocates from the Citizens Coalition for Equal Access are part of a task force that has been formed that has representatives from the Connecticut Hospital Association and the Connecticut State Medical Society, the Department of Public Health and the Department of Aging and Disability Services, as well as a representative from the Connecticut Cross Disability Lifespan Alliance and, and a, a number of other people. But anyway, the task force is looking at anything other than a legislative solution to this issue, which includes um, awareness raising programs and perhaps um, looking into continuing education credits for medical professionals that would um, have a, a strong disability component, including the accessibility issues. So we are at, the task force is, is working on that, but we very much, encourage state, state legislators to also find out more about the needs of people with disabilities. And that's one of the reasons we're testifying on this bill. Thank you. Uh, I'll give you an example. There's an opportunity, the, the MRI machines for the quality that was needed initially, you, one needed to have a machine which was much more encased and, and which is very difficult for patients to navigate with anxiety or uh, who are uh, on the heavier side. And, and, and that has been a problem. So there was an open MRI, but, but there was a little bit of a compromise on quality, but everybody knew that, well, uh, the open MRI is gonna be available in such and such facility. So there was a collaborative effort that not every healthcare system had to buy everything. They would actually be able to coordinate certain things based on um, uh, their uh, data on what is available at which facility. Uh, do you think that may be one way to coordinate things in, in according to engineering uh, limitations and cost limitations for some of these uh, larger uh, centers? I think that for the for Senator Anwar, I think that for the more complicated imaging tests, but what we're real uh, you'll hear the concern of so many people with disabilities is just an accessible scale and an accessible exam table in their doctor's office and they don't want to change doctors and run around the state and go to a different one who, who happens to have that and i i feel that that's a right that you know every able-bodied person can choose whatever doctor's office they want to go to but people with disabilities ha have to but but with complicated expensive imaging equipment I do think there ought to be collaborations. And Good. This is very helpful. I, I, I will probably follow up with you in, in, in a little bit more depth. And uh, that data that you're talking about that UConn is trying to generate would be very, very helpful as, as we move forward. Thank you again for your work and your testimony. Okay. And, and the next person uh, I had um, missed earlier was uh, number 18, Lori Vitagliano. Um, you were like one second off from the time when I called 19. So sorry for you, you have to wait and please go yeah. ahead. And next person is Diane 
Sella. Good, good morning, Senator Anwar and members of the Public Health Committee. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here, actually. Um, so my name is Lori Vitagliano, and I'm from the South Central Connecticut Regional Water Authority. I'm here before you in support of House Bill 5276, an act concerning the disposal of home-generated sharps. We appreciate the opportunity to provide comments in support of this bill. By way of background, the Regional Water Authority provides 42 and a half million gallons of water per day to some customers in 15 communities in our region. I know I stalled there and just wanted to be clear on that. And um, the source of this water is a system of watershed and aquifer areas within 24 communities. And much of our 27,000 acres of land is managed for watershed protection, timber resource conservation, wildlife habitat, and open space. The RWA also operates Has Waste Central, which is Connecticut's first permanent drop-off facility for household hazardous waste. Serving 17 communities, we've been there since 1989. For over 30 years, for each and every year, from May until the end of October, this successful regional program is supported and it's a regional solution for residents in these communities to properly dispose of their household hazardous waste. We're very, very supportive of this bill because it would create a program for home generated sharps. This is a common item and I say common when residents can't put something in the curb on the curb and recycle within their community, they automatically think it could come to Hasway Central, which only collects household liquids and chemicals. And this is not something we can take. And it's really frustrating when a resident calls and I can't help them. We can't direct them. The best we can do is to have them call their doctor's office to, pro to hopefully properly dispose of them. I'm not aware of other options. So seeing this bill and hopefully a safe disposal option will become available with, unfortunately, if it's not being properly managed, um, hoping it doesn't go in the regular trash. That poses a serious danger to the garbage collectors and the environment. So very appreciative of this bill being raised. I was really happy to see it. And um, again, we hope and uh, totally support the safe and convenient way to properly dispose of this item. With that, um, I'm concluding. Thank you so much for your testimony and, and uh, agree with you from the dangers uh, some of these uh, uh, things would have on individuals who are handling them without knowing. Um, seeing no question or comment, we will move on to the next person. Thank you again for your testimony. Thank you. The next My person pleasure. that we have on our list is uh, Ms. Diane Loricella. I hope I got your last name correct. Thank you, Senator. You're right on the mark. Um, let me just... <clears throat> What I've been trying to do is um, to save time is to try to uh, cut, copy, paste. So I'll do my best with very little sleep. Um, Co-chair, Senator Anwar, Representative Steinberg, Ranking Members Pettit and Somers and other esteemed members of the Public Health Committee. Thank you all for raising Governor's Bill 5045 and Senate Bill 255. Today, two very important bills that help our children and families. I'm, I will spend my, my time on Bill 5045 related to lead poisoning. Um, again, my name is Diane Loricella, and I am an environmental professional, a member of the governor's GC3 Environmental Justice Working Group, and a former licensed lead abatement professional. House Bill 5045, as written, is a great step in the right direction at identifying childhood lead exposure in alignment with the federal expectations, and I endorse it with some additional concerns. In an effort to save time, I heartily agree with the written testimony submitted by Karen Spiegel of the Health Equity Solutions Group, as well as Ms. Nancy. Uh, I will try to submit my written notes of this testimony later. While I applaud the Department of Public Health's effort to address social factors like homes with lead that are contributing to health disparities, I believe that we cannot forget private child care facilities within older buildings with the very same potential to expose children to lead-based paint where the child may remain for up to six to eight hours a day, five to six days a week. If there could be an amendment to this bill, I think it would help in covering something that is has been needed for a while. Uh, House Bill 5045 does not 
also go far enough because it does not identify causation before the child is exposed. The well-documented long-term medical effect of lead exposure by young children rises to the need to ensure that parents and caregivers know when and where lead exposure risk exists in advance of the child becoming contaminated at all. For example, when violations are found, there's currently no law that I could find in the regulation that states that parents or caregivers of the child enrolled in that nursery or school building must be notified that the building has lead paint present. Um, uh, currently, probably the, the owner, uh, they have to be notified. The building owner must notify the nursery school uh, owners, but the nursery school owner does not have to tell the parents. Uh, funding challenges and some ideas. I know my time is going, getting ready. I think you should use the COG structure in order to have several regional lead experts assigned to each of the COGs so that you can spread out their expertise in, because the funding is is uh, challenged. I'd like to see ARPA funds used not only for lead pipes, but see if you could use that money also for lead paint, because according to my read, only 1% of our problems with lead have to do with drinking water pipes. Uh, let's have our congressional uh, delegation see if we can move that money around to, to the true need, which is the paint. Um, I also think that maybe there's DECD funds that could be used because this would lead to workforce development and truly green jobs in construction, electrical and plumbing businesses. Excuse me, Mr. Lorisella, your time is almost up. If you could Okay, I'll that. wind up, thank you, you? I'm so sorry. Yeah, um, okay. I also think we need a means test about who can access the lead remediation funds uh, because there is such a need. Uh, to uh, conclude, please consider amending this bill to add parents, guardians, and caregivers of nursery school and pre-K school children, they have to be notified in advance. Uh, they also should be notified in writing when there is a problem cited in a violation. And also lastly, as others have said, our local health departments need support. And I have just given you several other ideas for money. Uh, the trigger point for potential lead-based paint building stock has to be 1978 not 1960. I thank you. Make sure we identify which commercial buildings contain lead and notify parents as well as caregivers. Thank you for all of the work you do and I appreciate your time. Thank you, Ms. Lorichella. I think uh, my co-chair, uh, John, uh, Representative Steinberg has a question and a comment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Diane, it's good to see you and thank you again for your long-term dedication to this topic and this pressing need. Um, I would ask you that if you have, as I imagine you have sent me testimony with regard to this, that you do so again, particularly with regard to the notifications and the education piece. This is something I think we should take up with the Department of Public Health. And as part of this opportunity, if you will, to do something consequential about lead poisoning, uh, we should be, uh, notifying those who are most vulnerable about the prospect of them encountering lead in what they consider or expect to be a safe environment. So that's really valuable. Uh, I will tell you that it is our expectation that these funds will be used more broadly than simply lead pipes and will address uh, lead in the homes, uh, which may typically be paint. So we should be able to cover that as well. We'll see how long the money holds out. Uh, that's pretty much it. Um, I'll, I'll just offer you one, more, one last chance, Diana. Was there anything you didn't get to say you, you wanted to squeeze in there? Yes. Last thing I just wanted to say, as I've said on other bills, is that a robust, something that you've just alluded to, a robust and creative public outreach program using social media and the media could really help make sure this, this wonderful effort uh, really makes the most of, of an important topic. Thanks so much. Thank you, Diane. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Ms. Moon Lorichella. Thank you for your testimony. This was very helpful. Looking forward to the written version as well. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. You too. Uh, seeing no other questions, comments, we'll move on to number 20, which is also a video um, with Valerie Rumpf. Hello, my. My name is Valerie Ann Rumpf. I live in the, uh, I live in the Unionville section of Farmington. Um, this is in regards to 
to House Bill number 5277 re regarding the purchase of accessible medical equipment. Um, my, uh, my personal experiences um, with some medical equipment like x-rays and, and mammograms is, is that because I, I do use a wheelchair when I do go out on, on my appointments, especially when I'm trying to get a mammogram, which is an important exam for, you know, for women to have because it detects breast cancer. Um, it's, it's kind of a struggle for, for somebody in a wheelchair to be able to have that test done. I, I'm, I mean, I could stand up for a little bit, but it's kind of, but it's kind of hard for me to try and balance myself and while the test is being done. And, and also, because I do have cerebral palsy, I do have orthopedic issues. And, and sometimes getting on x-ray table can be a literal, literal pain in the butt, <laughs> especially when I have to have foot and ankle x-rays, x-rays taken and, and knee x-rays and hip x-rays taken and also i i have visual problems too and and i and i do see an ophthalmologist and and sometimes trying to get into the to the room to have my eyes examined that's kind of tough too but but that but at least for the most part um I ha I have no problem getting you know getting my eyes themselves examined. It's just trying to, for me to be able to maneuver in the room and you know trying to get my chair in position to to get it so it's flush with the equipment. Um, I I do I do hope that this bill do, does get passed because it it's. When you, yeah, you know, when you, yeah, you know, when you think of it, people with disabilities should be able to have medical exams that are that are done e that that will be easier for them to have to have done, and they'll save the state money too in the long run. <laughs> Thank you so much for your testimony. And um, since this was new, we may not have an opportunity for questions. I will move on to the next person on the list, which is Janet Orway. Thank you. Um, good morning. Um, honorable co-chairs and members of the Joint Committee on Public Health. I am Janet Orwig, Executive Director for the Psychology Interjurisdictional Compact or SIPAC Commission. On behalf of the SIPAC Commission, I would like to express our appreciation for your consideration of the Psychology Interjurisdictional Compact legislation, House Bill 5046. SIPAC is an interstate compact which provides a mechanism for the ethical and legal practice of telepsychology as it reduces regulatory barriers and provides for client or patient protection. SIPAC also allows for the ability to practice for a limited period while physically located in a SIPAC participating jurisdiction. The goal of SIPAC is to improve access to mental health services by facilitating the competent practice of telehealth by licensed psychologists across state lines and represents a significant and crucial step to the profession of psychology. Psychology SIPAC provides protection to the public by certifying that psychologists have met acceptable standards of practice Importantly, it provides compact states with a mechanism to address the disciplinary issues that occur across state lines. It increases access to mental health care where care is not readily available, while at the same time providing for continuity of care for an increasingly mobile society. SIPAC promotes public protection where none may currently exist for the interstate practice of telehealth. Since its release in February of 2015, the SIPAC legislation has been en enacted in 28 jurisdictions, including Maine, New Hampshire, and New Jersey. In addition to Connecticut, legislation has been introduced in nine more jurisdictions, such as Massachusetts and Rhode Island. 
Several years of work preceded the final version of SciFact, much of which was completed in collaboration with many other psychology professional organizations, such as the American Psychological Association and the Trust. Through this collective process, SciPAC provides a means for providers to legitimately practice, as well as a mechanism for oversight of such practice in such a manner as to benefit all parties. This is important for the profession, as well as for the protection of the public. Thank you for considering this very important mental health care issue. Thank you so much. And, and uh, Ms. Orwig, since you've had some experience where some of the other states have been able to do this, what were the challenges uh, that were faced, if any? Um, we've been very fortunate. There haven't been a lot of challenges. We are, um, we do require a couple of things from the state board staff um, that they do enter disciplinary records into um, the disciplinary data system so that we can verify that is a component um, that a psychologist cannot have had a disciplinary action. So that does require um, board staff to do that. Um, but other than that, it's been, we provide a mechanism for board staff to sign in, see who in their jurisdiction is practicing. Um, that is an online system they can access at any time. That is pretty much the only requirements um, required of the staff. And were there any challenges with the insurance payments and, and some of the restrictions around that? Um, that's been a little bit outside of the purview of SIPAC because we deal mostly with the regulation. Um, we do provide mechanisms and um, resources for psychologists to practice. But what I have heard, and I know there's going to be some um, psychologists testifying after me that may can address those questions a little easier. But what I have been told is that it's structured very similar to when you do a face-to-face -face practice. You're going to inquire of the insurance company where they consider the practice to take place and what codes to use. Um, but there, like I said, there will be some licensed psychologists testifying after me that may be able to answer that um, more in more detail. Good. Well, we, we thank you so much for your testimony. This is a, a very important step. The, the time has come. Their needs have increased significantly in our community. So this is going to help us out. So we appreciate your testimony and your work. Thank you very much. Thank you. And the next person on my list is uh, Allison Weir. Good afternoon, Senator Anwar, Representative Steinberg, and members of the committee. My name is Alice Nwir. I'm with Greater Hartford Legal Aid. I'm a policy advocate and attorney. And on behalf of the Legal Services Programs of Connecticut, um, I am here in support of HB 5045. Uh, the Legal Services Programs of Connecticut, particularly New Haven Legal um, Assistance Association, have been leaders in, in addressing lead poisoning in the state. The New Haven Legal Assistance Association has recently set a litigation filed against the city of New Haven, resulting in a settlement that should be the, the model for the state. The bill takes significant steps um, towards addressing lead poisoning of children, but we urge the legislature to be even more aggressive. This is a matter of equity. Children of color are more likely to be impacted and suffer the consequences that will affect them, the, the rest of their lives um, as a result of lead poisoning. Black children are poisoned at twice the, the rate of white children, and my next children are at one and a half times the rate of white children. Under the current law and practice, if a child has a blood level of five to 400, uh, 14 milligrams, the local health official is only required to notify the parents or send them the educational materials about the dangers of lead. These parents are those with the, the fewest resources to treat their children and remediate the homes. The state must do more than simply distribute pa pamphlets. Thus, we support the proposal to amend the state's medical assistance program to include necessary services to address and reduce lead poisoning in the state. Where we disagree with the, the governor's bill is in the graduated change to which the level is, uh, of remediation is ordered. We urge the legislature to go directly to five milligrams per deciliter as a level that triggers local departments um, to conduct an investigation and order remediation. There's no reason to delay this change. New Haven is already using five milligrams as a triggering level. Other cities should do as well. It is well past the time to um, address lead poisoning in the state. And we, uh, we um, Welcome the the um the bill, but uh, urge the, the government, the legislature, to be even more aggressive in its um in remediating this this scourge of um and uh, uh, um addressing our children. But thank you for the opportunity to testify. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much. Uh, I think with respect to the level, uh, it would make sense. The if you have limited financial resources and you do an um and an analysis of how much money it's going to take to address that. And if you don't have that amount of money, do you think it should be done in a stepwise fashion? 
Uh, I mean, certainly, I, I, just, uh, I, I, under, I understand that, um, Senator, but I mean, there, we, we, we put money where we put our priorities, and we are so far behind in addressing this, um, this issue. We really should put as many resources as we possibly can to address lead, lead poisoning in the state. As I said, New Haven is already addressing it at five milligrams. So New Haven is one of the biggest um, uh, you know, areas. Uh, Bridgeport has been pretty aggressive in, in addressing um, lead poisoning in its city. Um, we just we need to raise the standard of the state and um, and just go full bore. Okay, thank you so much. This is very helpful. Thank you for your testimony. Bye. Thank you. Seeing no other questions or comments, we'll move on to the next person on the list, which is uh, um, Jason uh, Privilege. Wait, but um, did I get that? Oh, wait, uh, I actually, I'm sorry. I'm just gonna uh, correct myself. It's number four, uh, Paul uh, Pescatello, Mr. Paul Pescatello. Hi, good afternoon. Again, you know, Paul Pescatello, I'm a senior counsel and executive director of the Bioscience Growth Council at the CBIA. I'm here today to speak in support of SB 89, an act concerning surgical smoke. Um, SB 89 solves a serious problem with um, straightforward, simple solutions. Surgical uh, smoke is, is the um, airborne, airborne vapors, gases, and particles that are the byproduct of modern sur surgical procedures. These procedures often utilize electrical devices to quote unquote cut and cauterize tissue. Without proper suction and ventilation of such smoke um, toxic su substances, many of which are carcinogenic, um, such as benzene, hydrogen cyanide, and formaldehyde, are released into the air and inhaled by those in the operating room. Uh, these, those, those affected include surgeons, nurses, anesthesiologists, uh, surgical technicians. It should be noted that um, surgical, surgical smoke also can contain viruses and bacteria. Uh, surgical smoke is deemed responsible for many um, HPV infections suffered by oper operating room staff. Fortunately, an array of effective um, surgical smoke evacuation devices exist that capture and vent surgical smoke. Many, if not most, operating rooms have such devices. Um, however, consistent use of the surgical smoke evacuation devices is uneven. SB 89 solves this problem by mandating surgical facilities develop and implement a surgical smoke evacuation policy. The, the only suggestion we would make is that the committee revise the bill to allow additional time to develop and implement the surgical smoke evacuation policies. The timeline in the, in the bill um, as currently drafted involves potentially tight timelines that may be difficult or impossible to meet given issues surrounding procurement of uh, the various components in surgical devices, surgical smoke evacuation devices. Um, and so again, we support it, um, uh, SB 89 wholeheartedly and um, hope, hope you, will, you will too. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Pescatello. I will uh, defer the first line of questions to my co-chair, uh, Representative Steinberg. And I have a question if he is not going to already ask that. We'll have to see. Um, Paul, good to see you. Uh, I know you're not necessarily someone who spends a lot of time in the surgical suite, hopefully, but uh, right. how, how realistic is it for us to expect every hospital to retrofit all their surgical suites, considering how noxious these materials are? You have to invent them pretty effectively, I would imagine. Uh, you know, we, we have some experience in this committee dealing with HVAC systems and uh, talking about ventilation, filtration, and circulation. Uh, are you confident that the solutions are out there? Because we wonder why this is so obvious it hasn't been done already. Right, you know, definitely the solutions are out there in terms of the actual devices. Um, and again, it's more the uneven use of devices. I think that um, what you'll find is that the devices exist, they're installed, often they're installed, um, but not consistently used. And so I think that this is a this is a good two-part solution, both uh, mandating the devices, again, which many operating rooms or surgical facilities already have, um, but then requiring a policy and the policy will, you know, would include, would, would inevitably include, you know, using them consistently. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 
Thank, thank you, Representative Steinberg. Uh, Mr. Pescatello, the timeline that you were talking about, do you have anything in your mind based on your reading of the expectations uh, and for how long it's going to take for the hospitals? Um, you know, I, I, I think you should probably, um, I think, listen to the hospitals themselves and the operating rooms. But I think like a, shifting it out another 12 months would make sense. Okay, this is very helpful. Thank you so much for your testimony. And seeing no other questions or comments, we'll move on to the next person on the list, which is uh, Wendy Levy. Thank you. Thank you. Am I on? Yes, go ahead, Miss. Yes, you are. But can uh, you see we me? can hear you, but we cannot see you. Okay. Now I. Go ahead. The, can you see me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, uh, thank you for allowing me to testify on HB 5046. I am Dr. Wendy Levy, clinical and forensic psychologist in private practice in Lower Fairfield County for about 25 years, as well as assistant clinical professor of psychiatry at Yale. Uh, although I'm testifying about HB 5046 on CYPAC, I also appreciate this recent discussion on the importance of opioid treatment as I began my career in a methadone clinic many, many years ago. I currently specialize in trauma, domestic violence, addiction, and immigration. In my practice, I wear two hats. I see privates clinically, in person, and online, and I conduct forensic psychological evaluations to a different population. Um, I think I'll give you some examples of, of how CIPACT is important here. Connecticut is a small state. I have ongoing patients who live in Connecticut for work or attend college 45 minutes or more away, but across state lines. If they cross state lines, I can't see them clinically. Similarly, I have patients who travel for emergency, uh, for serious emergencies, whom I'm not able to support. I recall a trauma patient who called me from Metro North commuter train in a crisis. And theoretically, once the train cost, crossed the, Connecticut, the New York border, I was supposed to stop the call. Another example is I had a Connecticut-based college student who experienced significant trauma. And when she was able to return to school in a neighboring state, as an out-of-state psychologist, I could only see her for 10 days a year. In practical terms, that's 10 sessions of one hour for the whole year. CIPACT, CIPACT would take care of that. CIPACT, an interstate licensure compact, allows psychologists in Connecticut to practice for up to 30 days per year, telehealth or otherwise, in another CIPACT state. Similarly, given the mental health care shortage here, psychologists from other CIPACT states can practice 30 hours a year in Connecticut. On the forensic end, my other hat, I evaluate Connecticut federal defendants or undocumented immigrants who are transferred to federal prisons in other states. Massachusetts is one of them. Massachusetts has, has the law, the guideline of 10, 10 days a year for out-of-state out psychologists. Um, but before I, I agree to conduct any evaluation, I need to make sure I abide by this out-of-state rules and not use up those precious few days a year. CIPACT would take care of that. Um, to date, there are 28 CIPAC participating states plus nine with active ongoing CIPAC legislations. I don't see any reasons for concern as a practicing psychologist and as a Connecticut resident with our state joining CIPACT and believe firmly that doing so will ultimately be of considerable utility to many psychologists in the states towards the effective care of their clients. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Levy. This is a very useful testimony and, and you make a very strong case for all of us to uh, strongly consider the, the legislation in front of us. I'm not, not seeing any questions or comments and with that, we will move on to the next person. We again, thank you for being here. The next person is Jason Trevledge. Uh, uh, hi, Mr. Trevledge, how are you? Good morning, Senator. I'm doing well. Thank you. How about yourself? Good. Um, esteemed chairs and members of the Public Health Committee, uh, thank you so much for having me this morning. Please accept this testimony for Senate Bill 213, an act allowing medical assistance to administer vaccines 
on behalf of the Connecticut Academy of Physician Assistants. CONAPA fully supports efforts to increase the access to care for patients, which in part comes from increased efficiency of care, the ability for medical assistants to administer vaccines as they move in the direction of increased efficiency. As you are likely aware, PAs work across all specialties and practice settings. Quite often, PAs work in environments where they are working in conjunction with an MA only, and thus the ability for PAs to be able to order a vaccination and have the MA administer it under the oversight of a PA is crucial. Such ability will ultimately increase access to care as the PAs will then be able to care for more patients in the time that would otherwise be spent performing vaccinations. As an example, I was meeting last week with a PA who practices in occupational health and urgent care in Fairfield County with multiple statewide locations. He explained that they use a model that does not include RNs and subsequently the PAs, physicians and APRNs administer their own immunizations, medications, etc. The necessity to administer vaccinations themselves greatly limits their ability to work efficiently and provide care to more patients. I've also worked in such a practice model and can attest firsthand to the efficiency that would come with the ability for MAs to administer immunizations under PA direction. Medical assistants are currently supervised by PAs in a multitude of settings as delegated by the physicians who work in collaboration with the PA. At the direction and with the oversight of PAs, MAs have for over five decades acquired vital signs and lab specimens, applied dressings and splints, and performed a myriad of office-based testing. It should be noted that the majority of APRNs in the state of Connecticut work in positions interchangeably with PAs under collaborative agreements with physicians. They are included in this bill, whereas PAs are not. If Senate Bill 213 is passed without the inclusion of PAs, it will send a strong and erroneous message that PAs should not be directing MAs in all of the care they can and should be able to provide. If PAs are excluded from this bill, appropriate care will be reduced because of the new unintentional barrier that will be imposed upon the PA profession. If you advance Senate Bill 213, please add PAs alongside physicians and advanced practice registered nurses and the ability to supervise MAs. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. This is very helpful. Thank you so much. Seeing no other comments or questions, we will move on to the next person on the list, Jennifer Penna. Ms. Penna. Thank you. Hey. Disting Can you hear me? Distinguished co-chairs and members of the Public Health Committee, my name is Jennifer Pennock and I'm the Associate Director of Government Affairs for the Association of Perioperative Registered Nurses. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today uh, to testify on behalf of AORN's Connecticut members in support of Senate Bill 89. Like cigarette smoke, surgical smoke can be seen and smelled. Unlike cigarette smoke, surgical smoke is still prevalent in employee workplaces like the operating room. In the room where they are saving lives, healthcare workers in the OR can be exposed daily to toxic surgical smoke, which is the smoke from the patient's burning tissue and flesh. And it may, it may contain live viruses, toxic chemicals, and blood fragments hazardous to the health of everyone in the room. Many agencies and organizations recognize surgical smoke as hazardous, but there are still no nationally or Connecticut statewide enforceable standards requiring the control and evacuation of surgical smoke. OSHA, NIOSH, the CDC and the Joint Commission have all recommended the use of engineering controls to essentially eliminate occupational exposure to surgical smoke inhalation, but the recommendations are not requirements. AORN, our members and surgical team supporters have been working in states across the country to enact legislation that would ensure that facilities use the surgical smoke evacuation equipment, most of them already have, to protect the health and safety of their employees and patients. To date, legislation has been enacted in Rhode Island, Colorado, Kentucky, Oregon, and Illinois. In addition to Connecticut, at least 11 other states will consider surgical smoke evacuation legislation this year. Surgical smoke can be safely and effectively evacuated by using a smoke evacuator device designed to capture the smoke at the source. Such a device may be attached to the electrosurgical pencil being used by the surgeon. General room ventilation at recommended air exchange levels is not sufficient to capture the contaminants in smoke or to protect healthcare workers from harmful, harmful exposure. However, it is important to note that surgical smoke evacuation does not involve construction costs or changes to a facility's HVAC system or general room ventilation. SB 89 proposes a solution to a hazardous workplace issue faced by thousands of healthcare workers for decades. At a time when healthcare workers are experiencing burnout and leaving the profession, Connecticut can take an important step to protect the health and safety of OR staff and shore up the workforce residents rely on for, the healthcare, for their healthcare delivery. Thank you, I'd be happy to answer any questions. 
Thank you so much for your testimony, Ms. Pinnock. Um, I do have a few questions and clarifications. Mm -hmm. um, uh, th there was uh, uh, a concern raised that maybe it will take a little bit of time for the hospitals to be ready, but um, you do have understanding of what some of the other states have done. And, and it seems from your testimony, it's not as complex an issue as some may believe it is. So could you allude to how long it took in some of the other states and, and what that solution could uh, look like rather than changing engineering? It's, it's just a device. And is there a back order of those devices? Sure. Thank you for the question. To my knowledge, there is not a, a back order of devices or, or any supply chain issues related to surgical smoke evacuation equipment. Um, implementation timeline in the five states that have enacted legislation so far has ranged from the shortest, which was about seven months, uh, to two years. And we have had conversations, um, you know, throughout the course of this session with other stakeholders like the Hospital Association and understand there are concerns about the implementation timeline in Connecticut. And we hope to um, come to an agreement with uh, stakeholders on the, any additional time that may be needed. Um, you know, we, our members know uh, quite well how the, the pandemic has really upended everything in the healthcare space. So, you know, we're sympathetic to concerns there. Thank you. This is very helpful. And, and, and um, I can also thank uh, you and your, your entire uh, group of uh, nurses who have been uh, passionate advocates. And, and uh, it's, it's important to recognize that the, the surgeons sometimes are there for a procedure, which may take uh, one hour to 16 hours, but the nursing staff are spending every single day, uh, 12 hours, eight to 12 hours a day in that environment. And it just adds up much more and then has significant impact. So truly appreciate your testimony and, and, and your advocacy work. Thank you. I see a question from my colleague, um, Representative Young. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just a quick question for you. I've actually been um, looking into this issue for a number of years now, and I've put in for legislation on this in the past. And one of the briefings I got from the nurses was that uh, most places do have these smoke evac evacuation systems, but a lot of the doctors um, don't want to use them um, because they get in their way kind of thing. So would an education program going along with this help to alleviate that so that uh, these things can be used in the operating rooms? Thank you for the question, Representative Young, and, and your interest in this issue um, the past few sessions as well. So you are correct. Most facilities do already have the equipment that they need um, in order to evacuate surgical smoke. It's just not always used um, by the surgeon. It can be surgeon preference. The way this legislation is written, um, directing facilities to adopt and implement policies um, to evacuate surgical smoke gives that um, runway, if you will, for everybody to be involved in the policy making. Um, surgeons will have time to trial different products out. And so I think that that education and awareness will come with the policy development. AORN has a number of resources as well, um, you know, our guideline for surgical smoke evacuation and a number of educational tools that we provide for members uh, to educate their colleagues about uh, the hazards of surgical smoke and evacuation of surgical smoke. But we feel confident that with the process for developing that policy and engagement from staff that, um, you know, perhaps surgeons who don't have as much experience with certain pieces of equipment or, um, you know, haven't used equipment that with, whose technology has advanced significantly uh, will find themselves able to, um, you know, find something that they can definitely work with. Okay, great. Thank you very much for your testimony. And uh, this seems like a no-brainer to me. So thank you very much. Thank you. We really appreciate the committee raising the bill. Thank you so much for your testimony. Seeing no other comments or questions, we will talk, continue our conversation. Thank you. Uh, with that, the next person on our list is Dr. Marcy Russo. Uh, Dr. Russo. Hi, everybody. Hi, Senator Anwar, Representative Steinberg, and members of the Public Health Committee. My name is Marcy Russo. I'm a Connecticut licensed psychologist, and I am chair of the Legislative Committee for Connecticut Psychological Association. I'm also a Middlebury resident. 
I am testifying today in support of HB 5046, which outlines an interstate compact that facilitates the practice of psychology using telecommunication technologies and or temporary in-person face-to-face psychological practice. First, I'd like to take a moment to recognize and commend you for working to positively address the crisis we are experiencing in Connecticut and in our nation with regards to accessing mental health care. It is very clear to us that a system that was already burdened with a dearth of behavioral health providers has unfortunately grown during the time of COVID-19 pandemic, making it even more difficult to access behavioral health care in a timely fashion. We are seeing increased systemic barriers at a time when our policies and laws should support our providers of care, should provide incentives for providing exceptional care, and work to set up a system that efficiently and expeditiously supports providers to provide care to patients in Connecticut, even then when those patients choose to temporarily relocate out of state. There are many benefits that PsychPAC can offer to us, including increased asset access to competent mental health care in Connecticut, the facilitation of continuity of care, for example, when a patient moves out of Connecticut, goes to college in another side pack state or travels, and it offers the provision of an added degree of consumer protection across state lines. Connecticut consumers are in need of access to behavioral health services now, and PSYCPAC is one important tool for one to improve access quickly. The Connecticut Psychological Association, which is an advocacy organization representing more than 2,000 psychologists in Connecticut, urge your immediate support of PSYCPAC. Here are a few examples of how PSYCPAC can help our consumers. PSYCPAC telehealth will be utilized when the Connecticut patient moves or travels to another PSYCPAC state. The patient will be the, the um, patient's Connecticut licensed psychologist will be able to continue to provide care with a PSYCPAC certificate. We also call it an e-passport. PSYCPAC temporarily, um, the temporary in-person face-to-face practice can allow a PSYCPAC psychologist from Connecticut to practice for 30 days annually in another PSYCPAC state. This allows a psychologist from another state to do the same in Connecticut. This can be profoundly helpful It's for 30 separate days of specialty consultation or for transitioning an established patient that decides to temporarily move out of Connecticut. Psychologists who establish a practice in Connecticut for the long term will continue to be required to be licensed in Connecticut. That piece does not change. Without uh, Dr. Russo, but your time is almost up. If you could summarize. Thank you. Thank you. The cost to Connecticut will be minimal. There'll be an additional $10 fee per psychologist who chooses to join PsychPAC. PsychPAC is not new to Connecticut. It's been studied and presented in Connecticut for several years, and it's time to support this legislation now. Thank you all for listening. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Russo, for your testimony. I had asked us a question earlier about uh, the insurance industry, how they have been dealing with this. Are they trying to pay less for the services when somebody's from out of state or or of doing telehealth? Thanks, Senator Anwar. Yeah, it would work the way that that um, telepsych works, that the way that telehealth works. And unfortunately, there are some. Um, reimbursement issues. Um, I think it really falls and it's important for us to take a look at uh, mental health parity in terms of rate and access to services. So I don't know that it will immediately solve that, but um, certainly PSYCPAC should function under the existing telehealth laws that we have. Good. We certainly this have is very helpful. We, we, it. Good, good. This is very helpful. And, and uh, uh, again, the arguments that you, you make and, and many of the others have made are very, very powerful and very useful. I see our, our ranking member, uh, uh, Senator Tony Huang, has a question or comment. Uh, Senator Huang. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, Dr. Russo, great to see you. Uh, please extend my appreciations to all of your colleagues of uh, CPA and the good work that you're doing. Could you kind of, on a broader basis, talk about the incredible challenge from a standpoint of mental health parity related to insurance as the co-ranking, as the ranking in insurance. I, I think that goes hand in hand. Uh, we have talked a lot about the issues, but what are the challenges for you 
and all of your fellow practitioners in regards to uh, insurance parity. It, it really is a, a, a incredible challenge during these very difficult times. It is, Senator Wang, and I so appreciate you bringing up that. You've worked with both of our CPA president, Dr. Doran. She's going to be testifying as well today and all of us. Um, I guess I would answer very succinctly is that it seems like there is no parity, unfortunately, still. We have insurance companies that charge uh, at various rates, and um, some are engaging in some practices that makes it very, very difficult for patients not only to access care, but for psychologists and other behavioral health providers to get paid timely, um, to get paid consistently, and to not have, uh, we've been having a huge amount of difficulty with what we call clawbacks. That's when an insurance company comes back several years, sometimes several years after we've delivered patient uh, services to a patient and had said, yeah, we, we want that, that reimbursement back or we've only decided to reimburse this portion, so please return the rest. Um, it's highly disruptive to care and it's very difficult for consumers to access um, with, the, with the insurance issues that we're having right now. Thank you. And, and what do you say to the, some of the challenges is from a standpoint of, of mental health insurance parity is the fact that, you know, th there is a sustained period of treatment, unlike a broken leg or, or uh, you know, any specific treatment. There is a finite time in regards to treatment. And one of the rationales given is the fact that mental health is a, a long term type of a treatment pathology. Uh, what do you say to that? And, and how do you suggest we can't figure it all, but, but is that one of the points of concerns that we need to address and, and, and raise awareness to? I think there are a lot of um, conditions that individuals have that need long-term care. You look at heart disease, you look at diabetes, you look at different uh, medical conditions that individuals have that aren't a, a one and done type deal, right? Yes. If I had strep throat, I'll go to the doctor. I'm seen once I have an antibiotic and it's all set. Um, behavioral health issues are not that way. They often do not develop overnight the way a bacteria can develop overnight in your system. Um, and they're not often cured. And, and unfortunately, patients don't see alleviation of their symptoms overnight. Sometimes it, it does take a while. Um, and I also think that we have to engage in a, in a regular dialogue around mental health. I think the days are long gone to see of it as a stigma. Your mental health is part of your well-being. It's, it should be equally important as your physical health. And I'm not sure that we as a society, unfortunately, are, are to that point yet in seeing the importance of mental health and how impaired it is for, for someone's overall well-being. Thank you. And I, I appreciate the indulgence of the chair for, for my expansion into a different area. But nonetheless, as we focus on mental health, it is a, a, an entire 360 degree perspective we need to address. And uh, and you're right in the center of it, you and your colleagues. So please, again, accept my appreciation and gratitude for the hard work that you do in, in, in the mental health awareness in our state and, and in our communities. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Dr. Russo. Thank you, Senator Wong. Thank you, Senator Wong. Uh, Dr. Russo, can I just uh, ask you about uh, the medical records and the continuity around those? Um, uh, there, there's some question that were uh, asked earlier about uh, the data, the connecting with other physicians, managing the case in some of these individuals. And if a CIPAC phys, uh, psych, psychologist is in another state, how are we communicating some of those? You know, that's an excellent question. I would, I believe it falls under our regular HIPAA current laws. There need to be releases of information that the patient would sign so that treatment providers, um, whether they're in state or not, can coordinate um, and make sure that there is a coordinated care provided to the patient. Okay, thank you so much for that. And uh, seeing no other questions or comments, we'll move on to the next person on the list, uh, which is uh, uh, Jennifer Kane, which is going to be a video again. Thank you. Okay, this is testimony for Bill HB 5277, that had more doctor's offices be accessible. I think that's very important. Have tables that go up and down and scales that accessible scales make it easier for us to get weight and stuff. And so I think that's very extremely important.
for the testimony. Um, we do not have a question. The next person on our list is uh, uh, Margaret Bloom. Thank you, honorable co-chairs, vice chairs, and ranking members, and all distinguished members of the Public Health Committee for the opportunity to testify today in favor of House Bill 5045 and acts reducing lead poisoning. My name is Margaret Bloom. I'm a resident of Cheshire and a policy practice social work student at UConn. I stand in support of HB 5045 because the provisions in this bill are necessary for the well-being of all of Connecticut's youngest children. All Connecticut, all children deserve to play and live in safe environments, free from toxic materials like lead. Young children put foreign objects in their mouths as they explore the world around them. They play outside in the dirt as they get fresh air and exercise. However, these everyday childhood activities can lead to the ingestion of leaded paint chips, contaminated soil, and contaminated dust. The CDC does not recognize any blood level, blood level as safe in children. Blood can lead to irreversible harm, and there is no cure. Long-term effects include damage to the brain and nervous system, delays in growth and development, behavioral challenges like impulsivity, aggression, and inattention, and the loss of IQ points, even at relatively low blood blood levels below five micrograms per deciliter. Blood poisoning is an issue of social and racial justice. Black children are 2.3 times more likely to have blood blood levels greater or equal to five micrograms per deciliter than white children and Hispanic children are 1.4 times more likely to have this blood level than non-Hispanic children. Further, Connecticut's poorest communities bear an unequal burden. In 2017, 52.2% of cases occurred in New Haven, Bridgeport, Waterbury, Hartford, and Meriden. These disparities are unacceptable. All children should be able to participate safely in normal childhood activities, regardless of who they are or where they live. However, this does not go far enough, and HB 5045 should be modified to lower the blood blood level required for an environmental investigation to 3.5 micrograms per deciliter, the CDC's 2021 updated blood blood reference level. In 2017, quote unquote, only 1,665 children had a blood blood level at or above 5 micrograms per deciliter. But cases of blood poisoning have fallen but this is still 1,665 children too many. As the prevalence of cases drops, we can use our resources to positively impact the lives of children with lower and lower blood lead levels. Even levels before five micrograms per deciliter can cause lasting harm. We must also ensure that funds are allotted to ensure that all families and landlords have the necessary funds to carry out lead abatement. Lead poisoning is irreversible and incurable. It is an issue of racial and social justice. I urge you to support HP 5045 with the modification to support the well being of Connecticut's children. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Truly appreciate your good work. Did you say you're a, a social work student? Correct, I am. Okay, excellent, excellent work and, and, and uh, much needed at this time. We truly need social workers, and, and, and especially with the ones who are so thoughtful like you are. All Thank right. You. Moving on to the next person on the list, which is Rick um, Del Valle or Del Valley. Del Valley. I'm going to take the risk, and then you can tell me how inaccurate. Can you hear me? <clears throat> Very well. Yes, Rick, you you weren't too you weren't too far off, sir. It was it's uh, Del Valley. So, um, but I'm here today in support of. Bill HB 544, 5044. Um, I would like to thank the committee for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Rick Del Valley, and I'm a man in long-term recovery. I've been clean and sober since 2000, February 5th, 2008. I have an amazing and purposeful life today. Getting clean and sober was the best decision I ever made for myself. Since that day, I've gone back to school and I've gotten my degree from the DARK program. I have gotten married and have a family with two beautiful boys, Ricky and Carson. In 2014, my wife and I opened our first recovery home. We now own and operate six homes with a total of 85 beds for men in the city of New Haven, Connecticut. I work with people who suffer as I once did with substance use disorder and mental illness. 
I have been in the struggle of addiction and the struggle of helping those in early recovery. The most powerful lesson I've learned in my years of working in this field is we need to embrace the person when they say they are ready. When they say, I want help, can you help me, please? We need to seize the moment. Having a place to go that's safe and resourceful is a major key. I speak from my own experiences of having no place to go, of being on the streets, wanting to stop using, feeling hopeless. I had nowhere to go and I wanted to die. In July 2020, a place called the Redemption House opened. The Redemption House was a unique facility run entirely by volunteers in recovery using a small amount of our own funding. Over the course of one year, we had 486 admits, taking people straight from detoxes and hospitals and even off the streets, providing a bridge to help them find the next step in their recovery journey. We were amazingly successful and we built many important community relationships. Unfortunately, we had to close our doors in July 2021 because we needed outside financial support, whether from state agencies, local agency hospitals, private rehabs, or recovery houses. It was a sad day closing the door, but we had no choice. I'm here today to tell you we found a piece of the puzzle that works. Redemption House provides that model. With adequate funding, mostly for staffing, we can get another Redemption House up and running in a matter of one month. If I could tell all the agencies that we work with that we were opening another Redemption House today, they would tell you how grateful they are, how much of a vital resource Redemption House provided. Investing in Redemption House is a great way to invest in the recovery for the state of Connecticut. Last year, we had a record number of overdoses in the state. In 2020, there were 1,378 overdoses, an increase of 14.3 compared to, 19, to 2019. I believe those numbers would be a lot higher if it had not been for Redemption House and the 486 people that we took in. The time is now to make an investment in a solution that will have a huge impact, that will have a ripple effect across the entire recovery community. I'm here today begging for help to help me embrace a solution that will bring robust results. I'm on the front lines of this battle every day, and I know what works and what doesn't. If you are here today and want to see true change, then let's work together to bring about a change that will not only save lives, but will get the number of deaths occurring in Connecticut in a downward trend. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Thank you so much, Mr. Del Valley. Thank you for the courage to um, take care of yourself, but also make sure that you help so many more people. This is very inspiring and, and thank you for sharing your story. I do have a few questions. Um, uh, within the recovery uh, work that you're doing, um, how effective are recovery coaches who are who have already been in the in their journey of recovery? I, I think it's it's very effective. I, I wish every person that was coming out of treatment or coming out of prison um, had access to a recovery coach um, because the 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 statistics of you know one addict helping another is without parallel. The statistics go way up. And I've seen it in my own houses with our experience. Right now, we're working with an organization that um, is providing people with recovery coaches free of charge. And um, the guys that are using those recovery coaches are seeing great success. Thank you. And, and, and just following up, the other uh, issue is, can you tell if there are differences between alcohol re recovery and opioid addiction recovery? No, it's, it's all the same. It, it, it's all the same. It's all the same. Okay. And, and that's the sense I have from some of the individuals that I've spoken with who have recovered um, as well. I, is it fair to say that the biggest hurdle from this model that works is lack of insurance payments and, and the lack of financial support uh, in an organized fashion around this issue? Yes, because, you know, like I said, in my testimony, when a person with a, with a substance use disorder wants to get help and he's asking for help and, he, and he's homeless, um, you know, he's, he's probably going to go use again. Um, but if you can seize that moment right then and there and say, hey, I have a place for you to go, like the Redemption House where we took them off the street and they were safe. And then we had volunteers help to find them what their next step in, their, in the recovery process was for them. It had a huge impact. 
Good. This is this is very helpful. I, I will try and, and follow up uh, with you later as well, so because we need to. Uh, I I know across the different parts of the state there have been individuals like you who are trying to save as many people as they can, and and some of the models are more effective than uh, the existing quote unquote uh, uh, effective models that that uh, are sometimes not as effective. So we need to figure that out. So thank you yes, so much. And- and, and I thank you for the work that you guys are diligently doing. Um, but this is just a, another piece of the puzzle that that does work. So I thank you. Thank you. Seeing no other questions or comments, we'll move on to the next person in our list, which is Dana Carpenter, followed by Rebecca Allen. Uh, Dana Carpenter. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Excellent. OK. Uh, Chairs Abrams, Steinberg, and members of the Public Health Committee, I want to thank you guys for giving me the opportunity to speak today uh, on behalf of SB 89, an act concerning surgical smoke. Uh, I cannot stress enough the importance of the use of smoke evacuation devices in the operating room. Every day, my colleagues and I are exposed. Um, Are you still there? Can you hear me? Okay, thank you, sorry. Um, I I'm can't... here, I'm taking a bite. Oh, okay. <laughs> I cannot stress enough the importance of the use of smoke evacuation devices in the operating room. Every day, my colleagues and I are exposed to surgical smoke for hours on end while caring for our patients. According to the CDC, surgical smoke has been shown to contain toxic gases, viruses, bacteria, and other particles that can be harmful when inhaled. Our department, currently has three smoke evacuator machines to share between eight operating rooms. This frequently leaves staff to scramble and fight for equipment. Those who do not get a smoke evacuator are left exposed for the day. I encourage you to ensure the use of smoke evacuation devices in operating rooms across the state. The safety of our doctors, nurses, scrub personnel, and all other staff working in the operating room rely on this decision. It will help us protect ourselves, our families, and our patients. Please vote yes in support of SB 89. And again, I didn't say before, but um, I'm a surgical technologist and I work in the operating room with the doctors. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Because I was mute, uh, I wanted to ask you: Was that there are eight um, operating rooms and only three have the machine in them? Is it because uh, the machines are very expensive, or it was not available? Could you help us understand why? Yeah, I mean that's an issue. Yeah, just like all surgical equipment, they are you know expensive, um, but I mean they are definitely worth the money to protect our staff and other hospitals in the area have enough uh, smoke evacuate uh, smoke evacuation machines to go around uh, but our specific department and hospital um, does not okay this is very helpful thank you so much for your testimony thank you so much and seeing no other um, first questions or comments we'll move on to next person Rebecca Ellen followed by David Bender, uh, Ms. Helen. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman Steinberg, Chairman Anwar, and members of the Public Health Committee. My name is Rebecca Allen, and I'm a registered voter in the town of Columbia and the Director of Recovery Advocacy for the Connecticut Community for Addiction Recovery, or CCAR. I'm a woman in long-term recovery, and what that means to me is that it's been over 24 years since the last time I used heroin. Thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony on House Bill 5044, which I'm urging you to support. I applaud the effort of Attorney General Tong in negotiating this settlement. And while no amount of money can replace the suffering and loss of life that the opioid epidemic has caused, this is a good first step in holding the corporations and individual players involved accountable. I wanna take this opportunity to urge Attorney General Tong and our other elected officials to continue their investigation 
and to take any and all steps necessary to ensure that this never happens again. Establishing an opioid settlement fund that will exclusively be used for opioid abatement, using these funds for evidence-based programs, increasing the state's capacity to collect and analyze data, and establishing an advisory committee aligns closely with the principles for the use of funds from the Opioid Litigation Guide published by John Hopkins University. This guide was created through a collaboration of dozens of organizations, including Faces, of, Faces and Voices of Recovery, in which CCAR is a founding member. These principles are spend money to save lives, use evidence to guide spending, invest in youth prevention, focus on racial equity, and develop a fair and transparent process for deciding where to spend the funding. I also wanna take this opportunity to state CCAR's interest in being an appointed member of the Opioid Settlement Advisory Committee. CCAR is a statewide nonprofit that provides advocacy, education, and community-based support services for individuals in or individuals seeking recovery. We have been successfully collaborating with our state and community partners for over 23 years. 90% of our staff members are either in recovery themselves or have family members that have been affected by addiction. CCAR has been boots on the ground in this opioid crisis since day one, and we know firsthand the types of supports needed to move somebody from active addiction to recovery. We would welcome the opportunity to be part of this important advisory committee. Thank you for your time, and I'm urging you to support HB 5044, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much uh, for your testimony and, and thank you for inspiring us by sharing your story and, and your journey. We, we truly appreciate it. And, and thank you for your kindness to help others in the process. I see my, my colleague, Representative uh, John Michael Parker, who has a question. Representative Parker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Nice to see you, Rebecca. It's, uh, appreciate the chance to, to speak with you on this. Just to, uh, I appreciate you putting forward the CCAR's interest in serving on the committee. That's great for us to hear. Um, and I appreciate your support in, in helping develop and, and bring us back to those principles about how this should be set up. Just wanted to check, do you have any other feedback on this piece of legislation to the extent to which it appropriately uh, fits within the principles that you know have been established? Is there anything else you think that could be strengthened about it or are you pretty good with it overall? Um, you know, like I shared, I think it's a really great, uh, uh, you know, step in the right direction. Absolutely. Um, what I would say about evidence-based practices, um, I do agree that they're very, very important in determining if, if you know, different programs and services are working. However, um, I wanna make sure that there is an opportunity for innovations because quite frankly, what we've been doing up to this point hasn't been working well. So I wanna make sure that there is some room for um, funding for some innovative programs and, and things that um, haven't been tried before. That's helpful. Thank you for sharing that. I know there's some language in there about um, the way to approach non-evidence-based treatments that haven't yet developed the evidence. And, and so I think your underlining of the need for innovation and the reality of the challenges we still face is really important. So we'll make sure that that language is, is up to par there to, to, to fit that in. Thanks for your testimony, Rebecca. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm all set. Thank you so much, Representative Parker. Thank you again, Ms. Ellen, for your testimony and, and the work you're doing. All right. Okay. Seeing no other okay. questions or comments, we'll move on to the next person on our list, which is uh, David Bender. Hi. Uh, thank you, Senator. Thank you, members of the Public Health Committee, for giving me the time to share my testimony regarding House Bill number 5046. My name is Dr. David Bender. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist working at the Institute of Living here in Hartford, and I maintain a private practice in West Hartford Center. At the Institute, I'm the clinical coordinator of an intensive mental health program that exclusively treats young adults with co-occurring mental health and physical health problems. In my private practice, I also treat a significant number of young adults. One of the very few silver linings of the COVID pandemic is how many of us in mental health learned how to use technology to actually increase patient access. Nearly two years ago, when COVID essentially shut down Connecticut, we quickly converted our treatment modalities from the typical in-person on-site treatment to entirely virtual. Mental health providers have been impressed by the efficacy of telemedicine, and one cannot argue that telemedicine allows us to reach patients and treat patients 
whom we would have never been able to reach otherwise. Many of the individuals I work with I originally met during their high school years. A lot of our work, in addition to, in addition to addressing psychiatric symptoms, focus on helping these young people become more equipped to, quote, do life. Many of these young people face myriad hurdles that must be identified, dressed, and conquered before they or their families could even comprehend taking on a first job after high school or after college or even attending college or attending graduate school. We work intensively and openly in a highly collaborative way to enhance their sense of mastery, confidence, and confidence. Many of these young people travel out of state for these significant experiences, and until recently, that would mean an often abrupt end or termination of our therapeutic work and our therapeutic relationship. However, now that we have a service available to us such as SIPAC, we would be afforded the opportunity, if all parties wished, to continue our work together, to maintain that continuity of care, so we could continue supporting, treating, and validating our patients when they are in their new, potentially intimidating environments. Our vulnerable patients face enough challenges packing up their homes, relocating, and starting out in new places with no friends, no colleagues, and no familiar places identified to decompress in, unnecessarily forcing them to terminate with their therapists, whom they and their parents will say played a key role in bringing them to the very point that made these significant life changes possible is, in my opinion, cruel. Joining SIPACT would allow psychologists and their patients to avoid such unnecessary loss of support. I'm quite confident that providers, the individuals they treat, and their families would be tremendously grateful if their care were not interrupted. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony, Dr. Bender. We truly appreciate it. And this, uh, your words will help us uh, make the best decisions going forward. Thank you. And thank you for the work that you've been doing in difficult, challenging times. Seeing no comments or questions, we'll move on to the next person on our list, which is Mark Thompson. Mr. Thompson. Good afternoon, Senator Anwar, Representative Steinberg, and members of the Public Health Committee. My name is Mark Thompson, and I'm the Executive Director of the Fairfield County Medical Association and also the Hartford County Medical Association. I am here today in strong support of passage SB 213, an act concerning medical assistance administering vaccine. This issue has become a perennial bill and the time has come for this proposal to become law. Here are the reasons why. Only one of two states in the nation um, do not allow medical assistance to give vaccine and Connecticut happens to be one of those two states. Connecticut trains medical assistants who can travel to 48 other states where they can give vaccine, uh, but they cannot do it here. We've had instances where uh, people trained in Connecticut have gone to uh, one of the uh, 48 other states, uh, gave vaccines, but they moved back to Connecticut and they uh, were prevented be from being able to, uh, to administer vaccines here because of the situation that we have in Connecticut. This past year, Connecticut allowed pharmacy techs who receive only one and a half hours of online training uh, who can give vaccines. In contrast, medical assistants receive no less than eight hours of training in a clinical setting. In addition, medical assistants must have 720 hours of training to qualify to become a certified medical assistant through either the medical, the American medical technologist or the American Association of Medical Assistants. Patients self-administer all kinds of things. Uh, patients with absolutely no training at all uh, in, in any health-related field. Patients um, will self-administer Botox, vitamin B, insulin, uh, just to mention just a few. Uh, the administration of vaccines is incredibly safe and easy to do. There is no evidence in the medical literature of any adverse event as a result of a medical assistant giving vaccines. Medical assistants will only be allowed to administer in an outpatient setting, such as a physician office or a community health center. MAs will not be allowed to administer vaccines in a hospital or a nursing home. Direct on-site supervision um, is part of the, the legislation and um, I would agree with one of the previous speakers. Um, 
presenters here today, uh, the, the physician assistant um, that was probably an oversight in the drafting of this bill, uh, but the direct on-site supervision um, must be provided by either a physician, a nurse practitioner, and hopefully you will see fit to add uh, physician assistance to that language as well. Excuse me, Mr. Thompson, but your time is almost up. If you could summarize, please. Thank you. Thank you, yes, I will. If we want to keep the private practice of primary care vibrant in Connecticut, this bill will help with that regard. I thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much for your testimony. And I will hand over the management of the meeting uh, to our vice chair who will share going forward uh, to Representative Jillian Gilchrist. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. I don't see any questions. Thank you for your time today. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Mr. Michael Parisi. Thank you, Representative Gilchrist, Chairperson Abrams, Chairperson Steinberg, and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, testify at today's hearing. My name is Michael Parisi, and I'm here today uh, to testify in support of HB 5046 on compacts with the recommendation to include physical therapists in the bill. As a little bit of background, I'm a physical therapist who worked at Yale New Haven Hospital for 38 years before retiring in 2016 as the Director of Rehabilitation Services. I'm currently the chair of the Connecticut Board of Examiners for Physical Therapists and have been on the board since 2014. I'm all, I also serve as an adjunct professor in the physical therapy program at Sacred Heart University. Two of my primary concerns as a board chair are access to care and patient safety. Access to care was a recurring challenge in my 30 years as director at Yale caused by staffing shortages and or volume surges. We frequently reached out to travelers as a source to increase staff levels, but this was often complicated by the length of time that it took travelers to get a Connecticut license, particularly if travelers had worked in multiple states, which uh, was not infrequent. The unfortunate results were delays in initiating therapy and reduced treatment frequencies neither of which were optimal. This delay would be minimized with therapists who participate in the PT compact and help employers shore up staffing more quickly. From a safety perspective, I'm comfortable that all states have an acceptable baseline for us to consider joining the compact. All US physical therapy schools are accredited by the same entity and the national physical therapy examination is the same for all states. Finally, participation in the PT compact would require all new licensure applicants to undergo an FBI criminal background check, adding an extra measure of safety to all physical therapists becoming licensed in Connecticut. In terms of a healthy workforce, Haven offers important services for the professionals in the state. And I support their concern that physical therapists who come to Haven voluntarily should not have to self-report their participation when applying to the PT Compact. I believe though that the rules of the PT Compact do not require self-reporting for those seeking services voluntarily. And in my time on the board since 2014, there have been no instances where the board has required a PT to seek services in lieu of disciplinary action. I'm also pleased that through the collaborative process of working on this bill, the Connecticut Physical Therapy Association will provide content about the nature and value of Haven services at no charge to its members. The PT Excuse compact, me, Mr. Parisi, but your time is almost up. If you could summarize, thank you. Thank you. The PT compact is universally accepted by our profession with 32 to 34 states enacting legislation. And as such, I reiterate my support for HB 5046 with the recommendation that physical therapists be included. I thank you for your time and be glad to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Parisi. I uh, find that very interesting. Thank you for your testimony today. I don't see any questions. We'll follow up if any do come up. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, we will hear from number 37, Ms. Molly Markow Markowitz. 
Good afternoon. Um, my name is Dr. Molly Markowitz, and um, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak this afternoon. Um, I am a pediatrician who works in New Haven, Connecticut, and I'm here today representing myself, um, and my views don't reflect that of my employer. But I am speaking today in strong support of House Bill 5045. Um, as a pediatrician, I believe this bill is important because it will impact the health and well being of Connecticut's children for years to come. Um, based on updated CDC guidelines, lead poisoning is um, now defined as 3.5 micrograms or higher of lead per deciliter of blood. Therefore, to, um, we need to ensure that Connecticut, as a state, that our statutes and strategies are in line with national standards, which they currently are not. Um, as a pediatrician who works both in a clinic as well as in the hospital, I have seen firsthand how the toxic effects of lead affect children. Um, as many people today have been describing, you know, there are really serious health consequences, such as brain brain and nervous system damage, effects on growth and development, learning issues, behavioral problems, speech and hearing challenges. Um, and again, as um, others have highlighted, due to the COVID-19 um, pandemic, so many of our children are already experiencing issues in these areas. Um, and so um, having lead poisoning added on top of that is so detrimental to, um, to children's health and well-being. Um, further, also, um, other people have also highlighted today some of the health inequities that are associated with lead poisoning. So we know that children from lower income as well as minority families are at greatest risk. Um, specifically, we know that Black children are two times more likely to have an elevated lead blood level compared with white children. And as a pediatrician, I just wanna emphasize that lead poisoning is 100% a preventable disease. Um, children should not be used as detectors for lead. And um, once a child does develop lead poisoning, there's damage that cannot be reversed. Um, therefore, um, in order to protect Connecticut's children, I urge all of you to please um, support this very important bill. And thank you so much for the opportunity to speak today. And I'd be happy to answer any questions if you have any either now or um, via email, which I included in my written testimony. Fantastic. Thank you so much. I don't see any questions, but thank you, Dr. Markowitz, for being here today. Thank you. Have a great day. Next, we will hear from number 38, Kim Sander. Uh, good afternoon, Senator Abrams, Senator Anwar, Representative Steinberg, Senator Wong, Senator Summers, Representative Pettit, and all the members of the Public Health Committee, including my own representative, John Michael Parker. Uh, my name is Kimberly Claire Sandor. I'm the Executive Director of the Connecticut Nurses Association. I'm a registered nurse and a family nurse practitioner who has trained and practiced in outpatient primary care in different settings from local public health departments, FQHCs, and private practice. I'm presenting testimony today to specifically address Senate Bill 213, an act allowing medical assistance to administer vaccines. But before I begin, I want to let you know that I also, um, or we also submitted testimony in support of Senate Bill 89, an act concerning surgical smoke. And you've already heard from uh, Jennifer Pennock and Dana Carpenter, and also in support of um, House Bill 5045, an act reducing lead poisoning, which we know is 100% preventable illness. Um, but we are also asking you to consider specifically naming nutrition support services specifically in the language of the bill. So I'm happy to answer any questions related to those bills or others um, before the committee today. But let's turn back to Senate Bill 213, medical assistance and vaccines in outpatients as settings. So we have big concerns, but we offer some steps and solutions to really ensure patient safety. And to inform our testimony today, we reviewed some work we've done in the past, but we've also done a deep dive. Our uh, Government Relations Committee member, Lisa Capitani, has looked through um, all the other states and how they are function MAs are functioning in those states, what have been their approaches, best practices, lessons learned, and things we can put in as safeguards. We also talked to our APRNs um, about their use of MAs and experiences in the field, as well as re reviewing the CDC information on vaccine schedules, available information, 
and lots of good stuff. <laughs> we tried to put links to resources in our testimony so you can um, easily find them. So with that in mind, we offer the following recommendations. First, uh, to clearly and explicitly uh, identify the relationship of the medical assistant to the RN. This seems to be something that's really important upon our review of other states. Um, in the bill, it clearly defines a physician PA in a PRN as a delegator. The Connecticut Board of Examiners of Nursing is explicitly clear that RNs do not delegate medication administration to unlicensed assisted personnel. We recommend that the bill include language that explicitly states this. We also look at adding an additional vaccine administration sort of training certification and skills competency. This is done in varying formats across the country. Um, and we appreciate this builds upon the minimum knowledge that's required for that national certification. But what it does is it ra raises the field and levels it so that when employers are looking um, for an MA to hire an MA, they um, have knowledge and know that they've had some knowledge gaps and skill gaps already minimally um, attained. We also- Excuse me, Ms. Sander, your time sure. is almost up if you could summarize. Thank you. you bet. So in our in our written testimony, we incorporate some different additional requirements that some out of state folks use, um, including, you know, identifying yourself as a medical assistant and some information for consideration of the age groups um, that we start with with medical assistants providing vaccines. As always, happy to answer questions and meet with you and follow send any follow up information. Great, thank you so much. I don't see any questions. Thank you for your time today. Okay, great. Next, we will hear from number 40, Dan Moyer. Thank you, Representative Gilchrist, uh, co-chairs, vice chairs, and members of the committee. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to testify today. Uh, my name is Dan Moyer. I am the senior manager for environmental law and policy at the Consumer Technology Association. Uh, CTA is North America's largest tech trade association. Our members range from startup tech companies to global brands, helping support more than 18 million jobs. I'm here today to share CTA's opposition to Senate Bill 255, an act concerning flame retardants, which requires labeling all consumer products which contain flame retardants. We support the language in the bill, which defines children products to exclude electronics, because this language recognizes that consumer electronics often use flame retardants to comply with UL safety standards regarding flammability. And this is consistent with laws in other states. However, CTA is concerned with the labeling requirements in this bill, which require a label on every consumer product sold in the state. Our manufacturers make products for the North American market at large and often don't specifically package or label for Connecticut. So this labeling requirement would create a significant burden. No other state requires such a label for flame retardants. The proposed label requirements requires manufacturers of the, to claim that the state has determined that fire safety requirements can be met without adding flame retardants. This is not true for electronic products. Electronic components often have flame retardants, such as components like printed circuit boards, in order to function safely because they carry currents. If this committee wishes to move forward with legislation on flame retardants, we respectfully ask that you align with other states that have moved forward on this issue. For our industry, having predictability and harmonization across states is important for companies to ensure compliance. Thank you again for allowing us the opportunity to express our concerns. I'm happy to take any questions and engage in further discussion on this important issue. Thank you, Mr. Moyer, for your testimony today. I don't see any questions. Thank you for your time. Next, we will hear from number 42, uh, Dr. Jennifer Duran. Oh, I saw her and now. Hi, how are you? Sorry, I thought um, one of my colleagues was, was going right before me. It took me just a minute to get on. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here and to speak with you all today. My name is Dr. Jennifer Dorn. I am a psychologist and I am the current president of the Connecticut Psychological Association. So I'm here on behalf of the profession of psychology and representing more than 2000 psychologists who work across our state. Um, we are strongly in support of House Bill 5046, the Interstate Psychology Jurisdictional Compact for many of the reasons that you heard already today. Um, again, 28 states have already enacted it, nine more 
are in the works, it is very important in terms of increasing access to care, which is one of the largest challenges that we have. Um, I'm happy to answer specific questions if we have them. I don't want to repeat much of what has already been said and will be said by our colleagues, but, but just to say, I, I think you guys can understand that it doesn't make sense. Um, you know, I'll give the example of a college student, right? A college student who attends the University of Connecticut but lives in Rhode Island or Massachusetts would need two providers to have continuous mental health care. They would need a provider while they are in school, you know, residing on campus, and then they would need another provider for when they are at home for holiday breaks or semester breaks over the summer. Um, if you can't get one provider paid for by insurance, you certainly can't get more than one, right? So it doesn't make sense for, for a variety of reasons. And what SIPACT would do was allow this individual to have one provider in either Massachusetts or Connecticut and see that person continuously. Um, I work just um, so you guys know, I work for the VA and we have kind of a hub and spoke telehealth model. We can be licensed in any state, we can cross state lines. It is a model that works really well. What we're able to do is take provider rich areas and providers with different specialties and kind of spoke out to rural and underserved communities where there isn't access to care, where people need care. So I have personal experience with an interstate telehealth model. In fact, I run our New England virtual care clinic in the VA, and I can tell you what we have been able to do in terms of increasing access to care for veterans by allowing interstate practice has been a game changer. And, um, you know, I personally serve many, many veterans in rural and underserved communities that would have no access to care without the ability to cross state lines. Happy to answer any questions if there are any about the bill and why it's so important for us. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Doran. Yes, we do. Uh, Senator Huang, go right ahead. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair, and welcome, Dr. Doran. Um, first, before we begin, I wanna thank you for your work in the VA in helping our veterans as they deal with the challenges of, of post-war experiences and the trauma of, uh, of what they experience. So thank you very much for what you do. Um, on, on the point of um, this bill, I, I can see your organization, uh, CPA, supporting it. And in fact, you have made that recommendation to increase access to mental health care. Uh, are there any other particular suggestion as we as a legislative body explore uh, addressing the mental health crisis that has been brought on by all the varied challenges that we encounter. So any particular other suggestions? Yeah, I think there's so much that we can do to, to increase access to care. Obviously, I think SIPACT is an important part of that. Um, I will echo what my colleagues have said about mental health parity being, you know, a thing on paper and not a thing that we are seeing in practice, there are so many systemic and chronic barriers to care that, that we need to be addressing. Um, we've heard insurance come up several times today. That is a big one. And I just, you know, I want to kind of instill some urgency there. Um, we've submitted in other hearings this year data showing that um, we have sort of more than 600 professionals across the state of Connecticut. We surveyed them to, to find out what was happening with insurance. And what we heard back was that. 60 to 83% of providers that are currently in network for insurance panels or have left the panel this year are planning to leave because of some of the really, um, you know, chronic unsustainable problems that we're having, getting paid, getting paid on time, getting paid equitably and fairly for us and not just for us, but for the, um, the mental health groups that we're working with, which includes psychiatry and social work and a few others, um, that has to be fixed because what we are seeing coming is that the existing access to care issues that we have are set to be much worse a year from now if we can't start to make some real change and real progress. So I know you've heard us say it before, but that is really the biggest thing that we think needs to change in addition to things like SIPACT that will increase the number of providers who can serve our state, increase our ability to provide continuous care, um, for, for many other reasons. I could give you a thousand ideas, but I know we're short on time today, so I'll stop there. No, I respect that. And I think you and Dr. Russo articulated the challenges in regards to mental health parity. And I, I think it is a focus area, at least for me to, to address. Uh, can you, I mean, we talk about mental health so much, but explain to me the difference between a, a, a psychologist versus a psychiatrist 
and other uh, scope of practice of other mental health practitioners. We're, we're trying to increase access and availability, but but there is a significant difference in regards to, to scope of practice and, and what individuals uh, particular to patient care and patient relationships uh, can provide. And, and I'm not sure uh, a lot of our uh, colleagues and, and listeners really fully understand the difference. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for the opportunity just to speak to that. And, and I will say, you know, there are a range of mental health professions and they are all phenomenal in their own way. Um, you know, there is, there's great value in all of the disciplines that we, that we have and that we partner with. Um, psychiatrists or medical doctors, they go to medical school um, and can provide therapy, but are really focused on providing medication. So psychopharmacological treatment um, for a range of mental health conditions. Psychologists are doctoral level behavioral health care providers. Um, so not only clinicians, but scientists, consumers, um, and doers of research ourselves and are really sort of the, the expert level in terms of evidence-based treatment and, you know, having and conducting the, the most current research on what's working for whom. So there is a difference between therapy, right, just support and, and therapy and having someone to talk to and the treatment of, you know, serious and, and chronic mental health conditions. So as, as psychologists, we can do it all, but are really sort of at that expert level in terms of providing treatment where it's needed. And, and one last question, uh, thank you, Madam Vice Chair, is what other mental health uh, areas of expertise and, and, and careers should we be focused on as a supplement to psychiatry and psychologists on a doctoral level, but, but what other clinical pathways should we be considering to support and increase uh, talent and access into? Yeah, I, I think I think all of them, right? We have a, a serious behavioral workforce shortage in our state. We're one of the worst in the country, actually. I, I think the economics are part of that. So I need we need we need as strong and as vibrant a mental health workforce as, as possible. Um, there are many things. Again, like there are many things, and I'm happy to follow up that we can do to make um, clinical practice and mental health practice more viable and more attractive in Connecticut, right? Loan forgiveness programs, looking at the economics, making sure people are paid fairly at parity, right? Equitably, whether they're doing telehealth, virtual care, mental health care, right? Needs to be treated with the same dignity and respect as, as be, um, physical healthcare. So there, there are so many ways. And I really, if I can offer myself and our organization as colleagues, as partners in fixing the mental health crisis that we are facing in our state, in our country, we are so, so happy to do that and, you know, talk about solutions and share science and collaborate in any way that we can. Uh, thank you very much for all that you do and, and extend again, as I said to Dr. Russo and to you, to all of your colleagues in the mental health profession. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Thank you, Thank Dr. You. Doran. Have a great day. Thank you to all of you. Thank you, Justin. Senator. Yeah. Yep. Thank you, doctor. Have a good day. Uh, next, we'll hear from number 43, Dr. Stacy Taylor. Good afternoon. I hope you can hear me and see me. We can go right ahead. Good. Um, Senator Abrams, Representative Steinberg, and distinguished members of the Public Health Committee. On behalf of the Family Physicians of the Connecticut Academy of Family Physicians, CTAFP, and all the physicians of the Connecticut State Medical Society, CSMS, thank you for this opportunity to provide testimony in support of raised Bill 213, an act allowing medical assistance to administer vaccines. CTAFP and CSMS strongly support the ability of physicians to delegate vaccine administration and only vaccine administration to qualified medical assistants, MAs, who are appropriately and fully trained and have been credentialed by a nationally accredited organization. The administration of vaccines would take place under the direct supervision of a physician. The physician would first evaluate the patient, determine the vaccine to be given with the safe and appropriate dosing, and order the vaccine. The physician would then be on site should the MA need guidance or in the event of an adverse reaction. MAs in every state but two, Connecticut and New York, 
are allowed to administer vaccines. This helps facilitate critical health services in physician offices and allows physicians to delegate vaccine administration, freeing their time to see a greater number of patients without diminishing the quality of care. The current pandemic emphasizes the need for physicians to be allowed to delegate vaccine administration to as many trained competent staff as possible. As we move forward, it is likely that boosters for COVID-19 will continue to be needed to maintain the health of our Connecticut patients. Allowing properly trained MAs to administer vaccines will help facilitate this critical healthcare service. In 2013, the Scope of Practice Review Committee of the Connecticut Department of Public Health issued a report to the General Assembly regarding a request by the medical assistant to administer vaccines. The committee pointed out that implementation of this scope of practice request would enhance the ability of medical assistants to practice to the full extent of their profession's education and training. The committee concluded that the concerns that were identified regarding the potential quality and safety risks associated with allowing licensed physicians to delegate injections to medical assistants can be addressed through legislation. Excuse me, Dr. Taylor, but your time is almost up. If you could summarize, thank you. Yes, we hope that you will vote yes on Ray's Bill 213. Thank you very much for your attention to this matter. Thank you, Dr. Taylor, for being here and for testifying. We do have a question. Uh, Representative Pettit, go right ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Dr. Taylor, thank you for testifying, perhaps for the sixth year in a row. Um, Sorry. Do, do you, uh, does your organi the organizations have an opinion on whether the MA should, who the MA should be directed by in the, in the office? Yes. Um, all the administration, the administration would be directed and in fact ordered by the physician. So the only thing that the medical assistant will do will be to administer the vaccine as ordered by the physician who would be in the office. And given what you've heard in past years and this year, do you feel that the training that's currently available to MAs is, is is adequate for, to allow them to do this under under your uh, orders directly in the office? The training is available to medical assistants for those who have not received such training. And many of the newer medical assistants have received the training uh, as part of their normal training. Thank Correct. you. Thank you, Madam. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Pettit. Thank you, Dr. Taylor. I don't see any other questions. Thank you for your time today. Thank you so much. We're going to go back to number 41, Megan Butler. Go right ahead. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Dr. Megan Butler, and I'm testifying in support of House Bill 5046. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist and a representative with the Connecticut Psychological Association. You've heard from my colleagues today regarding the specific ways that SciPact can help protect consumers and increase access to mental health care. I'm here today to describe some case examples to illustrate the importance of the bill. The first example is of a young adult who resided in Connecticut and attended college out of state. The patient attended an intensive treatment program in Connecticut for an existing mood disorder and attention deficit disorder which was exacerbated by a marijuana-induced psychotic episode. The patient completed the intensive program and transitioned to an outpatient treatment in the community with a therapist and a medication prescriber. The patient achieved enough stability to return to college out of state. The patient was still required, still required routine therapy and medication management to maintain the treatment gains and abstain from further use of substances. But due to the restrictions of practice across state lines, the patient required a second set of providers at the school location and to retain home state providers due to distance learning during COVID, as well as holiday and summer breaks. 
this process was challenging enough due to provider shortages and was complicated by the patient's difficulty with task organization and follow through due to the diagnosis of ADHD. While the parents supported the effort to secure new providers, they were unable to lead service coordination due to the patient being over 18. Sadly, due to the lack of continuity of care and the frustration and discouragement felt by the patient, the patient discontinued services prematurely. The second example is of a young adult who had an established therapeutic relationship in Connecticut and was living out of state when COVID, the COVID-19 pandemic disrupted the patient's life. This patient began treatment in early adolescence and presented with a straightforward generalized anxiety disorder. As a, as a strong therapeutic alliance formed between the patient and the provider, the patient was able to disclose sensitive personal details, including a series of traumatic experiences in childhood, depressive episodes, intense body shame and disordered eating. The patient's strong trust in the provider opened new opportunities for trauma and eating disorder treatment. The patient went on to have several treatment episodes over five years as life circumstances changed through adolescence. The patient successfully and independently launched to college in early adulthood. In 2020, the patient was living out of state and re-experienced symptoms secondary to financial and employment problems that directly resulted from the COVID pandemic. Emergency executive orders authorized the existing provider to render therapeutic services across state lines temporarily. This allowed the patient to swiftly resume services with a provider highly knowledgeable of the patient's sensitive history, their pre-existing conditions, and their response to treatment. The patient seamlessly resumed therapeutic work to restore functioning and identify achievable steps towards their goals. Prior Excuse to the completion, me, Ms. Butler, but your time is almost up. If you would summarize, thank you. Thank you. Prior to, a complete, to the completion of therapeutic work, the temporary executive order expired in the patient's state. The treatment was safely paused and numerous efforts were made to identify and locate a pro new provider who accepted insurance and was open for referrals and the patient transferred care to a new, new therapist in the, in the other state. So as you can see, um, the, the disruption to services does not make sense. It's not in the best interest of the, co the consumers we serve, and it's inconsistent with these national trends. There's just great importance on that seamless continuity of care and removing those unnecessary barriers to obtaining mental health treatment. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Butler. Thank you for the examples. It's really helpful. Yes, I don't see any welcome. questions. Have a great afternoon. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Next, we'll hear from um, number 45, which is a video. Yeah. First thing you do when you get to the doctors, they want, want to weigh you, which is very precarious for somebody in my position. I'm paralyzed on my left side. In my left, I get on the same kind of scale that everybody else does with that little, little foot plate on the bottom. Not easy to get on, so I managed to step on it very precariously, holding on to my cane. And once I'm on it, I have to hold on to the wall, which you're not supposed to do to get an accurate weight. So because of that, usually the doctor will ask me how much I weigh rather than rely on the scale because it's not accurate because I'm wiggling and jiggling trying to maintain my balance. Then after that, when I managed to get off the scale, and I get in my wheelchair, getting on the exam table, but the exam is very difficult. One time I managed to boost myself up onto the exam table because they're all weight there. Most of the time too high. Many of them are not adjustable about crazy things. They usually weigh too high and I've had, one time I had to, with, with the help of the assistant, boost myself up on it, onto the very edge and then she brought over a a, a, an old, very old step school that I had to put my feet on to boost myself up a little higher and further back to be examined. And because of that now, what I usually do is I just stay in my wheelchair for my exam. So I sit up straight and the doctor listens to my heart. Then I've been way far forward so he can listen to my, my lungs in the back, which is kind of hard to take a deep breath in. 
when you're bent over position. The other thing I, I found is the um, doctors are usually asking me for what my weight is rather than put us both through the, the, the scale thing. So I have not had like a full full medical exam in years. Like I haven't had a pap test in forever, but there's not really any need for it anymore at this age. So it's just a simple thing like going to your doctor's for your annual checkup is not so simple anymore. If, if I could say, if there were exam tables that raised up and down like beds do, it would make, make, make life simpler and more equal for those of us who are disabled. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Ms. Maria Pyman, for submitting that video and that testimony today. Next, we will hear from 46, Mary Blankson. Hi, yes, thank you, uh, Senator Abrams, Representative Steinberg, and members of the Public Health Committee. Thank you for this opportunity to testify in support of SB 213, an act allowing medical assistance to administer vaccines. My name is Mary Blankson. I'm an advanced practice registered nurse and the chief nursing officer for the Community Health Center, Inc., Connecticut's largest federally qualified health center. I've supported CHC's MAs and nurses for almost eight years and have testified uh, on many occasions for bills so to, in support of advancing medical assistance scope of practice. As you're all, all well aware, we have experienced unprecedented challenges over the course of the past few years, supporting both state and national efforts to combat the COVID-19 pandemic. This has involved implementing mass testing, followed by the nation's second mass vaccination effort at Connecticut's Pratt & Whitney Airstrip, with four fully functioning mass vaccination sites, mobile and homebound vaccination, and clinic administrations totaling over 600,000 doses given to date in our organization. In order to accomplish this endeavor, CHC took full advantage of the governor's various emergency orders, including those that advanced the scope for certain clinical staff members, including dental hygienists trained in anesthesia, to EMTs and even veterinarians uh, to staff these clinics when we were unable to identify adequate staffing. However, medical assistants who are graduates of accredited post-secondary medical assistant programs were excluded even though they are trained specifically in medication administration, including immunizations as a part of their routine accredited curriculum. Many practices around the country, both FQHCs and non-FQHCs are able to leverage MAs to support vaccination efforts. In fact, this is by far the norm because in 48 states, medical assistants are either explicitly allowed in statute to administer immunizations or there is no prohibiting statutory language. In order to successfully deliver on improving patient outcomes while reducing cost, MAs should be empowered to take on more responsibility so that licensed staff can expand complex care management for patients with uncontrolled chronic illness, including those with behavioral health and substance use issues. These issues are even more critical now as we have to catch up from what was lost during the COVID-19 pandemic. And let me add in this current moment in our history when we must be taking a look at everything through an equity lens, this calls for the Public Health Committee to highlight the cultural and racial diversity within the medical assistant workforce and ask the critical question, why would we continue to limit their practice while supporting the advancement of scope and practice for other less diverse workforces? There's ample evidence that supports social concordance between patient and clinician to improve the adherence to clinical recommendations. Medical assistants are in fact more socially concordant as a workforce with the patients served in our organization than other staff types. And so could assist in improving vaccine acceptance rates if allowed to participate in this service in the same way as other care team members. I wanna thank the Public Health Committee for considering this very important issue. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Blankson. I don't see any questions. Thank you for your time today. We're gonna to go back to number 44, Maritza Bond. Good afternoon. Um, thank you for the opportunity to be here and be able to speak in support of House Bill number 5045, Enact Reducing Lead Poisoning. This proposed bill was safeguard against the negative impacts of lead, particularly for our young and developing children throughout the state of Connecticut. Both rural and urban areas in our state are affected by lead, and it is critical that this bill is passed to supply funding for action towards eliminating lead exposure from our infrastructure and daily environment. Lead poisoning, as you know, leads to significant health and development issues in children and is a 
critical for us to have standardized measures across Connecticut that are consistent. This bill will allow that opportunity. Lead poisoned children can experience headache, vomiting, and weight loss, among other significant symptoms can, can, that can impact them long term. Additionally, these children can experience de developmental delays, stunted physical growth, and behavioral problems. And these effects are oftentimes um, can lead to irre um, irreversible factors. In New Haven, our environmental health team has worked uh, diligently to restructure our lead section to ensure that lead prevention efforts are in place. And these efforts have included lead screening, targeted community outreach, and providing education and information on how to prevent lead poisoning. Home inspections for children with elevated blood levels for greater than five have been in place and lead abatement um, have been supported through federal funds. The health department has also worked to modernize and ensure that we include digitization of all lead case records as a mechanism to track all of our cases in our city. Um, this particular bill, if passed, will allow us the ability to expand and continue our efforts that we are doing in New Haven and beyond. Every child in Connecticut deserves to be able to ensure that we follow um, the same measures across the state. As the former director of health and social services in the city of Bridgeport and the current director of health for the city of New Haven, I have firsthand knowledge of the issues and concerns in addressing childhood lead hazards in our homes, schools, and daycares. Currently, our approximately 70% of our homes in New Haven were built prior to 1978, indicating that lead may be present. And so this, is, this particular bill will allow us to ensure that we're working on, um, in addressing distressed neighborhoods, addressing lead um, exposure and hazards in, our, in maintenance of those and natural deterioration that we experience. The average cost of lead re remediation or abatement is about $15,000, which is a high, highly um, cost factor for homeowners. And we wanna be able to ensure we provide the, the support that is needed to property owners. And this particular bill will help subsidize these initiatives to make our environment safer for our children and ensure that we have lead safe homes not only in our cities, but across the state consistently. The bill uh, will not only be able to be more stringent and action triggers, but also supports this mandate with funding. So I strongly support House Bill 5045, an act to reducing lead poisoning as it will ensure that we have this standardized process to protect our children in Connecticut. Thank you so much for the opportunity um, to be here this, um, this afternoon to be able to speak before your committee. Thank you so much, Ms. Bond. Good to see you and thank you for your testimony. All right, next we'll hear from number 47, Constance Vickers. Oh, you are muted. If you could just unmute. You would think after two years, I would know how to do this. <laughs> Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, Representative Gilchrist, Representative Steinberg, Senator Darty Abrams, Representative Pettit, Senator Wong, Senator Summers, and all of the distinguished members of the Public Health Committee. My name is Constance Vickers, and I'm the Director of Legislative Affairs for the City of Bridgeport. Um, and I'm testifying today in support of two bills, HB 5044 and HB 5045. So I'll start first with 5044. And I'd like to begin with thanking um, the leadership of Attorney General Tong and his team throughout the entire settlement process. I had the privilege to represent the city of Bridgeport on CCM's Opioid Settlement Committee. And through our work, we were instrumental in ensuring that all 169 municipalities registered for this settlement. And it was the work of um, these municipal leaders that enabled Connecticut um, to be able to be allocated the maximum um, settlement, um, the entitlement for the settlement, pardon me. Um, so I just wanna stress that it was the municipalities who ended up doing the groundwork to ensure that we could maximize um, what our state's response to um, this crisis would be. And um, so as such, um, I emphasize the work done by this committee led by local officials to show that our presence is crucial to be included on this advisory committee, and not just as members, but in leadership roles as well. As Mayor Bronin stated earlier, the cost and consequences are felt at the local level, and therefore we should empower our municipalities to best address the needs of their respective communities, whether through an individual or regionalized approaches depending on capacity. It is also crucial for this committee to have more than one pardon me, than to have more than just advisory authority. 
This committee needs to have the ability to work through OPM to allocate these restricted funds where appropriate and to meet the needs of individual initiatives, whether they be prevention, treatment, recovery, to ensure that all Connecticut residents um, who are impacted by opioids, and we know that this covers all four corners of our state, all 169 towns, but to ensure that they have the same access to services, whether they live in Bristol, Brooklyn, or Bridgeport. Um, and so I thank you for, um, for bringing this bill up and we just hope that municipal um, leaders will have more of a role on that committee. And then very briefly on 5045, um, even in 2022, lead poisoning still represents a serious threat to the well-being of our youth. And I strongly encourage this committee and the Connecticut General Assembly to ensure that resources are available to actually implement this bill. This is an initiative that deserves strong financial support to prevent any further um, unfunded mandates as well. Um, and so I thank you for um, the time. I have submitted written testimony as well. Um, and if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you so much, Ms. Vickers. I don't see any questions. Thank you for your testimony. Next, we'll hear from number 48, John Lally. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. And good, good afternoon to Representative Gilchrist and Steinberg and other members of the Public Health Committee. Thank you for the privilege of, of testifying at today's public hearing on the governor's bill number 5044, an act implementing the governor's budget recommendations regarding the use of opioid litigation proceeds. My name is John Lally and I'm a psychiatric nurse practitioner with 34 years experience in mental health care and addictions. I'm also executive director of Today I Matter, a nonprofit whose mission is reduce the shame and stigma of mental illness and addiction through education, advocacy, and support for those struggling and their families. I also have a personal stake in this issue as I have two sons who struggled with opioid addiction. My oldest son, Tim, died from an opioid overdose in January of 2016. And my youngest son now is over three years in recovery and is studying social work. I've seen the devastating effects that opioid use disorder can have on a family. Both my sons were introduced to the world of opioid misuse by starting with prescription opioid pill diversion that evolved into an addiction. I have personally experienced the difficulty in getting appropriate evidence-based substance use disorder treatment in a timely manner. In searching for treatment for my sons, we ran into difficulties finding openings in treatment programs, and then finding treatment options that were suboptimal, such as programs that do not believe in medication-assisted treatment, despite its proven record as a state-of-the-art treatment for opioid use disorder. We're now fortunate to have these funds made available as a result of litigation against pharmaceutical manufacturers and distributors. We need to be sure these funds are used to prevent and combat this disease, helping those presently struggling and those vulnerable to developing a problem with substances. We owe it to the memories of those lost in Connecticut to opioid overdose and their families as well as the over 1,200 individuals in Connecticut expected to die from overdose this coming year. We have to find more effective methods and programs to promote mental health and to treat mental illness. We need to encourage use of and research supporting harm reduction efforts. We need to start ongoing education, starting in middle schools about substance use disorder and coping skills. We need to fund and train for the use of naloxone in the general public, schools, and all public facilities, and provide naloxone to all who desire it. We need more research and policy promoting state-of-the-art, evidence-based treatment on demand for those with substance use disorder. It's too late for these funds to help my son, Tim. He's gone forever. My heart will never be whole again. But these issues will require more funds than we have provided so far. For this reason, it's imperative that the opioid settlement funds be closely monitored and carefully dispensed as the governor's bill is determined. I ask you please to quickly pass bill number 5044. While we debate and discuss the issues, more people are struggling and families are burying their loved ones at record numbers never before seen in the state and this country. Thank you. I'm available for questions if anyone has them. Thank you, Mr. Lally, uh, for being here. I'm really sorry for your loss, and I'll be thinking about your son who's in recovery. Um, we do have two hands raised. Uh, Representative Foster, go right ahead. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, hi, John. It's good to see you. Thank you yes, so much for you testifying. Um, I am glad to hear your support of this bill. I don't know if you were able to tune in a little bit earlier today when the Commissioner of DMS was on. Um, yes. Because of you and many other advocates in our community, I have been advocating for some evidence-based opioid prevention um, legislation. And some of the things that seem the most promising in the literature around that is supporting uh, folks who are community health workers funded through Medicaid. Um, and we heard earlier today that she is interested in looking in more evidence-based programming, and that is something that they would spend time and effort um, with this committee steering towards. Are there other things that you think are, you know, there's this part of me that feels like we've been work, doing this work for a long time and trying to make movement and progress. This infusion of money is an opportunity to sort of jumpstart these efforts. Is there something that you think we could start tomorrow that would make a difference or as soon as, you know, as soon as we can issue money. So the thing that would be the most meaningful, the most powerful. I, I know naloxone, we've talked a little bit about that, but anything else? We're, I agree with certainly naloxone right off the bat to save lives. We can't help people if they're not alive. So that's number one. But I think uh, really what's important is on the prevention side of it as well. I think, you know, we need to have more education for kids starting at the middle school age at least about the realities of dangerous substances and really about coping skills. Um, there's not enough going on in schools and they talk about funding. You know, they might, there might be a health, a health class they have once a year that talk about drugs and mental health, but that's not enough. We need to have ongoing um, education for kids um, as, as these issues develop, as there's, they're running to different situations growing up and the stresses of growing up. Um, this needs to be an ongoing curriculum in schools. So I think some way we can help schools find the funding and the expertise to do that is really important. And then certainly treatment on demand, as has been said before today, you know, when people are struggling with addiction and they're at that moment where they're ready to accept help, if it's not available, we lose that window of opportunity. So we do more opportunities for people to get help right away. So much your advocacy, and as we see um, this bill progress forward, I hope that you'll stay in touch. It's always good to hear from you, and you're such a wonderful advocate. Um, it's it's a, it's great to hear from you today. So thank you so much. Well, thank you. I mean, we hope we could we could also be involved in this advisory board as well, so we continue to work to make sure these funds are used in the right way. You can count on my support in that regard. Thank you so much, John. It was so good to see you. Same here, Jane. Thank you, Representative Foster. We also have Senator Anwar. Go right ahead. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Uh, John, good to see you. And, and thank you for always being there to educate us uh, and, and at times having to relive your experience to make sure that you're protecting others. And uh, I, I cannot thank you enough for, for the past many years helping me um, be uh, an advocate in my capacity um, and, and, and through your education as, as well. Uh, you know, one of the things that you have taught me very well is that the, the, the resources that we're going to put into prevention will give us the highest yield. Um, and, and I think uh, if the funds that we are talking about, if they were used in, in education and in children's uh, education and prevention, like you're stating, do you know any source which would have appropriate level of curriculum that we should start to look at that's been developed or somebody's developing for middle school kids? You know, I, I, I have access to that, Senator Anwar. I don't have it off the top of my head, but I'd be willing to share that with your office, certainly. Perfect. There are okay. some evidence-based treatment programs that come out, I think, from the University of Indiana that's made for school curriculums. So I could be happy to share with you. Excellent. I, I think your idea about uh, going after in the schools early enough, because I know for tobacco, we have tried that and, and arguably have been successful before the vaping uh, efforts that were pushed onto us by industry. Um, and then similarly for uh, car and motor vehicle accidents, some of the training has really helped uh, our children uh, be better drivers and, and, and more uh, cognizant of the risks. In the mm -hmm. same way, this is an area that we probably have to have a robust uh, curriculum to protect this from happening because uh, it has to have a multi-pronged approach, but the preventive uh, prong is gonna be very critical. Certainly, certainly. It's important to look at the supply, but we have to reduce the demand. 
because unfortunately, if there's a big enough demand, there's always a supply. So we have to pay attention to that. Thank you so much. Thank you again for your testimony and all that you do. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Mr. Lolly. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for having me today. Next, we have a video, Jamie Moger. Fifty-two, seventy-seven. I really believe that this is a really vital bill for all people with disabilities because it would force medical facility to give us better medical care. So I really urge this committee to work on getting this bill passed. I know it's a shell bill, so it could still be worked on, but we need more stricter policies for medical facility so we get better medical care for all disabled people in the state of Connecticut. And Connecticut would be one of the first states to pass this kind of a bill. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Moger. Thank you for submitting your testimony. Next, we will hear from number 50, Wyatt Bosworth. Thank you, Representative. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go right ahead. Great. Good afternoon, everybody. Chairs Darty Abrams, Steinberg, Rec Ranking Members Wong and Summers, and distinguished members of the Public Health Committee. My name is Wyatt Bosworth. I'm Assistant Counsel for the Connecticut Business and Industry Association. Thank you so much for the opportunity to testify in support of House Bill 5046. Over the last two years, CBIA has pushed for policies that will better foster the state's economic recovery and growth. With the current workforce shortage, especially among healthcare providers, it has never been more important to streamline the professional licensing process and better recognize out-of-state licenses for those wishing to practice in the state. According to a recent report published by the Health Resources and Services Administration, an estimated 122 million Americans lived in uh, just under 6,000 mental health professional shortage areas as of 2021. Eye-opening in that report is the fact that Connecticut trails neighboring states in providing adequate access to behavioral problem and mental health care. Roughly 32% of Connecticut residents live in a mental health professional shortage area, compared to a half a percent in New Jersey, 9% in Delaware, 4% in Mass, and 21% in New York. According to the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services testimony in front of the Appropriations Committee, the agency served approximately 90,000 persons living with a mental health or substance use condition in fiscal year 22 alone. The State Department of Education is also predicting an increased need for mental and behavioral health providers. House Bill 5046 makes important licensing reforms that will better equip Connecticut to fill these shortages and provide relief to thousands of struggling residents. The Interstate Medical Licensing Compact currently includes 34 states and allows physicians to qualify to practice medicine across state lines if they meet the compact's eligibility requirements. Under the compact, individual states still issue their licenses, but the application process is routed through the compact. So once a physician submits their state of principal license with the compact and fulfills uh, application and practice requirements, the SPL shares this information with additional states where the physician wants to practice medicine. Um, this is a process that significantly speeds up the licensure process. Additionally, if Connecticut joins SIPACT, uh, psychologists licensed in, uh, in this state will be able to obtain authorization to practice interjurisdictional telepsychology and receive temporary authorization to practice interjurisdictional in-person psychology services. The 
The SIPAC currently has 28 member states, including nearby states of New Hampshire, Maine, and New Jersey, and also uh, two other states, Massachusetts and Rhode Island, have legislation pending, just like Connecticut. So really, this is a long needed um, reform uh, joining this compact, especially with so much of the good focus this year um, on improving our state's behavioral and mental health shortages. So thanks again for uh, hearing and raising this important bill. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions if there are any. Thank you, Mr. Bosworth. Uh, we do. Senator Huang, go right ahead. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Uh, welcome, uh, Wyatt, and uh, thank you. I didn't want to ask the clinicians, uh, the medical physicians and the psychologists that question, but obviously 20 other, 26 other states have done this. And, and from a business standpoint, what do you think is holding this policy up? Um, interesting question. I, I, I don't know, to be honest, Senator. All, all I can tell you is that um, our members, um, you know, especially members, uh, healthcare providers in the state um, are having an incredibly hard time um, hiring and retaining um, workers. And, you know, anything we can do to streamline and make it easier for people to work in Connecticut, um, I think it's a no brainer that we should join this compact um, and, and join the majority of other states who have joined thus far. But as far as like, you know, why this has not happened yet. I don't know. I know there was a task force established last year to study this. And I assume this, uh, this bill came out as a result of the findings in that task force. So um, we're just hoping that this bill crosses the finish line this year. Thank you. And I appreciate the uh, CBIA and, and uh, all of our businesses that have struggled through this pandemic. Um, and I, I know it's mentioned earlier that uh, many of us are in different committees uh, moving uh, through and fro. And uh, I, I, I will just share with you that uh, you're coming up soon in the Transportation Committee. So thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Thank you, Senator Huang. It's a nice little public service announcement. Um, <laughs> thank you for being here today, Mr. Bosworth. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Um, next up is 51 here, Aisling McGuckin. Thank you, distinguished co-chairs and members of the Joint Committee on Public Health. I'm here to provide testimony regarding funding for House Bill 5045, an act reducing lead poisoning. My name is Aisling McGuckin, and I am a public health nurse and the director of health in Waterbury. The city of Waterbury is a beauty. Around every corner is stunning architecture dating back to the city's salad days of industry as the Brass City and the home of several mills along the lush Nakatuck River. Since the closure of the factories that once supported middle income workers in corporate housing, the city's housing stock and infrastructure have aged, posing a serious threat to residents in the form of chipping lead paint and insidious dust. In our city, as in most cities, the most vulnerable to this menace are young families of color. House Bill 5045 helps Connecticut catch up with standards to which we should have conformed years ago. It places us in line with CDC and AAP recommendations and proposes adequate funding to properly address the cost intensive work of lead education, prevention, abatement, and case management. Currently in Waterbury, we have two staff managing the lead, manage lead case management work. In fiscal year 21, a year where we saw fewer referrals than normal due to the interruption in primary care, we had over 1,000 cases that under the proposed blood lead le level limits would have provoked an investigation and follow up. With current staffing levels, we would not be able to manage this fee, necessary as it may have been. I encourage the legislature to look closely at the associated costs to make sure that we promote a plan to respond to the need responsibly and sustainably. I'm heartened by the proposal for the use of ARPA funds for this purpose and to augment our thriving Healthy Homes program to include addressing mold and asbestos abatement. I laud the governor's proposal to include remediation costs for landlords as cost most certainly mediates the speed with which these issues are addressed by property owners and ours as a city of renters. I would also submit that the funds extend to elimination of lead-based paint use and the remediation of aging infrastructure in our city, such as bridges, overpasses, and fencing as the state of Delaware did in 2018. I would propose that lead-based paint not all, also not be applied to new outdoor structures built by the state 
In our city, as in many others, the existence of these cracked and peeling structures generates lead dust. Those who live under or near these structures are disproportionately exposed, as are those who work outdoors in construction and outdoor maintenance, and the families they come home to laden with lead dust. Thank you for your consideration of this bill. Please lend your support to this important initiative. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Ms. McGuckin. Um, I loved the description uh, that you gave of your community. Um, we do have a question from Representative Steinberg. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Uh, thank you for your testimony today. And I just wanted to address your uh, suggestion to broaden the scope of what we're trying to accomplish with this legislation. I, I agree with you. We had a, a healthy homes bill before this committee last year. And you may be aware that uh, one of the other committees did pass some legislation intended to address just the problems that you raised with regard to mold and other contaminants in the home. Uh, as much as I would love to broaden it, because I was the proponent of the Healthy Homes Bill, um, I can understand why it's as focused as it is, because frankly, even with all the money we're putting against it, thanks to the ARPA dollars, it may be insufficient to meet the need even for lead, if you think about all the homes with lead paint and the lead pipes we have. So I'm tempted by your suggestion, but I'd like to see us do a, a truly adequate job against this decades long problem and hope that other legislation that we've passed will address some of the other issues in the home. Though I share your concerns on that as well. You should also point out that we have a bill this year to work with uh, the governor's bill to work on um, uh, air quality in the schools where we know mold is often a problem. It happened in my school system. So uh, we're maybe belatedly, but finally starting to put serious funding against some of the uh, general facilities, um, air quality and environmental quality issues that you raise. And we appreciate your testimony and your continued vigilance in helping us stay focused on taking care of every Connecticut citizen by making their homes and workplaces safe. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. McGuckin. Thank you for being here today. Next, we'll hear from Sandra Carpenter. Hello, my name is Sandy Carpenter. I'm a fourth year medical student, less than two months away from earning my medical doctorate and transitioning to residency. I'm testifying in support of raised bill 5277. People with disabilities are recognized as very important consumers of healthcare, yet they experience significant barriers to equitable care. One of the most significant barriers that 5277 would address is the lack of accessible medical diagnostic equipment. This equipment includes exam tables, chairs, weight scales, patient lifts, and imaging devices. The lack of accessible medical diagnostic equipment adversely affects the quality of care that people with disabilities receive contributing to delayed and incomplete care, misdiagnoses, exacerbation of the original disability, and increases in the likelihood of secondary conditions. The lack of accessible medical diagnostic equipment has affected my patients and loved ones with disabilities. To provide examples, I have witnessed patients who use wheelchairs receive a physical exam in their wheelchair due to a lack of accessible exam table or patient lift. This exam is less thorough than examining the patient on the table and risks missing pressure scores, abdominal masses, skin lesions, or other abnormalities on the unexamined areas. Inability to completely examine a patient's body is especially concerning for patients who use wheelchairs due to paralysis, who are at very high risk for pressure injury. I have also observed unsafe manual transfer of physically disabled patients by medical staff or caregivers with the potential for injury of both parties. Patients with disabilities are often required by their healthcare providers to bring an aid to assist their transfer, which is firstly not permitted under the Americans with Disabilities Act, and secondly forces the aid into a difficult and potentially injurious position. Patients who use wheelchairs are infrequently weighed due to lack of wheelchair accessible skills, even though physicians commonly use changes in weight to guide clinical decision making and make recommendations. I've heard from women with mobility disabilities in our community that they struggle to receive recommended cancer screenings including mammograms and pap smears due to inaccessible equipment. And this deeply concerns me, knowing that there is a growing body of research demonstrating higher rates of cancer and higher mortality from cancer among people with disabilities. 
Many disabled community members hesitate to self-advocate for better care with their physicians out of fear of damaging rapport. They also report limited options for alternative health care due to transportation and insurance barriers, which is further complicated by the lack of data on accessibility of healthcare facilities. Physicians such as myself in a few months do not receive any education or training about the importance and safe use of accessible medical diagnostic equipment for examination of people with significant mobility limitations. Thus, as you can see, a lack of accessible diagnostic medical equipment and a lack of knowledge about how to utilize it go hand in hand. Excuse me, Ms. Carpenter, but your time is almost up. If you could please summarize, thank you. Sure. As a physician in training and assumed to be resident physician, I took the Hippocratic Oath to provide non-discriminatory care to all of my patients, including patients with disabilities, but I cannot do this if I do not have the tools I need to ensure equitable care. This bill addresses that issue and would necessitate widespread systematic change that we need in our state. Thank you, I will take questions. Thank you, Ms. Carpenter. Um, congratulations on almost graduating. Thank you for, all, for being an advocate for your future patients. Um, uh, we do have a question. Representative D'Amico, go right ahead. Thank you, uh, Madam Vice Chair. And I would like to echo your congratulations uh, to Sandy on your uh, upcoming graduation and, and, and moving on. Um, and, and I would also like to thank you for coming to testify today, uh, Sandy, and uh, also wanted to uh, point out, I think it was already mentioned briefly earlier, that uh, you have a very um, um, uh, well thought out and, and trenchant um, um, article in today's Hartford Current uh, on this issue. So well-timed and well done. Um, so um, what, I just wanted to ask you a couple of questions. You, you, you talked about, um, uh, about the, the barriers uh, you know, th that, that uh, people with disabilities face as a result of the current situation. I was wondering if you, if you could talk a little bit more about your, your fellow students and, 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 and the, the doctors uh, with, with whom you have trained or who have trained you and, and what, what, is, what is their uh, take on all of this and, and what is their perspective? And, and maybe you could just talk about that experience if you could. Sure, um, so I'm, I'm not alone in you know, these experiences. Many of my classmates um, have also witnessed patients with disabilities receiving substandard care and are equally concerned um, many of those classmates also submitted written testimony on the Connecticut General Assembly website, um, testifying to the fact that they have witnessed this. Um, I, I would also add that UConn has a very strong um, disability advocacy group led by students um, and advised by public health faculty and physicians alike. Um, many of the physicians that I have worked, that, worked with, um, whom I have mentioned the need for um, improvements in access, um, cite the fact that you know, these changes are difficult to independently fund and, in fund and ensure, um, and we should not be putting the onus on individual physicians or individual patients to fund access improvements or to self-advocate for standard of care. This necessitates a systematic change through regulation and legislation, and I think that the physicians um, and other students I work with would agree with that. Well, th thank you. I, I appreciate that. And, and uh, Madam Chair, could I ask one more question? If, 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 yes, please. Go oh, right great. ahead. Th th thank you. So, so, um, th so, Sandy, uh, you, th th this is this is uh, not the first time that this issue has come before the Public Health Committee, and certainly not the first time that you've been involved. And, and I appreciate your 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 involvement uh, over the years. So, so a, a couple of the a couple of the uh, objections that have been raised in the past. Uh, have to do with what you were just talking about, the, the, the financial uh, hurdles that, 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 that uh, this would pose. And then also the idea that, um, that um, the, the guidelines that are being referred to um, um, in, in the bill um, that's before us uh, do not have the force of law. They are guidelines, but they, they, they are not law. I was wondering, would you like to comment on that and, and give us a little insight th there as well? Yes, yeah, so right now, um, the U.S. Access Board has issued standards of accessibility for medical diagnostic equipment. The U.S. Access Board was required to do so by the Affordable Care Act in 2010, and they released those standards after examining the empirical evidence. Those standards were released in 2017. Until those standards are adopted by an enforcing agency, 
Um, the standards are viewed as recommendations that can be um, enforced or not enforced. The only agency to act thus far is the Veterans Health Association, which in 2017 uh, made an acquisitions policy to only acquire equipment that met the U.S. Access Board standards. Um, so the state of Connecticut could take action to adopt those standards and enforce them and thus make healthcare much more equitable for people with disabilities in our state. I also want to add that um, that would go hand in hand with increasing the information and data on accessibility of healthcare facilities in Connecticut. There's currently a, a, a dearth of information on what facilities are accessible and which ones aren't. And so it's very difficult for people with disabilities to know where they can go to get that fully accessible care. Um, and so there, there is a need to acquire new accessible equipment, but also to remove equipment that's not fully accessible over time. Okay. Th thank you again. And uh, just one, one brief comment and one quick question again, Madam Chair, the brief comment would be, uh, uh, since you are so articulate, I hope that, that you're, Sandy, I hope that the testimony that you just gave us a few minutes ago, you will, you will uh, submit that so that it gets entered into the record. So uh, hopefully you'll submit that as written testimony. Um, it's on the, the website. Oh, great. Oh, good. Okay. I haven't seen it yet. And, and, and so just the, 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 the final thing is there's been some talk about reasonable accommodations um, in, in lieu of uh, you know, uh, equipment that's uh, accessible. Uh, ha, do, have you seen reasonable accommodations in your experience? Are these accommodations really reasonable? Would you like to talk about that for a second? Cause I, I'd be curious to know your personal experience. Sure. Um, reasonable accommodation, um, you know, is defined as a change. It's defined by the Americans with Disabilities Act as any sort of uh, change or modification that can ensure, uh, you know, an equal experience. Um, and so I would argue that some of the accommodations that are proposed um, in the absence of accessible medical diagnostic equipment are not reasonable. They are ad hoc. So those Accommodations would be, you know, for a patient with a significant mobility impairment who uses a wheelchair, examining the patient in their wheelchair. But that's not reasonable because there's a lot of critical exam maneuvers that cannot be done while the patient is seated in their wheelchair. Another um, example of an ad hoc uh, accommodation would be, again, a patient in a wheelchair who requires a procedure and needs to be moved to the exam table, but the healthcare facility does not have a patient lift does not have an accessible exam table or chair and does not have the staff required to lift that patient onto the exam table safely. So they ask the patient's caregiver or attendant or family member to do that. This happens a lot. Um, healthcare providers may also require that a patient who uses a wheelchair come with someone to do exactly that. That is unsafe um, for both the patient and the caregiver um, and is an ad hoc accommodation um, that is actually against the law. Um, you cannot require a person with a disability to bring another person to assist in their transfer. Um, otherwise, you will deny them the care that they require. So I think that these accommodations are really not reasonable. Um, and the way that we can overcome the ad hoc accommodations is by providing equitable care, which necessitates accessible diagnostic medical equipment. Great. All right. Th th thank you, Sandy. Thank you for enlightening me and enlightening my colleagues. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Madam Vice thank Chair. You. Thank you, Representative D'Amico. And yes, thank you, Ms. Carpenter. Your testimony was really helpful. Have a great day. Uh, next, we will hear from number 53, Christopher Arnold. Madam Vice Chair, honorable committee members, the Department of Defense is grateful for the opportunity to support policy changes proposed by the governor in House Bill 5046 which addresses licensing issues affecting our uniformed service members and their families. I am Christopher Arnold, the Northeast Region Liaison at the United States Department of Defense State Liaison Office, operating under the direction of the Undersecretary of Defense for Personnel and Readiness. It's wonderful to be back in front of public health. Licensure issues, as you know, for both service members and their spouses have been a top concern for the department for over a decade. And the Secretary of Defense recently made taking care of families the fourth line of effort in the United States national defense strategy. The first lady, Dr. Biden, has called military spouse licensure a national security imperative, key to both military readiness and retention. 
Pre-pandemic research showed unemployment rates for licensed military spouses ranged as high as 28%. The secretaries of the military departments have made the importance of military spouse licensure explicitly clear as they consider the availability of license reciprocity when evaluating future basing or mission alternatives. The fiscal year 2020 National Defense Authorization Act requires the military departments to consider the quality of healthcare near bases, whether reciprocity of professional licenses is available for military families, and produce annual scorecards when evaluating license portability for each installation. The Air Force's approved strategic basing criteria assesses factors such as membership and SIPAC. Future Air Force basing decisions made with a consistent framework will ensure optimal conditions for service members and their families. The best evidence we have about the quality benefits of licensure relate to occupations that tend to have more harmonized standards across states. Where we do not have any strong evidence is to suggest that the type of license recognition in SIPAC is associated with worse quality or worse care outcomes. This type of well-designed licensure regime can enhance public safety while expanding healthcare access in historically underserved communities. I'd like to take a moment to recognize Representative Q. Williams for his efforts in having introduced SIPAC for preliminary discussion in the prior two legislative sessions. SIPAC is significant for the military community in that along with active duty military spouses receiving the benefit of compacts, active duty members, members of the reserve component, reserve component spouses, transitioning service members and other veterans benefit from the mobility provided through compacts as Connecticut residents stationed around the country will have their license recognized when transitioning in and out of 29 other states. Congress provided the department with authority to enter into a cooperative agreement with the Council of State Governments to provide grants to professions to develop compact laws to be approved by states. In addition to supporting the drafting of model compact laws for professions, federal law requires DOD to support professions with developing database systems to make the compacts more efficient and operational. These database systems allow states to share information about practitioners using compact provisions to work in member states. Connecticut took a giant leap forward last year when it became the 50th state to pass a military spouse specific licensure law. Excuse me, Mr. Arnold, your time is almost up. And the Would department encourages summarize? states to engage in immediate actions to fully implement military spouse licensure laws, near-term actions to attain a baseline of getting a military spouse a license within 30 days, and long-term solutions for instant reciprocity through compacts. How fast these actions and solutions can be approved and implemented is up to the states. As always, as liaison to the Northeast, I stand ready to answer whatever questions you may have. Thank you so much, Mr. Arnold, for being here today and for your testimony. I don't see any questions. Have a great afternoon. Next, we're going to go to 55, uh, Dr. Mark Spellman. Um, good afternoon, Representative Gilchrist, Representative Foster, Representative Steinberg, Senator Anwar, Senator Huang, Representative D'Amico, and anybody else I haven't noticed speaking recently. Thanks for the opportunity to speak. You've already heard from several of my colleagues, uh, Dr. Doran, Dr. Butler, Dr. Kane, who've talked about the strength of SIPAC, which is what I want to speak up for uh, House Bill 5046. So since you've heard about policies, I thought I'd tell you about a case so you can see how this sort of thing comes up for us. I see a woman named Jennifer here in town. I'm in private practice in New Fairfield. I treat her for complex PTSD, recurrent depression, and uh, supporting her recovery. She has three teenage children. She has a master's in environmental science, but has been unable to work over the last several years because of her psychological problems and increasingly severe rheumatoid arthritis. Her ex-husband lives in a Southern state and their three children go back and forth depending on the stability of the environment she's able to provide uh, or dads. By the way, she's on state insurance, uh, Husky. So uh, the husband has a job in IT and generally provides a stable home, but he suffers from bipolar disorder and recently had a severe decompensation. No one was able to manage the home down there during his breakdown, so she rushed down to manage. So all of a sudden, I've got a patient who's across state lines who has a compelling reason, in fact, an essential reason for taking care of her children, and I need to continue to support her, her problem solving, her emotional support, um, and just helping to keep her going. I feel ethically obligated to continue her treatment. There's no question that I would, 
but I'm on rather shaky ground and I really don't know where I stand. If we passed PSYCPAC and joined PSYCPAC, then I would be on firm ground because PSYPAC regulates exactly this kind of situation. So I urge you to pass PSYCPAC and put me and my colleagues back on solid ground. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Spellman. I don't see any questions. Thank you for your testimony and your time. Next, we'll hear from number 56, Stuart Steinman. Representative Steinberg, Senator Anwar, and distinguished members of the Public Health Committee. My name is Stu Steinman. I'm a board certified in emergency medicine. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to testify today in support of Governor's Bill 5045, an act reducing lead poisoning, and I would like to offer four amendments to further strengthen it. The bill is an improvement over our existing lead legislation in that it would lower the lead levels that trigger one reporting to public health authorities, which in turn triggers providing critical information regarding dangers of lead poisoning, as well as abatement requirements for on-site inspections to identify the source of lead and for remediation and three, local health directors are explicitly allowed to initiate investigations of lead sources and order remediation in high-risk situations, even if the blood levels do not hit the trigger value. The bill would continue mandatory lead testing at least annually for children nine months to three years, but now it also adds at least annual testing to children three to six years who are at very high risk. The bill directs the Commissioner of Social Services to seek federal authority to amend the Medicaid state plan to cover services necessary to address the health impacts of elevated childhood blood levels. While this bill would improve current law pertaining to lead exposures, there are several aspects vital to the identification, mitigation, and treatment of lead exposure that are missing. I strongly urge that the bill be amended to address these four key points. One, amend section two of the bill to ensure that whenever a local health director receives a report of an elevated blood level above the cutoff for children and pregnant women, the director's investigation includes information regarding the place of residence and household members' jobs for five years prior to the identification of an elevated blood level. The reason is that lead is not a natural component of the human body. In fact, it is toxic at all levels. The two most common places where children are exposed to lead is in their homes and by exposure to lead that is brought into the home by other household members whose jobs expose them to lead. Pregnant women are at additional risk for occupational exposure as well. Notably, children absorb 100% of lead in inhaled dust from a housemate's exposure at work as compared to 50% absorption orally. Once a person ingests lead, it is permanently stored in their bones and teeth unless it is removed with chemicals called chelating agents. That is, lead accumulates over the course of a person's lifetime. As a result, a blood lead level above the cutoff will reflect exposure from one's prior living conditions and occupational exposures, as well as current circumstances. Two, amend section 3A2 to add children of color, and the history of recent emigration to the United States as criteria for mandatory lead screening. Excuse me, Dr. Steinman, but your time is almost up. If you could please summarize. Thank you. Yes, thank you. The two groups of children at highest risks are for lead exposure are children of color and children who recently emigrated to this country. For one example is that black children living below the poverty line have lead levels twice that of their white peers. Therefore, children in these two groups should be added to the list of high risk groups. Three, amend section 1E to add a screening test for iron and hemoglobin to the required three month um, follow up blood lead test. The reason is that there is a vicious cycle between elevated blood levels of lead and low iron levels. High levels of lead in the blood uh, impede normal iron absorption. This causes the child to become iron deficient. Iron deficiency in turn increases lead absorption. For this reason, screening for iron deficiency is very important as iron supplementation is recommended for all children with measurable levels of lead in their blood. Finally, amend any sections in the bill that require the provision of information and educational materials to mandate inclusion of nutritional counseling, which should include a discussion of the need for adequate dietary calcium. The reason, 
poor nutrition and inadequate dietary counseling also increase the absorption of lead. In summary, Governor's Bill number 5045 should be amended to one, add collection of demographic data enumerating living conditions and occupation of housemates for five years prior to identification as having an elevated blood level, two, screening for iron deficiency and anemia in children and pregnant women with an elevated blood level, three, nutritional counseling, four, iron and calcium supplementation, five, inclusion of children of color or recent immigrants as other high-risk groups, and finally, and of equal importance, is solicitation of community guidance to maximize the available ability of service. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak today. I'll be more than happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you, Mr. Steinman. We do. Uh, uh, Chairman Steinberg, go right ahead. With respect, it's Dr. Steinman. Oh, I'm so sorry. Thank you, Dr. Steinman. My mother would turn in her grave. No, I'm glad you uh, <laughs> let me know. You you earned it. You you deserve it. <laughs> um, go right ahead, Chair, uh, Chairman Steinberg. Well, good to see you, Stu. Uh, as a doctor, that was a wonderful exegesis. As, a, as an aspiring lawyer, uh, the judge probably would have sanctioned you by now for going so far over the limit. Uh, you were nowhere near three minutes on that and blew right through it. Um, uh, obviously, we'll take a good look at your written testimony. Um, I am no expert as to what are the requirements for an effective lead examination as uh, conducted by the Department of Public Health through its various districts. But it, it seems to me if we're giving renewed attention to the whole area of uh, poisoning identification, we could benefit from all of your suggestions. And uh, we'll make sure that we forward your suggestions to the Department of Public Health. And they may have some impact on what becomes the standard for uh, poisoning evaluation in the state. So thank you very much for that. Um, I'm gonna to have to reread your testimony because I couldn't quite assimilate 10 minutes with the stuff. In, in, in the, the written one is even longer. <laughs> thank you for the warning. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Thank you, Chairman. And thank you, Doctor, for being here in your testimony. You. All right, next we will hear from number 57, Carrie Rand, ooh, Anastasis. Close, close. <laughs> um, good afternoon, uh, Senator Anwar, Representative Steinberg, Representative Gilcrest, and members of the committee. My name is Carrie Rand Anastasiades, and I am the Executive Director of the Connecticut Association of Community Pharmacies, an association of large um, retail pharmacies such as uh, Walgreens, Rite Aid, and, and Big Y, to name a few. I'm here today to speak in favor of House Bill 5119, an act permitting pharmacists to administer influenza vaccine to children ages 12 years and older. Our pharmacies are in every neighborhood throughout the state and provide quality healthcare in a convenient manner. Recognizing the expertise and accessibility of pharmacists and the critical need to eliminate barriers to childhood vaccines, the federal government acted early in the pandemic and under the PrEP Act allowed pharmacists to order and administer COVID vaccines as well as all ACIP recommended childhood vaccines to children ages three years and older. Pharmacists are experienced vaccine providers who have demonstrated throughout the pandemic their ability to both improve access to vaccine services and safely administer vaccines to the same population. Connecticut pharmacists have administered approximately 220,000 vaccines to children and adolescents in 2020 and 2021 alone. According to federal government statistics, pharmacies provide two of every three COVID vaccination doses. More than 30% of children ages five to 11 who have received their COVID vaccine have done so at a pharmacy. These vaccinations have demonstrated equity as well as accessibility. Half of pharmacy COVID vaccination sites are located in areas with high social vulnerability and more than 40% of those vaccinated from these pharmacies are from racial and ethnic minority groups. With their proven track record of safety, accessibility, and convenience, the people of Connecticut now expect their, to receive childhood vaccines at their local pharmacies. While the bill would make permanent allowances for pharmacists to provide flu vaccine to children, it does not address or accommodate COVID or other childhood vaccines that pharmacies are currently authorized to order under the 
and administer under the PREP Act. We feel this must be remedied. Limiting the pharmacist's ability to just um, administer flu runs contrary to public health goals of improving overall vaccination rates. Allowing pharmacists to administer additional vaccines beyond flu will also help accelerate access to vaccines when the next public health emergency arises. I urge you to permanently authorize pharmacists to continue to administer all of the vaccine types that are now provided under the federal PrEP Act, but at the very least vaccines for COVID and influenza for children ages 12 years and older. I thank you for the opportunity to testify and I'm happy to answer any questions if you have them. Thank you, Ms. Rand Anastasiades. You just have to say it fast. <laughs> um, so we do have a question. Uh, Dr. Pettit, go right ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mrs. Anastasiades. Um, do you have an idea of the statistics in Connecticut, how many the vaccines were they administered by pharmacists versus pharm pharmacy techs versus other people? Do you have any feel for that? Um, our statistics are not broken out by pharmacist or pharmacy tech because that's allowable under regulation and um, within the pharmacy. But um, we do know that um, in Connecticut, pharmacists have in 2021 for all ages of vaccines have given over 2 billion shots. So um, it, it's a staggering number. And, you know, so that compiles all of our our techs as well as our pharmacists. And uh, in, in terms of the administration, the feedback from your members, do they feel that uh, they have perhaps, you know, I guess it's, it's hearsay, so to speak, they feel that they've been able to reach out to other people who might not have been otherwise vaccinated, number one, and number two, if there was, the, the policy has typically been if there was an adverse effect even if it was just a severe sore arm or a rash, are they referred back to their primary care provider? Or what's the policy in that regard? Absolutely. A lot of the screening that takes place, you are um, on the form that you fill out, you put your um, primary care provider's name as well as their contact information. So if there was an adverse reaction, um, you certainly, um, we would refer you back to that individual. Um, there is that 15 minute um, waiting period after you receive the dose. We feel that um, because our, our pharmacies are really uniquely um, poised in, in every corner of the state that we have people coming in for a, a variety of reasons, whether they're picking up their regular prescription, whether they're getting testing supplies or tests for COVID or flu. Um, so then it makes it that much more likely that they will um, get their vaccination within the pharmacy because it's, it's quick, it's easy, it's simple. You know, um, pharmacists are go through six years of schooling and have um, wonderful, wonderful medical training. Um, and, you know, now with electronic medical record and the like, it's very easy for us to coordinate with um, primary care physicians or specialists um, that, that can achieve a greater goal of, of healthcare for the individual. Thank you. I will uh, ad admit to the committee that I was nabbed in the Band-Aid aisle for my flu shot this past year. So save, save me away somewhere else. So thank you for your answers. And thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. I don't see any other questions. Thank you for your time today. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from number 58, Victor Vaughn. Uh, thank you, Madam Vice Chair, and uh, um, thank you for this opportunity. Chairperson Abrams, Chairperson Steinberg, Vice Chair Gokas, ranking members Huang, Summers, and Pettit, and other distinguished members of the um, Public Health Committee. My name is Vic Vaughn. I'm a past president of the Connecticut Physical Therapy Association of Connecticut, and I'm uh, also uh, additionally a mem was a member, uh, a representative of the chapter on the Physical Therapy Compact Work Group that met this fall on this topic. And I'm here today to testify in support of HB 5046. Uh, first of all, I'd like to applaud the governor's office and the Department of Public Health for convening these work groups and following through with this, the development of this legislation. In today's healthcare arena, the issues of staffing and access to effective care is a significant dilemma. Um, physical therapists were not part of this originally part of this current legislation, despite widespread support and, um, and 
through the work group as well as um, without, with our chapter. And apparently that was due to a limited set of concerns raised during the work group sessions. In short, there was some concern and confusion as to how the PT compact would relate to Connecticut, Connecticut's confidential alternative to public disciplinary action for professionals. And while I can't really speak for others, it, it's my understanding that the issues that complicated our inclusion in this legislation have been resolved. <clears throat> PT compact membership would assist with several very challenging issues. Staffing for physical therapists has long been a major issue for organizations in which of course this has been made substantially worse um, through the pandemic. Healthcare practices often need temporary staff to bridge, bridge a gap in services. Um, there are companies that provide traveling PT services. However, under the current licensure regulations, it can often take several months before a traveling PT can get licensed to practice in the state. As you can imagine, that places enormous burdens on facilities and staffs by overburdening these existing staffs. And it often can limit access for patients because of the reduction in staffing levels. The other issue that's come up is that, is that the pandemic has demonstrated tremendous value in telehealth care because most of the regulatory rules state that the providers must be licensed in the state the patient is in at the time of the encounter. Most providers cannot provide out of state telehealth services unless they are part of the compact. This is particularly problematic for patients and providers who live near state lines, as well as for those patients that travel for extended periods. <clears throat> Currently, 34 states have enacted legislation and are participating in the PT Compact. There are two additional states that have legislation pending, including Massachusetts, where a bill has just passed out. Of their Excuse me, recently. Mr. Vaughn, but your time is almost up, if you would please summarize. Thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. Wrapping it up. Therefore, based on our legislate on, on the above reasons, we would like to, uh, the chapter would like to respectfully, um, as well as support, substantial support, support from the PT Compact work group, we would like to respectfully request that the Public Health Committee amend HB 5046 and include the physical therapy compact along with the physicians and the psychologists. And we're more than happy to work with the committee to develop effective language for this amendment. I wanna thank you for the opportunity and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Mr. Vaughn, for your testimony today. I don't see any questions. And at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Senator Julie Kushner. Thank you, Representative Gilchrist. And uh, we are going to move on to number 59, uh, Rachel Bogarts. And it's my understanding there's a video ready. <laughs> Fun. Hi, my name's Rachel Lynn Bogarts. I live in New Horizons Village which is in Farmington, Connecticut. I am discussing the House Bill 5277, and I really appreciate your time to hear my testimony. When, well, you can see I'm in a manual wheelchair. I have cerebral palsy. When I go, to get examined by a doctor. Um, I run into some issues because there's lack of equipment, medical equipment to help me get a full diagnostic exam. Um, the two that I want to mention today are the fact that when I go to get weighed, the scale's too flimsy, and they don't have one that I can easily get onto with my wheelchair chair, or manual lap string crutches. Um, Cause I have to step up to the scale and it's not safe. Um, so I haven't been weighed in like three years. And also if by chance, I am going to get on the exam table. Um, there's usually these, this step up that comes out of the table that you pull out of the table to be in, to be in, exist. 
be a helpful step up. And usually it doesn't come out more than four inches and it's hard to step up. Sometimes I get my foot caught on the edge and the doctor has to assist me with my leg. And also then I have it, I have to pivot, which means I have to hold the doctor's hand to sit down on the table safely. Um, please come up with some suggestions to help me and my fellow disabled counterparts of the world because this is a big issue and everybody is going to face it sometime in their life. Not everybody's lucky enough to be able-bodied. And thank you for your time. Thank you, uh, Rachel, uh, for that important testimony. And uh, next up we have Jennifer uh, and Jennifer, is it Haley? Hale. 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 Yeah. Go ahead, Jen. So, thank you. Good afternoon, Senator Abrams, Representative Steinberg, and members of the legislature's uh, Public Health Committee. I'm in here uh, to discuss the support of House Bill 5045. Um, I am a pediatrician in the Division of Primary Care at Connecticut Children's. I'm also the director of the Hartford Regional Lead Treatment Program, um, along with my colleague, Chris Corcoran, um, who's the manager of our Healthy Homes Program at Connecticut Children. I'm here to speak in support of this very important bill. Um, lead poisoning is 100% preventable, and we have heard that a few times this morning. Um, it's been proven that there's absolutely no safe amount of lead for a child in their developing brain to be exposed to. At very low levels, children tend to remain asymptomatic, but the long-term effects are irreversible. It continues to be demonstrated time and again that lead exposure causes developmental delays, decrease in IQ points, as well as attention and hyperactivity problems. Even beyond childhood, lead exposure has been linked to increased rates of high school dropouts, crime, and incarceration. Unfortunately, a child's socioeconomic status, race, and ethnicity can affect the risk of lead exposure. There is a known correlation between children living below the poverty level and an increased risk of lead poisoning. This risk impacts children who rely on Medicaid more than those who rely on private coverage. And this has been demonstrated in our state's biggest cities of Hartford, New Haven, Bridgeport, and Waterbury. It's also very important to remember that black children are 2.3 times more likely to be lead poisoned than white children and Hispanic children are 1.4 times more likely. Lowering the level of parental notification would allow families to educate themselves on way to further prevent lead exposure um, and be sure that they're receiving the appropriate follow-up testing. Decreasing the blood level that triggers home inspections to more closely align with the CDC and the current AAP RECs is the right thing to do for numerous reasons. On-site inspections allow public health trained officials to find potential lead hazards. Once hazards have been identified, they can educate the families on ways to temporarily stabilize these areas of deterioration in their home and connect these families to funding sources such as Hartford um, Connecticut Children's Healthy Homes Program. The bill's proposal to seek new opportunity to leverage Medicaid dollars also makes sense because it makes families more able to connect to the funds to help with mitigation efforts. According to um, a cost-benefit analysis, for every $1 invested in controlling lead hazards, there is a $17 to $221 return in health benefits, IQ points, higher lifetime earnings, and collected tax revenue, and decreased spending on special education and reduced criminal activity. So lowering the threshold for intervention will prevent further exposure, and lead poisoning is 100% preventable, and we need to do anything and everything we can to prevent it. Thank you, Jennifer. I don't see any hands at this time. So thank you so much for your testimony today. Thank you. Next up, we have a video again. This is from Gary Gross. Um, good morning. Thank you to the committee for hearing my story. My name is Gary Gross. My story is like, every, it's like everybody else's story with some variation. I was born in 1950 due to, due to prematurity. I ended up having cerebral palsy and blindness. And I, I'm in a wheelchair. 
um, in my situation, I can no longer get on an examining table myself, and so I need help doing it. The first example I'm going to give you is, I went to Yukon in January 20th, 2022, for a bone marrow biopsy. I brought my aide, Marie Rodriguez, to help me at the cancer center, but the cancer center staff would not let her help me. They got me on the, the table okay, but and they got me off, but they had trouble getting me off, getting me back in my wheelchair. So they, they called Marie back and she helped them. Um, they had trouble getting using the Hoyer lift. That's the other part. They need training to use the Hoyer lift, to know how to use the Hoyer lift correctly, as well as examining tables. Uh, uh, um, as far smaller, you know, easier examining tables. Um, I guess the second part is that. I go to a physiatrist in, in Southington, and I've been going to him for years. We just started doing Botox shots, and, um, and Maria had to help me get on the, get on the examining table, and, and because I can no longer do that myself. And, it's very dangerous for her, for Marie, because she can hurt her back, and I could get hurt. My doctor said he had never thought about it. Now, if the state came up with an incentive where, he could, where they could help him get new examining tables and help him pay for it, that he might be willing to, to do it. Um, this issue affects me and many other people. Thank you very much. Like I said, my name is Gary Gross, and thank you for hearing me to the rest of the team. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. And if you're watching us, thank you so much for your testimony today. Uh, next up, we have uh, number 62, Nathan Tinker. Is Nathan here? Hello. Good afternoon. Senator Kushner, uh, Representative Slimber, Senator Anwar, Representative Gilchrist, Representative Summers, Pettit, and all the rest of the members of the committee, thank you for uh, uh, hearing me today. You already have a copy of my uh, written testimony, so I'm not going to go through that. And uh, my, my colleague, uh, uh, Carrie Rand, earlier said uh, a lot of uh, useful information about the role of pharmacists and pharmacists uh, during the pandemic and how important um, it is for patients to have access to uh, childhood uh, vaccines. Um, the one thing I would want to point out uh, in all of this is that under uh, the executive orders during the pandemic, Executive Order 9Q actually authorized pharmacists to provide COVID and flu vaccines to individuals age 10 and up. Um, so there's a difference here in the number between age 10 and 12. Um, um, by, by bringing that number, uh, that age into play here, we actually would be uh, joining a, a well-established and highly successful national trend in terms of, of uh, pharmacist authority to provide uh, these uh, uh, important vaccines. Um, also under the PrEP Act, which uh, uh, pharmacists can, uh, currently have authority to provide uh, 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 COVID and ASEP approved uh, childhood series from ages three through 18. Um, in statute, Connecticut is one of only three states that actually disallows pharmacists to provide these sorts of things under the age of 18. So I think it's, it's uh, high time we move past that. Uh, I'd also like to mention two other issues that have been discussed today uh, as well, HB 5044, the opioid litigation. I, I would like to uh, have you consider making sure that with whatever you uh, choose to do with 
if those litigation funds, please to consider including uh, CME and education funds for uh, providers and practitioners. This is an extremely important uh, area. Uh, we at CPA right now are in the process of applying for several grants to help support that as well, being able to, uh, um, um, uh, for everyone from EMTs to physicians, nurses, pharmacists to have that sort of training is very important. Finally, also um, a few people today have mentioned the Haven program. Um, you know, we at CPA are working with uh, DCP, DPH, and the General Law Committee, of course, in uh, uh, getting pharmacists the ability to take advantage of that program. But uh, um, there is some work to be done in terms of the uh, professional fee schedules, and uh, much of that is under this uh, uh, committee's uh, uh, authority rather than than those other ones. So uh, again, my my message is, uh, you know, pharmacists have have been are the closest. Uh, provider to most people for uh, childhood vaccines and giving them that opportunity to continue to uh, maintain that uh, uh, level of service that already exists under current uh, uh, guidance, it'd be a, a good thing for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tinker. I don't see any hands at this time. Uh, thank you for being with us today and for your testimony. Thank you. Next up, we have Angela Gochenauer. Did I say that correctly? Close, close. Thank you so much. Uh, it's Angela Gockenauer. Um, okay. Members of the committee, I want to thank you for the opportunity to testify today um, in front of you on House Bill 5044, the act implementing the governor's budget recommendations regarding the use of opioid litigation proceeds. Like I said, I am Angie Gockenauer. I am the director of state government affairs for Pair Therapeutics. The opioid epidemic has highlighted the need for wider access to pharmacological and behavioral treatments for substance use and opioid use disorders. This has been exasperated in Connecticut during the COVID-19 crisis. In order to help bridge the gap of treatment, the committee should take a look at how to integrate prescription digital therapeutics into the standard of care. Prescription digital therapeutics deliver clinically validated disease treatments via mobile devices and can mitigate many treatment bar barriers by offering accessible and consistent evidence-based treatments available to patients 24 seven, specifically the first two FDA authorized PDTs, RESET and RESET-O. They're available in both English and Spanish and include as part of their three mechanisms of action, addiction specific cognitive behavioral therapy, fluency training and contingency management delivery to treat substance use disorder and opioid use disorder respectfully. Advances in digital and behavioral technology may increase access and cost effectiveness and may third, further optimize technology-based treatments. Digital tools promote, permit remote reporting of substance use, but also remote delivery of incentives and provide new ways to deliver contingency management to promote abstinence from substance use. One barrier to PDT treatment is access. Innovations in digital and information technology may permit unprecedented access to some forms of CM treatment. What we're asking is for the committee to grant the use of some state opioid funds for the Connecticut Medicaid to develop a pilot program integrating innovative prescription digital therapeutics to help people in Connecticut with substance use disorder or opioid use disorder on their recovery journey. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Angie. I see a question here from Representative Parker. Thank you, Madam Chair. Can you hear me okay? I had to change. Yes, we screen. can. Okay, thank you. Hi, Angela, thanks for being here. Um, just wanted to, to follow up. Uh, it's my understanding that M Medicaid um, nationally and in other states is currently being used to fund prescription digital therapeutics. Can you confirm that and then sort of follow up on um, what the next step would be for that to happen in Connecticut, why that's not happening yet? I understood that you shared that looking for funds to be able to, to do a, a test, I think. Just, can you just talk through that again? Yeah, so in some states, we've actually been utilizing uh, either store funds or the opioid settlement funds to utilize you know, prescription digital therapeutics in this population. Um, we are working to get Medicaid coverage. We do now have uh, codes that are, are able to be billed. Um, when we initially met with Connecticut Medicaid, we didn't have these paths forward. Um, so now we have Massachusetts covering PDTs um, on their PDL. And you know, I think those conversations will be ongoing. <laughs> That's helpful. And, and maybe just my, my last question here. Can you give a, I know you, you covered this, but I'm, I remember as I learned more, it was helpful. 
can you just speak for a few more seconds about what actually the PDT tool does? How, how should my colleagues here understand this? What, oh yeah, what is, absolutely. What is this? Yeah. So it's it's basically it's it's a it's a counseling tool. So it's to be used in conjunction with treatment as usual. So it's just an extension of, of a regular treatment that patients are able to utilize 24/7 in the middle of the night when they're you know feeling their most vulnerable. They're able to go online and or go onto the app that they have a prescription for that is directly connected to a physician. And they can utilize this app to do therapies. Once they do therapies, then, th then they go into a fluency training program so that they can make sure that what they're learning in these therapies are actually understanding. And if that's the case, they go into a contingency management where they are actually rewarded for their positive behavior and it changes the mechanism in their brain. We didn't really just like come up with any of these treatment options. They've been used in addiction recovery for many, many years. We just found a way to put it onto an accessible tool for patients to use outside of um, clinic hours. To that point about access, manager, can I ask one more question? I think I, I might be going a little long, I'm sorry. That's to the okay. point about accessibility, do you have a sense that this actually does offer accessibility to the target population if we're thinking about Medicaid reimbursement? Right. So, you know, what we have found is that people are utilizing this tool in off office hours. So, you know, we're a data driven company, so we can actually, you know, find when patients are using it and how they're doing and, and sort of what the retention rate and treatment is and everything like that. So when you look at when people are using the app, you know, it's about 80% of people are using that around, you know, in, in, when, when office aren't, hours aren't available. So there's no physician they can get a hold of at those times and they're feeling the most vulnerable. So instead of going on their phone and actually maybe calling their dealer or getting themselves involved in, in you know, unsavory, uh, uh, you know, atmospheres, they're going on and they're doing these treatment options. Um, we actually shown in our clinical trials because we are FDA authorized. In our clinical trials, we've shown a 14% retention rate in people who are using the app with treatment as usual. And, you know, we do have that prescription aspect. So the physician gets to monitor and see what the patients are doing when it comes to these, when, when it comes to these apps. So when they go to meet with their physician, those first 15 minutes aren't taken up with saying, how, would, how was your month? You can dive directly into sort of what therapy lessons that the patient may or may not have been understanding. I appreciate you sharing that. That's helpful. And thank you for the time, Madam Chair. I'm all set. Thank you, Representative Parker, for your questions. And thank you, Angie. I don't see any other hands here. So we will move on to our next person on the list. Thank you so much. Next up, we have Stephanie Light, uh, Dr. Light. Hi. Thank you for having me here. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, my name is Dr. Stephanie Lida. I'm a clinical and forensic psychologist who practices in the Hartford area. And I am here to talk in support of House Bill 5046, which is the SIPAC bill. Now you've heard from my colleagues about the importance of continuation of care and other aspects of it related to clinical practice, but I'm gonna come at it from a different direction because of what I do. So I have a really specialized practice. I practice in the area of threat assessment and management, which is the act and the practice of preventing the next school shooting or workplace shooting. So it is sort of like a niche specialized area. As far as my qualifications go, I'm the president of the Connecticut Psychological Association's Forensic Division. I'm the president of the New England chapter of the Association of Threat Assessment Professionals. I'm an adjunct at the University of Hartford, a forensic field mentor at Columbia University, a bunch of other things. And I'm licensed in our great state as well as Massachusetts and New York. So as you can see, I sort of have my fingers in a bunch of different states, which is necessary when you have a specialization like I do. Now I've seen um, psychologists in other states be able to say that they are sci packed eligible so they can practice in different states. And I'm gonna give you a super fast story. I was hired under coronavirus when times the licensing rules were a little different to do an evaluation of a child in another state, a teenager who had made really substantive plans to shoot up their school. He wanted to kill a lot of people, had obtained weapons, had a plan, et cetera. And I was able to come in with um, my knowledge and to do an evaluation of him and I know because I know how things turned out, that my work with the team that was working with him enabled him after he was released because he was detained for several years because he maintained his homicidal ideation for a long time. Um, I know that my work was able to put him on a different path and to enable him to make choices that didn't involve killing people as a way of solving his problems. 
Now, I'm not unique. Connecticut is full of amazing practitioners who have specialized skills, and we really should be able to go out into the rest of the country and share our knowledge with the rest of the country. Now, you guys, as our legislators, have a huge burden of many responsibilities on your plate. You're responsible for the health and safety of the people of Connecticut, and SIPAC helps us get there. And you also, of course, you have a fiscal responsibility. SIPAC is very fiscally sound. And if you think about it, if I go out into another state and make a bunch of money and come back here, you guys get a bunch of that in my taxes. So it benefits the state immensely um, for us to go ahead and do that. So I am out of time. So I will say thank you and I'm open to any questions. Thank you, Dr. Light. And I know I didn't say that correctly at, the, at your last name, but I, I know people with that spelling that say light. And so <laughs> I apologize. Uh, I don't see any hands. So at this time, we'll move to our next speaker. Thank you for being here. Next, we have Andrew Bate. Andrew, can you hear us? Yes. Okay, oh, yes. My name is Andrew Bate. I have... Um, both personal and professional experience uh, with persons with disabilities. I have to use a wheelchair, and um, I'm here speaking in favor of Bill 5277 regarding uh, accessible diagnostic medical equipment. <clears throat> I can sum up my experience in Connecticut uh, regarding accessible medical diagnostic equipment by saying that um, I I in Connecticut, I have yet to see a piece of this equipment. So nowhere that I've gone in my adult life have I ever seen um, such equipment. In my professional life, um, when I was a social worker, I used to have contact with many um, individuals with disabilities. Um, one example where uh, people encounter many problems, like many women with disabilities would uh, contact me about where they might be able to get, a, get an appropriate gynecological examination. Um, and it wasn't through my expertise that I was able to get, get answers to those folks. It was simply because I knew an individual in the disabled community who could completely in the right direction. Um, um, one other, another point that I wanted to make was, and I need to emphasize this, is that when people don't have access to appropriate diagnostic equipment, examinations simply don't get done. And um, while that may work well with height and weight, because you can kind of Estimate it uh, when it comes to serious conditions. The problem <clears throat> um, in May, I'm sorry, in, two, uh, in 2021, the National Council on Disability published a report around accessible diagnostic medical, medical equipment. I, uh, I would point people to page 19 of that report for a timeline regarding federal efforts in this area. Um, just, to, just to kind of sum up what it says there, as a person with a disability, if we wait for the federal government to act, we're going to be waiting for quite a while. And, and uh, finally, I simply want to Ask the Public Health Committee to pass this bill sooner rather than later because uh, there are many people out there with disabilities whose examinations and appropriate medical care can't wait. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bate, and uh, appreciate your testimony here today, both uh, from a personal and a professional point of view. Uh, I don't see any hands at this time. Uh, so we, oh, I do see Representative D'Amico. 
Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, sorry to, to, to buzz in so late. So, so, so Mr. Bate, thank you for, for, um, for testifying today. And I just want to ask you one, one quick question. It has been suggested uh, both here today and, and previously that as long as reasonable um, uh, alternate accommodations were made available, uh, that that would satisfy uh, the, 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 the need for, for uh, accessible equipment. Have you had any experience where reasonable alternatives were offered that, that, that you could, uh, you could uh, share with us? Yeah, um, they all, all of the times that I've been offered a reasonable accommodation have come in a form when a doctor has basically just examined me in my wheelchair. So, um, you know, I haven't been able to get, get up on a table since I was 20. So, um, basically, as uh, the medical student from UConn pointed out, that means that, you know, a thorough medical examination cannot be done. So, um, that's my experience. Okay. All right. Th thank you. I appreciate it. I appreciate your, 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 your waiting this long to testify and, and thank you for your personal, personal testimony. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative D'Amico. I don't see any other hands at this time. So thank you, Mr. Bate. And next up, we have um, James Icabellis. Good afternoon, Senator Kushner and distinguished members of the Public Health Committee. I'm pleased to be, to be here to testify in Senate Bill 89, an act concerning surgical smoke. Um, Senate Bill 89 requires hospitals and outpatient surgical facilities to develop and implement a policy and, um, to prevent exposure to surgical smoke. Hospitals across the state um, uh, I've made great strides in purchasing um, and uh, it, implementing surgical smoke evacuation systems. Um, in fact, um, several hospitals have been given awards um, from the, get this right, Association for Perioperative Registered Nurse, Nurses AORN, who you already have heard from this morning. Um, but we are aligned with um, some of the comments uh, that we have already heard, not, a, not opposing the bill, but asking you to make two changes in the bill relative to the deadlines um, in the bill. First, we ask you to extend the deadline for creating a policy to uh, January 1st, uh, 2024, and implementation by October 1st, 2024, in, um, in relation to the creation of the policy and to make sure that uh, hospitals can continue to purchase this equipment. We know the um, uh, supply chain is a bit unpredictable. Uh, we, we have heard uh, uh, some issues with um, this um, the supply chain, but then others have said they haven't had problems as, as they have been purchasing this equipment. Um, so the first would be an extension of the deadline. And secondly, deleting the, the um, reporting requirement. Um, we all know the Department of Public Health throughout the statute recognizes all the instances where hospitals are required to have policies and they survey and inspect to, to those statutes and to those requirements. I don't believe we need um, the, uh, each hospital to send in to the Department of Public Health their policy and then have the Department of Public Health create a report back on this. Um, so uh, as, a, a, as always, the department is, as I said, keenly aware of those reporting requirements, but we are supportive and hospitals across the state are on this journey um, to remove uh, surgical smoke from surgical suites. Thank, Thank you, you and I'm happy to answer any questions. I do see one question from uh, Chairman and Senator Saud Anwar. Thank you so much. Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, um, James. Um, just wanted to follow up quickly. Um, do you know the cost and the availability of these machines? Uh, I think I actually asked that question and I thought the, I thought the response was in somewhere between 20 and $40,000, I think per piece of equipment. That's just what my memory says. And in terms of the ability to uh, gather them um, or to purchase them. Some hospitals have said that they have had no problems in the supply chain. Others have said that it, that it has taken 
a little bit longer to get them. But there isn't anything out there at the moment that says um, that I can tell you that they're backlogged years down the road. I have not heard that from uh, from anybody. Okay, and, and and but but you do feel that getting a little bit more time is going to uh, help um, in the implementation across the board, if you will. Yes, thank okay. you. There's so many squares and then the square changes and you're looking everywhere. I know, and I, I noticed that myself. Thank you. <laughs> okay, and and um, I, I uh, th there was another bill which is, uh, um, uh, I believe, uh, we're talking about uh, uh, ex some of the diagnostic equipment accessibility. Are you in the position to speak uh, about that, or should we have a conversation at some other point? I am. I am not the expert, but I think I can. I. I and our testimony is still in uh, uh, a work in progress, but let me let me start off by saying that this issue is critically important. It's important to make sure that everybody has and can receive appropriate preventative and care. Um, where, where I think we need to uh, recognize is the bill calls for the Department of Public Health to take uh, guidance and standards from the access board and, and put those into regulations. Those guidance and, um, and, and standards have not yet gone through the federal regulatory process where they have, would have received comments um, and, and if there are any concerns. So we we'll leave it up to the Department of Public Health to decide to whom this should apply to. Should it apply to every physician office, every urgent care center or every um, healthcare provider? That would be one of the questions they would have to they would have to um, to decide. And obviously, the more diagnostic equipment that we can provide, and the more preventative care we provide, we want to. They would also have to decide how how to work through the variety of different settings that physicians practice in. Some practices in in in, uh, in settings which they can easily accommodate new equipment. Others may be practicing um, in uh, uh, um, places where they can't. And also to look at th these standards, the Department of Public Health would be applying these standards to medical device manufacturers. And what would that mean? So it's a critically important issue. I think it, 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 is, it is one that we, we need to make sure that we get it right, but we have to balance off. And is the Department of Connecticut Department of Public Health the place and the entity that should be moving these guidance and standards into regulatory enforceable um, requirements. Th thank you so much for your testimony and thank you for sharing information with us. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Representative Pettit. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Yacobellis. The, uh, do you know, and, and I'm sorry if we, we talked about this offline, I've forgotten the answer. How many hospitals currently have partial systems or some systems in, in place to take care of the surgical smoke? Is it just a handful out of 20, 30, or is it, or is it many? Do you have any idea? I am, I am hesitant to say every one of them, but we are talking about that, that, that we are in a very high percentage that have begun this journey and have begun to purchase this equipment. So it is, it is, it is not a handful. We had a conversation with um, hospitals across the state um, and, you know, I didn't uh, actually go through and I should have checked off every single one when we asked that question, but my impression from all of them is they are all on this journey and, and actually pretty far on the journey of recognizing they need to do it. Um, but this bill would require the establishment of a policy, which means we have to go through the policy and making procedure, which kicks in Joint Commission, kicks in CMS and all the requirements for the policy. And then to make sure that, that were implemented by the date required by statute, we'd have to make sure the equipment's for every surgical suite. Thank but, you, that was but, sort of my perception. But I think it's so, fair to say hospitals are, are, are on this journey, significantly on this journey. That's that's what I've heard from, from some colleagues. Uh, and I wonder, uh, uh, the House Bill uh, 5046 on the uh, interstate compacts, uh, do, you, uh, do you have any in input on that, uh, pro con uh, suggestions at this point? We think it as as drafted. It it is a value. It is one valuable tool in dealing with the workforce shortage. And we know that working with out-of-state providers was normally extraordinarily important during um, 
during the pandemic. It's not going to solve every one of the problems, but it is a tool. Um, we do think that there are other professions that we should continue to look at and address the concerns that were raised in these work groups, but we think it is um, an important tool. Well, I, I agree and appreciate that. And I think we, I think we, we agree that we need to also look at the underlying cause for why we're, we're lacking some of these folks and try to make whatever changes will help attract more people to practice in these areas here and, and fill the needs that we have. So thank you for your uh, answers and thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, earlier, I saw a hand from Representative D'Amico, but you did you put it down intentionally or do you? Well, I, I think I'm all set, Madam Chair. Uh, okay. Senator Anwar anticipated my question and um, Great. Great minds think alike. Thank you, Senator, and thank you, Senator. <laughs> okay, I don't see any other hands at this time, so we will move on to our next speaker on the list. Thank you. And that is uh, number 27, I mean 67, we're not going backwards, um, Sheldon Tobman. Thank you. Good afternoon, Senator Kushner, Representative Steinberg, other distinguished members of the Public Health Committee. My name is Sheldon Tobman. I'm the litigation attorney at Disability Rights Connecticut. We are the protection and advocacy system for Connecticut, serving individuals with a full range of disabilities. I'm here to testify about the impact of HB 527 on people with mobility disabilities. Many of our clients with these disabilities report they have great difficulty being weighed, something simple many of us take for granted. And it is routine that they describe problems getting access to exam tables and recommended diagnostic tests. You've heard just a few of those stories today, and you know, those are just a few, there's thousands more like them. Uh, about the ADA, which was discussed earlier. Title II of the ADA, which applies to public hospitals, and Title III of the ADA, which applies to private hospitals and clinics, already require these facilities to make reasonable modifications to their facilities, services, and equipment if necessary for people with disabilities to receive the same level of services as, as someone without a disability receives. Now, I'm happy to, if asked, explain reasonable, but the bottom line, is that these requirements fully apply to people with mobility disabilities and they are being disregarded. The bill would require the adoption of regulations by DPH putting into law what the Access Board produced in 2017 after years of careful study required under the Affordable Care Act. If this requirement were to be adopted, the inaccessible diagnostic medical equipment, which would routinely serve as a barrier, will begin to be replaced allowing thousands of people with mobility disabilities access to appropriate care instead of the second class care they're receiving in violation of the ADA today. However, the bill does not do anything to help people with mobility disabilities being seen at facilities that do not have diagnostic equipment nearing the end of its useful life. So that's a lot of people. If there were some reasonable secondary deadline by which replacement of inaccessible equipment with accessible equipment uh, could be completed, it would greatly help these disabled folks. I don't know what that period of time is, maybe three to five years, but regardless of, of the specific period, the sooner it is, the more people with mobility disabilities will be benefited and avoid inappropriate care. It'll be years before they have relief under the bill as drafted. Lastly, if asked, I'd be happy to talk about the fact that the uh, access board standards did not go through the formal notice and comment period, but I think what, what, what happened was perhaps even better, and I did not hear any objection uh, to the details of those technical standards that were developed over those many years. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. Thank you. And I do see a question from uh, Representative Pettit. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Attorney uh, Taubman. Uh, I had asked previously Attorney Flaherty about enforcement adjudication penalties and you're assuming this goes forward in some form, what do you think is the proper vehicle for making sure this happens and trying to, trying to make it work in, in the best interest of everyone? Well, if the bill is drafted provides that regs are adopted by DPH. And I think that as part of licensing, and I think that if that were the case, then DPH would be doing some enforcement. But the other thing, I agree with attorney Flaherty that the, the hospitals are frankly already in violation of the ADA. The, the reasonable accommodations is really misinterpreted. Reasonable really just means doable. And it's certainly 
doable. There are, as I pointed out in my written testimony, there's there's exceptions for um, fundamental alteration and, and undue burden, but really it is absolutely reasonable. So I think the hospitals are largely already not in compliance with the ADA. If these regs were adopted and maybe DPH does enforcement, that would make a very strong case because you know the ADA is general, talks about reasonable accommodation for all kinds of disabilities. It would make it a much easier case for people who don't have access to this equipment to enforce it through such as the CHROs, as Attorney Flaherty said, if that answers your question. Yes, I appreciate that you've been uh, doing this for a couple of years, so I appreciate your uh, experience and uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. And next I see a question from Representative D'Amico. Thank you again, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Sheldon, for coming to testify. I, I appreciate it. Uh, I'm going to give you your opportunity that you asked for. Uh, you, you, you anticipated uh, a question regarding the rulemaking process. So uh, I, 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 I'd be curious to, to, hear, to hear your uh, comments on that. Right. So, so typically, federal agencies do have an elaborate rulemaking process, notice and comment, and it may take them years to develop their proposed rules. In other areas, however, there's, it's very technical. And in this particular case, under the Affordable Care Act, Congress dictated that we're gonna create, <laughs> not create, we're going to have this entity, this, this well-recognized national body of experts. We're gonna give them the job of coming up with these standards. And actually, I remember the, don't remember the exact year, but they were very late. And they were very late because they spent a lot of time and they did a really good job. And they came up with those kinds of uh, detailed measurements that, that really are needed in order to make this equipment work. So the good news is we don't have to reinvent the wheel. And I don't, I don't think Mr. Acabellas was suggesting there's any need to reinvent the wheel. The standards are already well laid out. What you get from notice and comment is an opportunity for various interest groups to weigh in. Um, but we're not hearing that there's a problem with the standards. So if there's no problem with the standards, what is the issue? And I think that um, it was recognized that um, if you give this to uh, DPH, then there is a question of the end, not the standards, but the entities to which it should be applied. But um, I don't know that uh, having heard the testimony today, I hope people agree that compliance with the ADA by all offices is required. So I'm not sure why we're looking at limiting it um, in terms of the enforcement. The standards have already been set, but now it's just a question of putting it, putting, giving it force of law. So, so I have one other question, Madam Chair, if I could. So, so um, Attorney Taubman, um, I, I, as I expressed earlier today, I, I always get nervous when I see the word regulations. Do you see any reason why, uh, uh, well, I will just say, do you see any reason why these regulations uh, uh, that are called for in this legislation uh, should take an inordinate amount of time or, or, or the, the fact that the, the feds have spent a lot of time on this, should that speed the process, do you think? It should be a relatively straightforward process because as I said, if, if the, as the bill is drafted, this is take the standards and, and it says that a compliance shall meet or exceed those technical standards of the access board. So the standards are already there. No work has to be done whatsoever. So it should not take a long time. And I know that as written, the mandate that when you're affirmatively replacing equipment anyway, you have to obtain the accessible equipment starts January 1st. So that all seems reasonable. But the concern I have is, as I said in my testimony earlier, is that it's not gonna help unless the hospital's equipment is reaching the end of its useful life anyway. And, and so that will be, even if this thing is, if the regs are, if this bill passes is, the regs are adopted and it goes into effect for January 1st, it'll be years before some of our clients with severe mobility disappear, uh, disabilities who can't get access to appropriate care right now will see relief. Um, and, I, and that's why I say for them, it would really benefit them secondarily would be some other date as well, you know, by which completion shall occur. Yeah. No, I, thank you for raising that. That, that. That's that's a concern of mine as well. And, and I appreciate that. And that's all in your testimony. Uh, um, actually, the se this thing about a secondary date is not in my testimony. It only I mean, some of you know that I testified before a lot of different committees and a lot of different things. And 
I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not totally up in everything. And so I didn't really study it really carefully. And then I thought about it some more and then I looked at the previous bill last year and, and looked at what the um, task, the, the group that, you know, testified before you today. And I realized there was this big difference and, and I realized what that meant. So, so I, I'm sorry, it wasn't, it wasn't clear in my written testimony, but, but having heard it all now, I see that there's this very significant deficiency which means that a lot of people with mobility dis uh, disabilities are really, you know, not going to be benefited for quite a few years on the bill's draft. Yeah. And, and again, I, I I would agree with you, and thank you for bringing that up. And that's why we have these hearings to find out the deficiencies. And I'm sure the chairs would agree. So thank you, appreciate it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Representative D'Amico. I don't see any other hands at this time, so we will move to our next speaker. Thank you for being here. And next up, we have uh, number 68, Mary Ann Langton. Hello, co-chairs Darty Abrams, Steinberg, Vice Chairs Anwar, Kushner, Gil Gilchrist, and other distinguished members. My name is Mary Ann Langton, and I live in West Hartford. Patty Ellis, who is my personal assistant, will be reading my testimony that I've written for today's hearing. Ms. Ellis lives in Windsor. As a woman with a severe disability who uses a power wheelchair, I am in support of HB Bill Number 5277, an act concerning the establishment of standard medical diagnostic equipment that promotes accessibility in healthcare facilities. This bill is extremely important to the 55,000 folks with mobility disabilities in Connecticut. In addition, people who are obese and the elderly would find these accessible features useful as well. Imagine being in a power chair and not feeling well. Your head is throbbing and your doctor has ordered you to have a CAT scan test to see if you might have a sinus infection. You rolled into the testing room with your power wheelchair and there is a gasp from the medical assistant because she or he does not know what to do with you. Then you see medical assistants huddle together trying to figure out how to assist you onto the high table. This is a true story that has happened to me many times. I hope that you will vote yes to this very important bill. By voting yes, you'll make our state a leader with requiring accessible medical equipment within doctor's offices as well as in healthcare facilities. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, you did a good job reading that. And thank you, Mary Ann, for providing testimony today. I, I don't see any hands, but um, we have taken your testimony to heart. So thank you. Next, we have uh, Dr. Kurum Gurman. Gurman. Gurman, sorry. Thank you, Senator Kushner. Uh, thank you, Senators Abrams, Representative Steinberg, and distinguished members of the Public Health Committee. My name is Horam Guman, and I'm talking on behalf of the physicians and physicians in training of the Connecticut State Medical Society. And I wanna thank you for this opportunity to provide this testimony in support of Senate Bill 213, an act allowing medical assistance to administer vaccines. And I would like to start by acknowledging the CSMS strongly supports the ability of physicians to delegate appropriate tasks to qualified medical assistants. And the administration of these vaccines would occur under direct supervision of physicians. Most states in the country are currently allowing medical students to administer these vaccines. And I just wanted to maybe take an, a few seconds to clear, uh, to clear up some misconception that has been raised in this committee in the past. The medical uh, assistance role is going to be administering the vaccine. The medical assistant will not have any role in decision-making if a vaccine is appropriate for a given patient. That, that job will remain with the physician who is supervising that medical assistant. Ideally, uh, all preventive health services, including vaccines, should be performed in their primary care medical offices or like their medical homes. And allowing properly trained medical assistants to administer these vaccines will help facilitate this critical health service in physician offices. And that will also free up some of the time from the registered nurses and LPNs so they could tackle more complex triage concerns for patient 
access. As medical professionals continue uh, throughout the uh, 2022 pandemic and beyond to administer vaccines and ongoing boosters to all Connecticut residents against COVID-19, it is vital that physicians can delegate some of these vaccine administration tasks to trained medical assistants. And I will share that I have a small primary care practice where um, we have uh, RNs, LPNs, and medical assistants, and we try to maximize our patient access by allowing the medical um, trained professionals do the task that they are best suited for. Um, having medical assistants taking some of those tasks off the nurses task list would also free up our nurses to do uh, more complex triage and managing patient coordination of patient care in primary care office would definitely benefit from this. And uh, I know a lot of uh, comments have been made about this topic already, and I would certainly be happy to take any additional questions, but I will reiterate that state medical society and uh, representation of, from the uh, physicians in training, we represent about 4,000 physicians in the state, do uh, strongly support this bill. And we would hope that you will consider uh, in favor, voting in favor of this um, bill. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony here today, Dr. Guman. Um, I don't see any hands at this time. So thank you for being with us today. Thank you. Uh, next we have, thank you. Next we have Josephine uh, Simcoe and I don't see her here. I'm wondering if perhaps, oh, Senator Anwar, were you trying to ask a question? I was just saying, I know Dr. Guman, so I was just saying hello to him. Ah, uh, okay. Um, I don't see Josephine, so I'm wondering if that's a, a video. No, I'm here. Oh, are you here? Great. I didn't I'm see you. Trying to turn my camera on. I don't know. Oh, I see. I did something here. Hi. There you go. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Hi, my name is Josephine Simcoe, and I'm testifying in support of Bill 5044 regarding the use of opioid litigation proceeds. In June 2019, I lost my son, Jonathan, to an overdose after several years of struggling with mental health issues and then substance abuse disorder. He was in and out of treatment facilities, both in and out of Connecticut based on availability and insurance coverage. I continue to stay involved with hope and support groups, uh, one in particular for families who have loved ones with substance abuse disorder. I live in Bethel, but this particular meeting is held in Waterbury. It is important to have local available resources, including recovery coaches, extended treatment beds, and sober living facilities to support the person in need of these services. These resources need to be in place for when a person seeking help indicates so, uh, indicates uh, their interest to do so because the window of opportunity to help them closes very quickly before they use again. The committee should be a grassroots roots team assembled with those who have walked the walk and have experience in what does and doesn't work. Money should be carefully directed to support proven and new initiatives, which also educates children and families at their appropriate levels so conversations can be had and supported before and when opportunities first present themselves. It starts with mental health. So these conversations need to start early and the stigma, stigma needs to go away. I would be available to serve in any capacity to help achieve these goals. Thank you all for your time and efforts on this and all public health matters. Thank you for your testimony, Josephine. And um, let me just say that uh, I'm so sorry for your loss. Uh, as someone who has experienced that in my family, uh, I understand how devastating it is. Yeah. It's, it's happened to, to many, many of us. So thank you for being here and thank you for testifying. And I think uh, we take to heart your comments. Okay, thank you. I don't see any questions for you to, right now, but thank you for having come and shared your story and your perspectives. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And uh, next we have, um, I believe it's Paul Polzella. Pol Thank you, Paul. Hi. Uh, thank you for letting me speak today. I'm here speaking on behalf of uh, Senate Bill 89, 
Um, so my name is Paul Pazella. I'm a uh, surgical physician assistant. I've been working in the operating room for about 23 years now. Um, when I first started off, I was working in surgical specialties, which um, the procedures did not generate so much um, toxic smoke um, as the, as the um, specialty which I'm in now. Um, once I switched into what I'm doing now currently, I was really amazed, I was shocked as to how much smoke exposure that the staff was exposed to in the operating room. Um, although I love my current position, the surgical smoke makes for an unpleasant work environment. Um, the electric artery uh, produces so much smoke in the operating room that it oftentimes gives myself as well as other um, people in the OR headaches, nausea, coughing, et cetera. The odor is sometimes so bad that um, and so strong that it can be smelled outside of the operating room down the hallway to other operating uh, areas. Um, that is clear that the inhalation of surgical smoke, smoke is dangerous to those who are exposed to it. And I feel that if the technology exists to eliminate surgical smoke, it's imperative that we're offered that technology. Um, smoking is prohibited on the hospital campuses, restaurants, other businesses. I, I don't feel it's appropriate, safe or fair to have to be exposed to this uh, smoke simply because it's our job in the operating room, especially if there are devices and technologies to limit or eradicate such exposure. We work hard every day to better the health of everyone we see. So I, I think it's a moral obligation to protect the health, protect the healthcare providers who perform those duties. So I'm here to urge you to pass the bill requiring Connecticut hospitals to have proper smoke evacuation devices for all surgical procedures. Thank you, Paul. Um, I do see a hand, Representative Zupkus. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, hi, Paul, thank you for coming. I really, um, is just a, I guess a question of curiosity because I don't know anything about, you know, being in an OR, the surgical smoke. If I was in the OR, I was under, so I never knew there was smoke or not. But is this a, a did this just start happening recently? Like we've never heard anything about it. So I'm curious, is it maybe, you know, a decade old with change of technology that the new technology started with this smoke or has it been around forever? It's, it's been around forever. I can remember back when I was in school, which was 1995 down in New York, uh, in New York City. A lot of times it's the job of the medical student, you know, whoever scrubbed into the OR, to hold a handheld sucker and suck the smoke during these procedures. Um, depending upon what operation you're doing, such as like uh, heart surgery, for instance, you're not using the electrical artery that much. So there's very minimal smoke produced. But something like plastic surgery or any sort of uh, surgery that really is uh, burning through skin, muscle, fat, tissue like that certainly produces a tremendous amount of smoke. Um, that's what I currently do now. And I was really blown away by how much. So the smoke issue has been around forever. The electric artery always produce smoke. These devices, however, that don't or that do suck the smoke have not been around forever. These are relatively new. I haven't seen them except for maybe over the past, I'm gonna guess maybe 10 years. Mm -hmm. So, um, and they are a tremendous help. Right. Well, thank you. Cause I really had no idea. And I've been just wondering that. And so this new technology that sucks the smoke out, does it work? It's working. So that's it. Well, it does work, but here's the problem. Um, the, the, the devices are limited. So for instance, if I'm in the operating room with another surgeon, the surgeon will sometimes have the uh, device which sucks the smoke, I will not. So we're both there using it. So it's like, it's secondhand smoke for me. You know what I mean? So even though his device is sucking his smoke, my device is not. Therefore, if you don't have enough of these to go around, it's almost what's the point? It's like sitting next to someone who's smoking a cigarette. You might not be smoking, but you're still getting the effects. Okay, thank you. Sure, you're welcome. Thank you for your testimony, Paul. And you just uh, actually, clear. I had heard in previous testimony that there weren't always enough devices to go around. 
uh, which you just mentioned, but I had not right. quite understood it the way you said it in terms of, I thought it was not enough devices for each operating room, but you're suggesting even within an operating room, Correct. you might need multiple devices. Correct. And that one, and that device is really just a handheld pencil, a cautery, which has a sucker built into it. So. Thank you for your testimony here today. You're welcome. I appreciate it. And uh, I don't see any other hands at this time. So we will move to the next um, speaker on the list. That's Mohit Agrawal. And it's good to see you, Mohit. Thank you, Senator. It's good to see you too. Um, Thank you to the uh, chairs, vice chairs, ranking members, and uh, distinguished members of the committee. Um, I'm here to speak in favor of House Bill 5045, uh, an act reducing lead poisoning. Uh, there's uh, a significant amount of written testimony on the record. I will be submitting uh, some of my own uh, in just a few moments, um, but I wanted to provide a, a broader context to this bill and, and really emphasize why you know, this year in this session is such an important time to take action on this matter. You know, first of all, the CDC uh, in October of 2021 uh, uh, tightened the standard for uh, what they call the BLRV, the blood lead reference value, uh, which is used as part of the CDC and the American Academy of Pediatrics guidelines for when um, interventions of some kind should be taken for children. And that standard was tightened to 3.5 micrograms per deciliter of blood in October of 2021, um, and had been five micrograms per deciliter for about a decade before then. And before then, it was about 10. Um, the last time this, um, the last time the state of Connecticut took action on the sections uh, that are part of this bill, 19A-110 and 111, was in Public Act 192 in 1992. Uh, and that was the year when, or that was right after when the CDC had updated its guidelines at that time from 25 micrograms per deciliter of blood down to 10. And, and that was the moment in time when the state decided to uh, reciprocate and tighten its own standards. Um, and so, you know, given that the standards have tightened once again, uh, I think it's imperative that the state of Connecticut uh, match the current best standards and best practices and move forward with the governor's proposal. There's other reasons why this moment is important. You know, one is uh, I think COVID has shown us as a state just how um, imperative it is for us to think about environmental health and public health hand in hand. Lead is an environmental health uh, crisis, but it is also a public health crisis and it is also an individual crisis for the individual children who are affected. And their solutions to lead you know, impact um, or involve strategies across all those domains, across you know, uh, individual medicine, across public health and across environmental health. And we're starting to see some of the same patterns uh, when it comes to COVID in terms of improving air quality, in terms of de-densifying um, uh, living air quarters. Um, in terms of a variety of other public health measures that the state and the country have taken over the last uh, two and a half years. And so um, I, think, uh, I think COVID has opened our eyes to what the risks are uh, in, in public health in this country and just and how inequitable those risks are. And I think lead is uh, another area where we can uh, use the same framework, uh, for the same thinking. Uh, uh, in, uh, additionally, uh, ARPA has provided the state uh, and many municipalities significant funds uh, to, uh, that must be used by the end of 2024. Uh, these funds are, um, are perfectly um, situated to be used for a one-time cost, like some of the remediation costs that will be incurred if this bill were to pass, and um, to be used to respond to some of the public health inequities we have seen since COVID, and again, uh, lead fits in that bucket. And then lastly, there's been a significant amount of research over just the last 10 years that has really shown that low levels of lead have uh, severe detrimental impacts on childhood outcomes. And, uh, and additionally, there has been uh, some research that shows that quick intervention at the five or the 10 microgram level of, of blood, uh, above blood levels, um, can, uh, can uh, remedy most, if not all, of those negative impacts. And so that really reemphasizes the point of this bill, which is to intervene as quickly as possible and to make sure that children are, um, are able to, um, uh, to recover from lead poisoning. Uh, just two other quick points. One Excuse is- Excuse me, Mr. Agarwal, your time is almost up. Thank Would you. Please summarize, thank you. Absolutely. So, you know, this bill is a bill in response to childhood lead exposure. There are other domains that we need to be considerate of, including um, uh, pregnant women, lactating women, including recent refugees. Um, and so uh, I'm not necessarily suggesting that's something we must do at this moment. This bill itself is a very good one, but just to put that you know, on the table. And lastly, uh, other jurisdictions, um, say New York, the state of Maryland, Others have uh, adopted much broader primary prevention strategies, uh, including um, requiring lead safe housing, including um, broad testing of school water. And so again, not something we must do today, but I really do want to emphasize to the committee that solving lead is a broad issue 
and it's an issue that's gonna require an all of government response. And so um, just re uh, really recommend that the committee move forward with this legislation mm -hmm. and also think more broadly about uh, further steps. Thank you. Thank you, Mohit. Uh, thank you for your testimony. I don't see any hands at this time. So we'll see you the next time you testify. Absolutely. Thank you, Senator. Uh, next up, we have Renee uh, Sirbu. Hi, can you hear me? I can. Did I get your name correct? Yes, yeah. Good. Right. Uh, Go ahead. <laughs> thank you, distinguished co chairs and members of the Public Health Committee. My name is Renee Sirbu, and I'm testifying today on behalf of myself and Dr. Loretta Grau, both of the Yale School of Public Health, in support of Bill 5044 an act implementing the governor's budget recommendations regarding the use of opioid litigation proceeds. Before coming to Yale, I worked in data analysis pertaining to drug toxicity deaths for the Office of the Chief Coroner for Ontario in Toronto, Canada. My belief is that the standardization of the investigative reporting and data collection processes is one of the missing links in understanding where and how harm reduction efforts are best targeted. As a Canadian, I have had the opportunity to work in a system whose dedication to harm reduction champions the contemporary public health climate. There is no doubt in my mind that harm reduction is a necessary and altogether successful public health initiative, and most scientific peer-reviewed literature for over two decades would agree with me. But illicit substance use does not occur in a vacuum. As Mayor Bronin mentioned this morning, many people who use drugs experience intersectional discrimination from the social drivers of health. The state of Connecticut itself faced a 14.6% increase in opioid deaths between 2019 and 2020. The death investigation process provides the opportunity to learn from preventable mortalities so that we can target interventions to reduce rates of early death. The direct line between public health officials and the death scene itself is the statement provided by the investigator or medical examiner. But unfortunately, in Connecticut, these statements are not standardized in their production. And while the voice of the attending expert is relevant to the narrative, in many ways, the lack of standardization contributes to patterns of missingness that we see in data. It is imperative that we aim to standardize the information that is collected on scene since preventing all missingness in data is not feasible. If we work with investigators and medical examiners, we can develop a tool like a dashboard that is easy to use and meets our needs in ensuring that data are as complete as possible. The standardized information made possible by the governor's budget recommendations will not only be invaluable to the OCME in improving the timeliness of reporting, but also will benefit many other state organizations which are engaged in overdose prevention in deciding how to implement risk reduction services. We request that this bill be amended to direct that some portion of the settlement funds be used for data collection, standardization, and analysis, recognizing that our work with the chief medical examiner aligns with abatement purposes one, two, four, and six outlined in House Bill 5044, section two. And having a complete picture of our target populations by means of standardized data is a necessary condition for developing effective interventions. In the long run, implementing harm reduction methodology without a robust understanding of which interventions best serve which populations will cost us more. So I'd like to thank the committee for the opportunity to testify today, and I'm happy to answer any questions or to provide any additional information. Thank you, Renee. And I'm just looking now and I don't see any hands raised. Uh, oh, I do see one. I didn't see it at first, um, Senator Anwar. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Renee, for your testimony. I had read your testimony as well. Um, you know, if you cannot measure it, then how do you follow and track it? I think there's a lot of truth to that. And, and uh, I, I, I agree with you. And I like the idea of the dashboard. Uh, we really have reached a point that uh, uh, as a state, we should have a dashboard of how much Narcan has been used, how many people are in the hospital, how many are in rehab, and, and how many are in, uh, in prison. Uh, with, with respect to some of these aspects and what kind of treatments are being provided. Because we, as we hopefully start to come out of this, uh, the current pandemic, we can probably put all of our resources into the opioid epidemic, which predates the pandemic and is exacerbated further by the pandemic. And, and it's probably an opportunity where we do have some resources that we can put in the right place. So I, I, I like that idea of the dashboard. And I think our public Department of Public Health has um, some of this. But are you, as, as a public health student, were you thinking that that um, a university affiliation and collaboration in some of this data uh, work is what you were 
exploring? Yes, yeah. So there is actually a team um, working through the Yale School of Public Health and the Yale School of Medicine right now um, in combining uh, data sources and kind of working to standardize this uh, between uh, the academic institutions and government agencies um, so that we kind of have a better data pool from which to, to draw um, in analysis. So I think that there's ample opportunity in uh, academic setting to be able to get this done, especially because um, there's a lot of interdisciplinary effort being made in this direction right now with respect to kind of public health data management more broadly in the context of the COVID epidemic, but also recognizing that um, a lot of opioid related mortalities have been exacerbated during this time frame, and we need an accurate way of kind of capturing what what sort of trends we've been seeing in order to be able to better adapt moving forward. So I think to answer your question, yes, there's there's a good space right now um, for development in the um, academic affiliation area within um, universities and with government agencies. And we'd be excited to kind of develop this collaboration. The, 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 the area which we are somewhat blinded to as a state and, and maybe as a, even as the government is um, majority of the people with the commercial insurance who are seeking help and who do not get the help uh, is this part of the challenge that we have that's part of the puzzle that has we've not been able to overcome and, and, and help the insurance industry recognize that there it's prevention if you actually are able to address the issue because the, the management of these patients in the intensive care unit is far more than what it is in the outpatient setting. About a, a few days in the ICU would take care of the entire health care that they would need uh, from prevention perspective. And, and access to that data alone is, is also missing for us. Um, I think um, it, it's worthy to pursue this. This is not the only bill on opioids. There will be more bills as well. So there is an opportunity to to look at the dashboard strategy in some respects, at least uh, I know that uh, the Department of Public Health has their own dashboard, but I think um, having that access to others and in the policy arena would be worthy to look at. Thank you for your testimony. I truly appreciate it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Anwar. And I do uh, also recognize Representative Parker. Thank you, Madam Chair. Hey, Renee, thanks for being here with us today. Um, appreciate your testimony. And, and as Dr. Anwar said, uh, we are working on another bill related to this, this session, and we've been specifically thinking about data collection and linking data sets. I'd appreciate if you could uh, follow up with me so that we could connect and talk about that. I'd love to work your ideas further into that. Um, so, so we'll try to connect with you one way or the other. For now, my question is, um, what I heard you say was that you'd like to see that this bill 5044, make sure that we reference using funds for data collection. And I'm just wondering in the bill itself, I see mm -hmm. language, I don't know, forgive me, this is overly specific at this point, um, but that reference is down on line 116, <clears throat> using funds for one or more publicly available data interfaces managed by the commissioner. Um, do you feel like that section is insufficient or um, is there a more specific uh, language you'd like to see in there in terms of, because because my understanding is that the funds are able to be used to track what you're saying, but maybe I'm misunderstanding. Yeah, no, that's a totally, totally a fair question. Um, I do refer to, um, I think that is abatement purpose number six that you're referring to yeah, right now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so in terms of data collection, I, I can recognize that this language is definitely inclusive of, I guess, that kind of end goal. Um, I'm maybe stuck on the standardization portion of the data collection process itself. Um, I would argue that the language used in this bill at the current time is just not sufficient in terms of the standardization component. Um, certainly like that's open to discussion. Um, I think that maybe that might be getting a little bit into the weeds, but um, this standardization with respect to the reporting process um, from the perspective of the investigators or medical examiners that are actually attending on scene um, would kind of accrue us the best pool of data or the most detailed pool of data really. So that standardization is really the most important component for us. Um, and that would look kind of like, uh, you know, in, in, to follow along the dashboard example, like if we had drop down fields pertaining to specific kind of details that we are interested in tracking, one of those could be 
uh, intravenous drug use. We're specifically very interested in, in patterns concerning IV drug use on scenes. Um, so what that might look like would be like a standard kind of the examiner arrives on scene, there's the field marked IV in the dashboard, they click the drop down field of IV, and then they're able to say um, either in their own words or through like a, a category of subfields, they can say the uh, that a needle was found on scene or not at all, or in the decedent's hand or, you know, what, what have you, so that we get really that fine grain level of detail that we're looking for. And I think that that becomes very difficult to um, achieve without a proper standardization process, just because there's, you know, a lot that goes into providing like a personalized kind of statement from the point of the investigator and the medical examiner that they already have a lot of responsibility on their plates. We'd really like to just make this process as easy as possible for uh, the people attending the scene, but also for us later. Um, so in that respect, that's kind of more of the language that I would be referring to um, in, in terms of the bill amendment. But I, I completely recognize that the, the bill does mention data collection um, in that area, yeah. You know, that's, that's really helpful. As a not public health expert or practitioner, um, I just wanted to confirm, does the language concept of standardized data, is that meaningful in the field or is there another way of discussing what you're hoping to get at that would actually improve mm. this language? I'm just trying to be specific. Um, I'm wondering, I'm, I'm not sure like I'm, at, I'm that I'm understanding your question. So with respect to like the this term itself of standardization or- Sure. Or, like if, the, yeah. if that word was put in there, would that make this stronger from your perspective? I, I believe so. Um, at and least would from, that be meaningful to someone else to know what when they read that what that word means? Right. Um, I think that specific, like if we want to get into the specifics of it, uh, I would be maybe we could follow up more later. But <laughs> I appreciate right, your right. quick thought on it for now. Yeah. Um, I would be inclined to say something along the lines of uh, standardization of the collection process. That would be really meaningful for for me to read. Um, having work in data analysis, because then I yeah. know that the data source that I'm pulling from is kind of consistent across. Um, across the state it's not comfortable at thanks so much for it's that i'd love to keep the conversation thank you for the indulgence madam chair i appreciate it and uh, thank, thank you for you your so time thank you i uh now i'm not seeing any other hands at this point so uh thank you very much for your testimony here renee and um i think uh i have to check and see who's next because i yeah I think we had uh, number 72 join us. Have you uh, promoted Dita? Uh, okay, well, I don't, I'm not getting a spot, so I think I will. Hi. Oh, hi. Can you hear me? You go. Yes, we can, Dita. Go ahead. Hi, Senator. How are you? Good to see uh, you. Thank you so well, much. <laughs> <laughs> yes, good to hear. See you all. Uh, thank you so much. I don't for know if you, you may not realize, but your camera is not on. Oh, it's not. Uh, how do I? Oh, here we go. Can here you go. see me now? Yes. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, honorable representatives, commissioners, and uh, leaders of the state. Uh, my name is Dita Bargava, and I'm testifying in support of House Bill 5044. I appreciate the many leaders who have tenaciously fought to contain the opioid epidemic that has plagued our state and who have worked tirelessly to form this bill. In addition, I'm grateful for the fight against big pharmaceuticals and the litigation proceeds that will bring much needed funds for prevention, treatment, and recovery to our state. But sadly, the outcome of this litigation is not a victory. Over 1 million people have died in our country due to opioid addiction over the last two decades. The blood of these victims is on the hands of greedy corporations who deceive the public on the addictive nature of opioids and flooded our communities with them. And one such victim was my son, Alec Pelletier, who died unwittingly of fentanyl poisoning on his 26th birthday in 2018 while living in a sober home in Canaan, Connecticut. Uh, as a teen, Alec suffered from a mild bipolar condition and was self-medicating first with easily available opioids, then with heroin. In the end, Alec wanted nothing more than to live a life of sobriety, empowered by the love of his family and friends. 
During Alex's seven-year struggle with addiction, my husband and I desperately searched for the proper treatment for him. Alex spent months at different treatment centers focused on his recovery. Sadly, there was little to no transition plan offered to him at every release. Without the necessary support, the insidious disease of addiction was overwhelmingly difficult to manage. The frustrating experience with navigating treatment centers prompted me to introduce a shatterproof program called Atlas to the state of Connecticut in conjunction with DMS, which will help hold treatment centers to a high, higher standard of care and aid families in finding quality care. Alex's death was a tragedy for our family and our communities. As a young man, he had so much to offer with his entire life ahead of him as a future taxpayer, husband, and father. He supported many of his friends who leaned on him through their struggles. We have senselessly lost countless young lives like Alec, thousands in the state of Connecticut over the last several years. It is not only a moral obligation to find solutions to the opioid crisis, but a social and economic one. Our young are dying and life expectancy is dropping due, due, due to the opioid pandemic. The public health crisis has severe long-term consequences for the future of our state and country. HP 5044 will, will provide the necessary guidelines on using funding towards this crisis. Every dollar must be used impactfully. And for that, I encourage the use of evidence-based models for prevention, treatment, and recovery. Please consider the principles for the use of funds from the opioid litigation published by Johns Hopkins and Bloomberg School of Public Health. Additionally, I would like to emphasize three crucial and bold consideration for the funds. Expand, focus, expand on harm reduction programs for the use of MAT, methadone clinics, and even safe injection sites, including mobile ones, where people can be kept alive long enough and encouraged to seek treatment. Education, expand youth programs and institute mandatory K-12 social emotional learning education. There are evidence-based K-12 life skills programs that have reduced substance use disorder by up to 75%. Those are numbers that we cannot ignore. Additionally, fund programs, effective programs that warn kids about the dire dangers of illicit substances such as fentanyl. Introduce a comprehensive plan to reduce the scourge of fentanyl plaguing our state, including harsher penalties for high-level dealers of this poison. Fentanyl, as you all know, was... Mm -hmm. Your time is almost up. If you could please summarize. Okay, sure. Thank you. Fentanyl was responsible for 85% of the deaths in Connecticut over the last few years. Lastly, to reduce stigma, I have traveled the state organizing opioid roundtables with legislators, the DEMAS commissioner, public health officials, paramedics, and families. Through these forums, my journey as a grieving parent and my work across the state in partnership with Shatterproof and a board member of Connecticut Women's Consortium, I'm confident that I can add value to the committee that will oversee the appropriation of these litigations funds. And as such, I ask to be considered a voting member of the committee. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dita. And, um, you know, I've, I've had the opportunity to hear your story before I remember when your son died. And uh, I just want to thank you for your service and for your willingness to share your story. I know it's, it's always difficult. Um, so I, I do see that uh, Representative Steinberg, Chairman Steinberg has a question. So Chairman Steinberg. Thank you, ma'am. Vice Chair. Um, Dita, it's good to see you. And, and I also wish to uh, thank you for all of your hard work, uh, turning the tragedy of your son into a real positive on behalf of so many people here in the state of Connecticut. And I, 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 I don't think you could be much more specific as to all the things we need to work on uh, once this, this font of funding becomes available to spend it wisely and to have the greatest impact on, on addressing the crisis that we have and hopefully avoiding people getting on the path that your son did, because we all know uh, that there are individual differences and some people are simply more susceptible to addiction than others. And we need to head it off the pass to any degree we can. I don't know if this committee has any role to play in assigning people to this new working group, but uh, certainly your, your past work has been uh, rec well recognized, and I'm sure there'll be uh, opportunities for you to contribute in any number of different ways. So we look forward to your ongoing involvement, and thank you for everything you've done to this point. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you for being here, and thank you for everything you're doing. 
Thank I know you. it's appreciated in my community and and by the and from the people I know that have had similar losses like yours. So thank you. I don't see I appreciate any, it. I don't see any other hands. Um, so I think we will move to our next uh, person, although it is 359. And if Chairman Steinberg is ready, I know you were going to take over at four, but uh, I'll permit you to take over now if you're ready. Wow, I'm a whole minute early. I, I don't know if I'm ready. Um, uh, let's, uh, I'm trying to see who's next up. Is that? Uh, I'll help you out. It's, it's uh, Dr. Julia Rosenberg, Julia Rosenberg. All right, I, I almost got it right. Dr. Rosenberg, thank you for being here. Uh, please provide your testimony. Thank you so much. To the distinguished members of the Public Health Committee, my name is Dr. Julia Rosenberg. I'm a pediatrician and clinician scientist who works in New Haven. I'm testifying today in support of House Bill 5045, an act reducing lead poisoning. As pediatricians, we know that there is no safe level of lead for children. Lead poisoning can result in a myriad of health problems for our youngest residents. At high levels, it causes neurologic abnormalities and even death. At other levels, it results in cognitive impairment, hyperactivity, developmental delays, and poor academic performance. For too long, lead poisoning has disproportionately affected the underserved communities in our state, where there is a plethora of old deteriorating housing built before 1978, one of the primary sources of lead poisoning. We have a state lead screening program that identifies children who have already been exposed to lead, but we don't always have the means to correct it. I'm very appreciative of our recent speaker's discussion with Senator Anwar and Representative Parker about the importance of having accessible data to manage health. When it comes to childhood lead poisoning, we have the data. Now we must act. In our city of New Haven, where over half of the housing stock is pre-1950, in just one year, 290 children under six years of age had lead levels higher than five micrograms per deciliter. That's according to the 2017 uh, Department of Public Health report. Without lowering the threshold for epidemiological inspections at these lower lead levels, families cannot know the source of lead poisoning. It is most commonly lead paint, dust, and soil, but other causes may be identified in a home inspection. I have colleagues who found other sources of lead poisoning from spices to food, to cookware, to toys, vitamins, and even cosmetics. Remove the source and lead levels decrease. And the effects on children's growth, development, and ultimately their future ability to thrive will be mitigated. Now is the time to act. Inspecting homes to isolate the source of lead and eradicate it not only benefits children in that home now, but will prevent the poisoning of children living in those homes in the future. Not only would there be important health benefits for our children by identifying and eradicating lead sources, but as Mayor Elliker highlighted from New Haven this morning, we would also have economic benefits by decreasing costs of special education for children in our state. This environmental injustice is preventable. We need to take the initiative to protect Connecticut's children from the detrimental effects of lead poisoning. HB 5045 will help to make that possible. Please support this bill and thank you for your time. Thank you, doctor. I have a question for you. Uh, since you're sort of on the front lines of this, when you encounter a family that comes into the office and it's clear that one of the children uh, seems to have excessive levels, what's the, the, the traditional method of, of counseling and, and uh, referral that you need to be involved with? Um, I would imagine most parents are initially very concerned when they hear about this. And obviously, as we've heard in previous testimony, you know, lead's hard to get rid of once it's in the body. So right. uh, what are the next steps when somebody comes into your office? So there are, are several kind of layers to the protection that we're able to offer to families. Um, and as you know, lead screening is part of routine care for children um, uh, in the first few years of life. And when we do find a positive screen and in general, we do provide general guidance for ways to avoid lead. Education is key. It's one of the most important parts. Um, so, you know, talking about the sources of lead, asking families if they know of lead paint in the homes or other potential exposures, discussing the fact that it could be in soil, asking about if there are any 
of the kind of more common causes that we might see, such as certain cosmetics um, or certain imported items that may sometimes carry lead, um, and talking about how to kind of clean surfaces in ways that um, also reduce the ability to bring up more lead dust. So there's a wide range of general anticipatory guidance we're able to provide, regardless of if we find elevated lead in a child, because we know that the risk of being exposed to potentially lead paint dust um, or other sources is there, especially in our state, um, but without the ability to really um, be able to investigate the true source, often we don't know for sure what the source is for an individual patient. So just to follow up on that, and I'm, uh, I'm gratified to hear there is sort of a standard protocol for when you identify the problem. Uh, are you obliged to make any referral to the health district or is there sort of a, a chain of responsibility that happens after you identify a case? Absolutely. Um, so there is kind of connection with our, where I work, we have a lead clinic um, that helps oversee this and we'll see um, when there are elevated cases of lead and, and be able to help to guide the families. Um, the city also gives the, fam the family information as well. But you, uh, any pediatrician would know to get the health district involved uh, at some point so that if they're the ones with the tool to do the investigation, they can do so. Um, I will get the exact answers about the full chain of command in order to get that, but we do have um, lead clinics uh, within our major cities that are able to help and make sure that these follow-ups occur. Sorry, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. Uh, Senator Anwar. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Dr. Rosenberg, for your testimony and the work that you do. Um, earlier, the Commissioner of Public Health talked about the, the, the Department of Public Health is coming up with a map that actually oversees all the, the lead levels that are, and the lead risk areas for the state. Um, and, and that was one of the, the strategies that they're looking at that, that will help uh, the, the Department of Public Health to see where the investments and coordination may need to happen in collaboration with the towns. Uh, the, the way I see some of the challenges is that the indoor air issues and respiratory asthma and children and, and allergies in children, there is a big overlap between both high lead levels in the same households as well as uh, respiratory illnesses. Um, and are you aware of any combined programs where you can get much more mileage because somebody's going to go to to those homes, they will assess those places, but they will look at it only with a, for lack of a better word, tunnel vision of lead. But but that tunnel vision, if it's changed to other aspects, we can get a lot more mileage. Any thoughts on that? I really appreciate how you're highlighting the, the overall environmental injustices that we see in our state, where often if there is um, an older house, it could be also where there's exposure to other sorts of allergens, um, sources that cause asthma as well. Um, I think that finding ways to mitigate um, um, all of these environmental injustices would be another really wonderful benefit for, for the children of our state. Thank you so much for your testimony. We, we look forward to working with you as we get better understanding of the, the next steps. Thank you. Thank you, I appreciate it. Thank you, and, and you're right that we should be addressing all the contaminants in the home. Uh, I hope we can stretch the money enough to make it work. Um, let's see, next up we have number 76, Alice Rosenthal. I thank you for letting me testify today. Distinguished members of the Public Health Committee, um, my name is Alice Rosenthal and I'm testifying today in favor of HB 5045, an act reducing lead poisoning. I'm a senior staff attorney with the Center for Children's Advocacy. We are a public interest law firm representing Connecticut's most vulnerable children and youth. In particular, I coordinate our medical legal partnership project in Greater New Haven where I work in collaboration with the pediatricians in our community to address legal issues impacting children's health, including special education advocacy, benefits, and poor housing conditions. I also work um, closely with the LED Regional Center here at Yale um, and often get referrals of families whose kids have had lead poisoning and would like assistance in getting the landlord to remediate the um, and and do abatement on the lead in their home. 
We've already heard a lot of testimony today supporting this bill, so I'll try to be brief. Um, but first, I'd just like to applaud the governor for making lead poisoning a priority this year and specifically for allocating the $70 million towards this extremely important issue. I would say that many of us have been trying to get this bill through the legislature for years, and I think the added $70 million really will help push it through this year. This is the time to pass this extremely important legislation. You've heard over and over again today the devastating and lifetime impacts of lead poisoning on children. And I would ask all of you to keep that in the forefront of your minds as you think about passing or moving this legislation forward. It really is about the kids um, and they need your support in helping that to protect them. Safety 45 presents the Connecticut legislature with an opportunity to greatly enhance the lead programs, children's, families, pediatricians, advocates like myself. We are all greatly hampered um, to ensure that children are lead safe without updating our laws and changing them to be in line with the science. As a legal advocate, I just wanna highlight the realities of the low-income families I work with, mostly renters who are impacted by lead poisoning. Many of these families I work with don't have the ability to just simply move if their child has lead poisoning. They rely on their landlords to remediate the apartment so that they can keep their children safe. And the state laws are the ones that impact those. When I get a referral of a family here in New Haven, in New Haven, we have ordinances that support investigations and encouraging landlords to fix it at five. But when I get a referral for a family from West Haven or Hamden or just over the border, those laws aren't in place and I have to rely on the state laws and those families, it's devastating to tell them that we don't have the same legal um, support behind us to get the landlord to remediate. Local and state laws give us that leverage to ensure that children are safe from lead poisoning in their homes. By passing Excuse this me, bill- Ms. Rosenthal, please um, summarize. Your time is almost up. Thank you. By passing this bill, Connecticut will bring its lead poisoning lines laws in line with HUD safety safe housing rule and also join Maine, Rhode Island, New Hampshire, um, New Jersey in updating our laws to what the science tells us about children's health and safety. This bill is long overdue and I strongly urge you to support 5045 to ensure our children are safe and have good health outcomes. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. And yes, as usually is the case, $70 million makes a big difference in being able to get things done. I just want to follow up on your comment with regard to the difference between, say, the New Haven community and the rules in place there and the surrounding communities. Would you suggest that we need to do anything beyond what we have in this bill in order to assure that uh, uh, um, landlords across the state uh, fully comply with the need to remediate? I think the way the bill is written is um, will give us as advocates the tools to ensure that the health departments um, can push the landlords through. They create when they when the they get notice of a high lead level, they then go out and inspect, and then they work with the landlords to create a lead remediation plan. Um, and so, by lowering this to five, it's going to allow them to do that for much more kids. And like a lot of people have talked about, the earlier you do that and get out there and help to fix it, the um, quicker the children's lead starts going down. And so I think the bill is written well for that. I would encourage us to think about for the future though, about prevention, because we are still using children as sort of the barometer of whether there's lead in the home. Massachusetts has a bill in place that, um, Landlords do have to show a lead-free apartment or, or that they do have lead in the home before they rent to people so that renters, especially families, know what they're getting themselves into. Um, and I wish that we could do something more preventatively so that we can stop kids from being poisoned at all. Well, you'd like to submit some proposed language around those lines. It's something we would take a look at. Thank you. I don't see any further questions. Thank you for your testimony and you, for your patience and waiting for that opportunity. We move next to Maureen Deenan, followed by Ben Gant. Uh, thank you very much. I am Maureen Sullivan Deenan, Senator Abrams, Representative Steinberg, Senator Summers and Wang, Representative Pettit, and honorable members of the Public Health Committee. I am Maureen Sullivan Deenan. Uh, I'm an attorney and I'm the immediate uh, past director of Haven, which is the health 
Assistance Program for Professionals in the State of Connecticut. I'm here today to testify regarding House Bill 5046, an act adopting the Interstate Medical Licensure Compact and the Psychology Interjurisdictional inter Compact on condition that there's some language uh, changes that we reference in our written testimony that are important that need to be made to it. And also that any funding uh, deficit that this causes to Haven is identified and um, restored. Um, we are very grateful that the legislature when they created the work groups for um, exploring compacts in Connecticut included Haven and representatives of Haven in these work groups. What we found is that um, mental health and mental health for professionals across the country is really, there was a lot of disparity between the five compacts that were under consideration. Even with the two compacts that are before you today, the medical and the psychology, you'll see that there's a difference in how the professions are treated and it's going to cause an impact on how HAVEN um, functions and operates. So the medical licensure compact actually has the least uh, impact regarding um, access to mental health resources and um, the use of Haven's um, services. We are very concerned regarding confidentiality, how records will be accessed, maintained. And you'll note that in the medical license compact, we want it to be very clear that a subpoena that's issued by another state on a physician in Connecticut or on a group in Connecticut has to comply with the laws of the state of Connecticut. That's extremely important to Haven because when you wrote the law that created Haven, you set very strict parameters on um, how a court will deal with a request for Haven's records by subpoenas. And we wanna be sure that that's honored. The other aspect that we're looking for is notice. What we have found with these compacts is you have this model language, right? That's before you as a representatives, but then there's all these rules behind the compact that very much drive how the um, compact operates. Haven doesn't have the resources in the compact. Commission doesn't have to notify Haven of any rule changes. And so we would like the Department of Public Health to just let us know that there's a rule being considered to be changed so that Haven would have an opportunity to be heard and to request um, uh, the, that right if it impacts the, the uh, population that we're serving. Excuse the, me, but your time is almost up. If you would Okay, the that. psychology compact revision is the most critical because the psychology compact um, actually creates two tracks within Haven. One track that is a voluntary referral where they get the confidentiality that we currently provide to them. But the other track is if they are referred, say, by the Department of Public Health or if they're known to the Department of Public Health, then they do lose those compact privileges. The re, um, language revision that we requested, and you'll see it on the page four of my testimony, and my name is spelled differently. So if you're looking for my testimony, it's D-I-N-N-A-N. -N -N. Um, that makes clear, right, that there is that voluntary track that's available to the psychologist. If such a voluntary track were not available, Haven would not be supporting it. We're also asking for the same notice provisions. We understand physical therapists, um, that there was a rule that was implemented late in the work group meetings and they feel that they may have a compact that's more similar to the psychologist. We are very open to talking with them about it, taking a look at it and if we can create something similar. And again, I wanna just underscore how important the funding is um, that we need it to be restored and we need the state to identify so that it's a reliable, secure um, funding source and that there should be parity among the professionals. Thank you. Thank you and for all the work that Haven does to fill a very important role. I, I would ask a question about funding, but I see I have two doctors here who are probably going to ask you about that, and I don't want to steal their thunder. So let's see if I'm right about this. I'll do what Senator Onward did. First up is Representative Pettit, followed by Senator Onward. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, to embarrass Mrs. Dinan here, uh, Maureen, thank you very much for your service for all these years to Haven, helping professionals in a wide range of, of areas with a variety of problems over many, many years. You really kept the organization afloat and, and did marvelous things there, so thank you. Uh, we've had some discussion behind the scenes on the money issue, 
-hmm. and have talked about whether we should go to ten dollars, which is, in my way of thinking is cheap, cheap, cheap. Uh, you know, an extra the ten dollars is nineteen cents a cents a week for the services that people have access to. I think it's worth it. I wonder what your reaction to a, a slight increase in that is. I think we started at five, but we've never gone up since then. Uh, Dr. Pettis, thank you for your kind words, you know, always. Um, I think this $10 is critical on two levels. One, back in 2015, when we um, requested funding for Haven, we actually asked for 10, and then it got cut to five. And so we needed it then, we were hoping to do it, but Haven's always operated on a shoestring. Um, I think $10 would enable them to do what we need to do for the professions and um, have the purity within the professions. There's been no raise in it. So that $5, as you know, isn't worth the same, right? And like everyone else, it's we're Haven, Haven, Haven struggling. Um, the other reason though that the $10 came up is um, before the general law committee, the pharmacists have asked to become part of Haven. And we had said to the pharmacists, if you want to become part of Haven, that means we have to report to the Department of Consumer Protection. There's a different level of administrative responsibilities. We knew with these compacts, these two tracks, we were going to be dealing with those additional administrative burdens. Um, and so we calculated uh, the fee for them. They weren't happy with it. They felt that they should be on parity with the other professions. And so $10 seems to be the figure that people the pharmacists has to have, have also discussed that we think really would um, give Haven a budget so that we could provide the services that we need to do for the professionals in the state of Connecticut. And I do wanna to add to this committee, you know, COVID has brought out this, right, this understanding of mental health and to a certain degree, one would say, oh, well, it should be making it less stigmatizing, but for the professionals, it's actually made it more. You've got billboards where they're supposed to be heroes. Um, you have all these expectations of them. And so if they are feeling weak or they're not feeling like a hero, there's been a lot of shame and a lot of stigma going with it. The Haven referrals increased by 62% from January to March of this year compared to last year. Um, and that's why as much as I would love to be retired, I've stayed connected to Haven because there's just so much work to be done. So we would be very grateful for that support and funding. Beautiful, that, that sounds like you. And thank you for your comments on the uh, privacy of the records and the like, and that'll be important details that our LCO attorneys will wanna know about. But I will yield to uh, Senator Anwar. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Maureen. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Senator Anwar. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Ms. Dinan, for your work and, and what Haven has done the last so many years. Uh, um, Haven is actually a model that many in the rest of the country try to follow, and and, and you, you and 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 the work that has gone on has been amazing. And I think that is going to be where there will be a little bit of a challenge from this bill is that others may not even be aware of the kind of work that goes on in the state of Connecticut to uh, ensure protection and and uh, um, safety of of uh, all the professionals. So I I'm so glad about your testimony because. Uh, I felt that was something that was missing that everybody needs to know that in order to have this work, we will have to empower Haven to be able to do the work that needs to be done as we try to share um, the clinical skills that we so badly need in our states, um, state right now. And, and the second part uh, I, I was gonna ask you and you already touched on that was the pharmacist bill. I think uh, uh, Representative Steinberg's second question was going to be about that today, that, that Haven uh, will be uh, looking at, uh, we, we will be looking as a bill for, for pharmacists to be part of it. And, and when I first saw the bill, I said they are not because uh, they should be. And, and, and I'm glad that's going to hopefully happen this session as well. Um, so again, cannot thank you enough for all that you have done and the people at Haven. Um, I know individuals uh, personally who have benefited and, and uh, you've been able to truly save lives through your work. So thank you for that. Well, thank you so very much. Um, you know, while these, um, while the psychology compact is not perfect, we are hoping that perhaps um, because there is at least that voluntary track that maybe with time we'll be able to provide education to some of the other states. 
and hopefully we will be able to get um, a closer following of our model. Um, I chaired the Federation Accountability, Consistency and Excellent Program for the Federation of Physician Health Programs. And I think um, the more we can get other states to follow uh, this type of a rubric, the better off we'll be. Regarding the pharmacists, I agree with you. They're important members of the healthcare team. They were not included in 2007 because they weren't under the Department of Public Health. And at that time, no one really knew what the program was going to be. So I'm grateful for the trust and the collaboration that we've built with the Department of Public Health, Department of Consumer Protection and the General Assembly. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't see any further questions, Maureen, again, thank you. Uh, we will look at your testimony and the changes you recommend uh, very seriously. And we hope you stay invested in the process. Thank you so much, appreciate it. Uh, next up is Ben Gann, followed by Marissa McDougall. Okay, thanks. Uh, thank you, members of the committee. My name is Ben Gann. I'm a director at the American Chemistry Council, or ACC, here today representing ACC's North American Flame Retardant Alliance, or NAFRA. NAFRA represents the leading producers of flame retardant technologies. And I am here today in opposition to SB 255 for two main reasons. First, regulating chemicals as a single class, as is proposed for children's products, is not based on the current state of the science. Not all flame retardants are the same. They are a diverse set of chemicals that vary in property and molecular structure. This finding is backed up by the National Academy of Sciences, which found that for one class of flame retardants, organohalogens, that they cannot be treated as a single class for purposes of assessment. Key differences between flame retardants are also highlighted within assessments conducted by regulatory agencies such as EPA. Second, fire safety is an important public health concern and flame retardants are an important tool to help reduce fires, fire deaths, and property damage. They are used by product manufacturers to meet flammability standards and performance requirements. Since the introduction of strict fire safety standards in the US, which includes the use of flame retardants, residential fires have been reduced by nearly 50% over the last 40 years. Fire safety also remains a very real concern in Connecticut. In 2019, there was a residential fire every 96 minutes, resulting in 116 injuries, 22 deaths, and $65.8 million in property losses. Flame retardants can also dramatically affect overall fire conditions, including delaying ignition development and smoke generation, while also increasing the time to escape and time available for emergency personnel response. In addition, careful consideration should be given to the unintended consequences that can occur from restrictions that are not science-based. Take the example of California Technical Bulletin 117, which took effect in 20, 2015 and removed the open flame test requirement for upholstered furniture. Although TB117 kept the smolder-only portion of the test, the revised standard can be met without the use of flame retardants. With that as background, according to NFPA, from 2015 to 2019, although upholstered furniture was the first item ignited in only 1% of house fires, it accounted for 16% of fire-related deaths and 6% of fire-related injuries. This is a marked increase over the five-year period between 1980 and 1984, when stricter fire standards began to be implemented. This data provides appropriate context for SB 255 and how policies meant to protect public safety can have unintended consequences. In conclusion, NAFRA supports a robust, transparent, and science-based regulatory system that provides both strong fire protection and chemical safety. We look forward to additional opportunities to provide information on this important issue. Thank you for your time, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Gann. I see we have a question from Representative Zupkis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon, evening almost, uh, Mr. Dan. I've... Uh, <laughs> I've had this bill come before me quite a few times, even when I was on the Children's Committee um, a few years ago. And um, I have the same questions and I believe probably nothing has changed. Um, isn't it true that flame retardants delay ignition, ignition of the fire and helps for people to escape an emergency? Well, well, that's right. So there's been work done by a uh, group such as Southwest Research Institute down in Texas, where they did a uh, comparative burn where they had a room that had flame retardants and one that didn't. And, you know, it might be exactly what you would expect. So, so it took longer uh, for uh, flames to, you know, to ignite, uh, it took longer for flashover, there was less total smoke. And it also, I think, importantly, uh, allowed for more time to, for 
you know, if you were in a room like that to be able to escape and avoid that flashover event. Um, and then also would give uh, additional time for emergency personnel, such as firefighters to uh, put out the fire before it gets uh, too bad. Mm -hmm. um, and some people might say, you know, it's the chemicals and that's bad for folks. And of course, especially if we have them on our children, we certainly no one would want to put anything dangerous on their child. Um, we would only want to protect them. And so I've always, um, since I've heard this bill, it's been to help protect our children, especially um, in their clothes. And aren't these all regulated by the government, the federal government, all of these flame retardants? Oh, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, sorry, okay. you just froze up on me for That's a second, okay. I apologize. Did you hear my question? No, could you just repeat that? I'm sorry. I, I was talking about flame retardants in children's clothing. And mm -hmm. of course, none of us would want to ever put something harmful on our children or in right. our houses, quite honestly. And um, I've always, uh, you know, as going through this bill and talking to lots of people, it's a safety issue. Um, and aren't all of these chemicals approved and gone through regulations through the federal government? Yeah, that's that's right. So so a lot of these there's already flame retardants under review by EPA um, as part of updates to the Toxic Substance Control Act, which is the main uh, law governing uh, chemicals in this country. So there's some in risk management. There are several that are currently under risk evaluation. I'm involved in some of that uh, work, working with companies to help answer questions that EPA is asking us. So you know it's a much more rigorous process. I know there's been some questions about that from critics, but um, I assure you that it is a much, we get test orders, we have to comply with these test orders, we have to provide information. Uh, there's a lot of information that uh, industry already had that we've shared with them. So yeah, that's, there's quite a rigorous process there. And my, my last question and thought is, um, do you feel that this bill um, is rooted in scientific study? You know, we always want to follow the science. So yeah, so I think, un unfortunately, in its present form, it sort of deviates, I, I think it would be hard to sort of say that. So, uh, you know, as I was mentioning earlier with the National Academy of Sciences, right, they've rejected this class-based approach uh, to restrictions, which uh, is being done or is being proposed uh, with respect to children's products, right? They've, they've said, you got to go sort of a level down or even two levels down to sort of better characterize as part of a risk assessment and risk characterization regarding these chemicals. And so, um, you know, in this particular case, uh, you would be restricting the use of chemicals simply for function, right? So it's not even about so much uh, what their toxicological profiles are. It's simply that if they suppress fire or ignition, that we should restrict them, right? And so that is, I think, not rooted in the science. Thank you. Thank you. I would happen to agree. And I think things that are regulated through the government, us not wanting to put harmful chemicals or toxins in our kids or our houses, um, there's a balance between that and the safety. And to me, this has gone through the safety and the science. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. Sure, you're welcome. Uh, Mr. Gay, I have a few questions as well. Um, sure. The focus here, obviously, are the toxins released when these products combust. Uh, would you, first of all, are you in agreement that when they do combust, they do create toxins that are dangerous to anybody in contact? I, I don't, I, I, I think I would sort of add to that, right? So all smoke is going to be toxic. So once you have a combustion event like that, to be able to precisely sort of single out whether it's flame retardants, another chemical, I think is very difficult. So you are, I don't want to put words in your mouth. So I want to be right. very careful. You are disputing the concept inherent in this bill that the byproducts released from combustion of these products is uh, particularly harmful and dangerous. I'd maybe answer it this way with, with a study, if I might. So, so uh, National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health uh, did a, a fire a long a long term study regarding firefighter and uh, incidents of cancer. And so, you know, one piece of this that might not surprise everyone is that uh, firefighters had uh, an elevated risk of cancer versus the general population. What it didn't find was that flame retardants were the cause of that increased risk in cancer or that chemicals generally were that uh, 
cause of that cancer. Uh, what they found was specifically the only causality they could find was that they were more, firefighters were more likely to get mesothelioma, which makes sense, right? Since it was uh, used, asbestos was used in uh, insulation of homes. And, but outside of that, it's, it's hard to isolate what the exact cause is. So I, again, I just wanted to be clear. Obviously, these products were created with the best of intentions to reduce the risk of, of fire spreading and trying to keep things manageable. Um, yet, with all the best of intentions, there are literally tens of thousands of chemicals we produce in the United States all the time that have not been adequately tested for their carcinogenic, endocrine, or other uh, uh, results. The impression I had here is that these products have been tested, and that was the rationale behind this legislation. And that is why a good number of other states have passed such legislation. I'm having problems reconciling what you're saying with the seeming urgency that have led any number of states to try to limit the, uh, the presence of these uh, chemicals in a variety of products. Yeah, so so I think kind of, you know, without sort of speculating too much as to what in, in any particular legislative body is thinking on this matter, right, is I think that there um, has been some demonstration, right, that some of the legacy flame retardants that are, are no longer used in commerce, right, had some challenges regarding the health and safety profiles, and that some of their replacements uh, you know, and we've done, you know, I can think of ones where we've done green screen assessments. This has also been uh, found out by EPA as part of its work uh, with the design for the environment, specifically as it relates to furniture, that there are better performing ones, right? And there are legacy ones that, uh, you know, there were probably reasons they needed to be phased out. You know, this reminds me a lot. I'm getting this, this amazing deja vu experience. Uh, it seems to me we're having exactly this conversation about PFAS not long ago, and the word was we kept changing out the molecules so that uh, they did not, uh, they were not problematic from the law standpoint, and yet the new molecules weren't much better than the old molecules in terms of the dangers of PFAS. And it seems to me it was your organization who made pretty much the same testimony they've made today, that basically all the products we have now are fine. Um, yet there doesn't seem necessarily to be a track record to support that. So I'm gonna to continue to consider this bill very seriously. Um, I'm not sure that the track record of your organization has given me great confidence. Uh, Senator uh, Anwar. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, thank you, Mr. Gann, for your testimony. Uh, I think um, uh, Representative Steinberg said a lot of things that I was gonna uh, try to say, but can you just repeat for my band? I, I, I missed, uh, oh, can you tell me your title and who you represent? Please? Oh, sure. So, so I'm a director uh, in the Chemical Products and Technology Division at the American Chemistry Council. Uh, primary uh, uh, sort of role there is overseeing the, the work of the North American Flame Return Alliance, which is the you know, sort of comprised of the major flame retardant producers. I also do some work related, uh, there are several uh, flame retardants undergoing risk evaluation under TOSCA. So these are the 20 high priority chemicals. There are several flame retardants in there uh, and we're doing uh, currently under review by EPA and those are both have active test orders. So there's you no know, compliance work associated with that as well. Okay, and um, I, I, I if I heard you correct, you suggested that the flame retardants were, should not be a concern at all, is, is what you suggested initially, because they are quote unquote, protecting lives of the firefighters, unquote. Yeah, I, no, I wouldn't say that. I, I think, you know, we have to be careful, right? So, so we're trying to balance two competing priorities here, right? So, so um, right, there's the chemical safety aspect, right? That, that's trying to be balanced by this committee. With also, right, there is the role, I mean, even I think uh, uh, Representative Steinberg had sort of suggested, right, the fire safety aspect of this. And so, um, you know, the reason they're used is because they're, they're flame rip, flammability standards, usually that product ma manufacturers are trying to meet or exceed. And that's why they're uh, being used in the product. I mean, I would just, you know, just sort of just to add to that, you know, I don't think uh, product manufacturers are not in the habit of adding 
additional chemicals to their uh, products if they don't need to. So I think that there's sort of evidence there that, you know, they're used there to meet flammability standards first and foremost. Right. So, so basically um, you, you're implying that they are protecting firefighters. Yeah, I just, I just wouldn't say that. I, I don't think you can necessarily make any sort of, I think, conclusion as direct okay. as that. Yeah, I just don't think you can. Good. I, I wanted to clarify because uh, when I heard you first time, it almost suggested that it was um, suggested indirectly by you that, well, the flame retardants are safe for individuals and, and, and people. And, and, and my concern was, I said, well, wait, what? Uh, because uh, it's the firefighters who are saying, we want to be protected from these things. Uh, these things are killing us. Uh, and, and so that's exactly why I was trying to clarify. Uh, from, from your angle, uh, these are safer products and the people who interact with them uh, who are having cancers and, and uh, health and human services identifying and adding more of these as carcinogens and other EPA is looking at them and then considering them as carcinogens or probable carcinogen. And, and as you look at that, I know one of my colleagues said that till they see it black and white, it's a cancer causing thing within a matter of hours or whatever time frame that they would be happy with. Uh, they do not want to touch these chemicals, whereas the firefighters who are dying, they want these chemicals out of the, the way. So uh, this is the, the issue. And I, I know you're employed by a company whose responsibility is to keep these chemicals in the business, because obviously if, if we become the 14th state, uh, because 13 other states, I believe have, have said, we don't, they don't want this. If, if I don't know what the number is now because it's changing, but um, uh, that that's where I think, um, uh, I feel it's it's worthy to keep in mind when you have endocrine disruptors, when you have carcinogens, these are known carcinogens in the environment, and we are putting them uh, close to our children and, and, and also uh, high risk for the people who are interacting with these in combustible situations, they're getting cancers. Um, so I, I understand you, you have a job and I, 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 I do not envy your job at all because you're trying to uh, defend something which is, uh, very difficult to defend now uh, with, with some of the technology and the data that we have. And I know some people will defend you from the elected officials too. And I guess they have a difficult job too because they will have to uh, go back and say they support the firefighters and then they take pictures with the firefighters, but then they would want them to have carcinogens exposure. So they will have to reconcile that when they go to sleep. But, but um, I'm not convinced uh, with, with your presentation, but I, I, I've heard it. And I, I also would like to say that um, uh, not, not necessarily you, but, but people in your positions representing the organization that you represent have been selling us previous carcinogens that we are spending millions, if not billions of dollars across the country to clean up. Um, and and uh, it's, it's important to uh, look at the, the long-term implication to the society. So appreciate you coming in. Uh, uh, again, like I said, I don't envy you at all, and, but I, I'm not yet convinced. Uh, and, and I feel that we are somewhat obligated to continue to look at this seriously. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Gann. Before you leave, Mr. Gann, I wanted to follow up on one of the things you said. Uh, logically, manufacturers would not want to include chemicals that would be harmful and are only putting in chemicals that they believe are serving a purpose, such as flame retardants. So uh, the, the state by state incremental issue aside, why wouldn't your organization support the idea of labeling these products to indicate they may they contain a flame retardant, if indeed the manufacturer is only putting things in there that they think is a good thing to do? Yeah, so, so I think the challenge with that proposal is um, it's, it's incredibly broad, right? It's, it's, I think the product, I would just maybe just to be respectful of the proposal, I think the product scope is, you know, really does need to be thought about narrowing, right? So if you're going to apply it essentially effectively to all consumer products that are not children's products, um, and then you're, you know, given the compliance deadlines that are laid out in this particular legislation, there's not any consideration being given into whether 
what the potential ex of exposure is uh, for products that contain uh, flame retardants. So I think that's a piece of this, but I think also, uh, you know, there obviously, if you sort of move too aggressively, you can end up uh, like Rhode Island did, like Maine did, where you have to a few years later come in and have amendments to the bill to sort of help with the uh, compliance obligations. Well, thank you for that. We will look at those two states for the amendments they put together. And I would encourage you to offer us any uh, um, language you think we would appropriately narrow it rather than simply oppose it because uh, without your guidance, you may not like what the final product is. Um, so uh, I encourage you to, to continue to engage with us on this so that if we should go forward with this legislation, we get it as uh, close to appropriate as possible. And as I said, we will look at these other states to make sure that we do not repeat their mistakes. Thank you. Uh, I see no further questions. Next up, we have Marissa McDougall, followed by Karen Siegel. Hi, my name is Marissa McDougall. I am from New Horizons Village in Unionville, Connecticut. I'm here to testify on behalf of House Bill 5277 for diagnostic medical equipment. And I'd like to relate an experience for a mammogram that I had, where, as you can see, I am sitting in a power chair because I suffer from a disability, cerebral palsy, and I had to go into the exam room and stand in front of the imaging machine and the experience I had was I almost fell while I was getting the mammogram taken and that only, not only scared the bejesus out of me but also scared the bejesus out of the radiologist so I had to complete the exam sitting in a chair. Um, so thank you very much for your time. Well, Marissa, thank you for your testimony. Well, actually, I, that's a video. Here I am talking to her. Okay. Um, uh, clearly, I will engage with anybody, including nobody who can speak back. Um, thank you for that testimony. Next up is Karen Siegel, followed by John Brady. Good afternoon, Representative Steinberg, and Senator Anwar, and esteemed members of the Public Health Committee. My name is Karen Siegel. I'm testifying today on behalf of Health Equity Solutions, where I serve as the Director of Policy. Health Equity Solutions is a nonprofit organization with a statewide focus on promoting policies, programs, and practices that result in equitable healthcare access, delivery, and outcomes for all people in Connecticut. I'm here to express our support for House Bill 5045. Um, and for promoting healthy and lead safe homes. As a result of structural racism, lead poisoning disproportionately affects Black, Latino, Latina, and Asian children in Connecticut. Um, it's both a condition that's all too common and entirely preventable. Connecticut has an opportunity here to address the significant inequity in health by aligning state lead screening and intervention standards with federal guidance and funding lead remediation and abatement programs. Um, Connecticut currently adheres to an outdated CDC uh, threshold for lead poisoning and inspection. Um, an inspection and parental notification then do not occur until poisoning has already likely caused harm. So current standards mean that a poisoned child may continue to be exposed to lead even after a test shows that they have lead poisoning unless their family is able to identify and remediate the source of that poisoning on their own without support. I mean, this is especially true troubling for renters who have limited control over their housing conditions, and particularly so in a state with high housing costs that limit choices on, on where to live. Um, further, nearly three in four homes in Connecticut was built before lead was removed from paint in 1978. And we wanted to make a, a couple of quick recommendations, the first being aligning the triggers for intervention um, so that inspection occurs for all cases of lead poisoning by the end of the timeline established in the bill, which is 2025. Um, providing education and support for landlords and homeowners in high-risk cities to engage in lead remediation before poisoning occurs, and increasing public health campaigns to raise awareness about the need for lead screening and um, options for lead remediation to ensure these programs reach, reach more of Connecticut's residents 
Um, and I did just want to add in response to some questions that I heard earlier that, that um, I know of at least one example of a coordinated home visiting program run out of Connecticut Children's Hospital where when a home inspection is done, if it's done for lead and, and triggers for asthma, for example, are observed, then that also the family is also connected with those services. So I, I, I particularly am invested in the idea of simplifying for families how many times we're asking them to allow someone into their home but also in coordinating these programs so that remediation does happen before poisoning occurs. Um, so that is that is one option um, um, for doing that. And uh, thank you all very much for, for listening and I'm happy to answer any questions. Karen, uh, thank you for your testimony. Uh, to your point, I think we've heard a lot of testimony today focused on the importance of prevention and education, which clearly we can do a better job on knowing how prevalent lead is in so many homes across our state. Um, I continue to be concerned about the piece that relates to convincing landlords to do what they're legally obliged to do. Uh, and you heard some testimony that it varies from community to community. Are you also satisfied that what we're trying to do at the state level will assure prompt and, a, and adequate attention by landlords to remediate their facilities? I mean, I think, you know, I'm not, I, I am certainly not the expert on the legal uh, side of this, and I'm sure that my friends at legal services would have a different set of opinions, but I think this is a really important step in the right direction in that the inspection is happening and the, the option to participate in remediation programs is happening much um, sooner or at a much lower levels of, of lead poisoning, and I think that's a really important step forward. Um, I, I do agree that there remains an issue with um, enforcement, um, but I think that's true of any um, rental property concerns and is, and is always going to be an issue and that there has to be some legal recourse for that piece of it. I would agree there better be some legal recourse and given the, the poisonous nature of what we're talking about, it may need to be pretty stringent. Thank you for your testimony. Next up, we have John Brady followed by Sarah Lemaster. Yeah. Good afternoon, um, Representative Steinberg, Senator Anwar, and members of the committee. Um, my name is John Brady. I'm a registered nurse and I'm the executive vice president of AFT Connecticut. Uh, I'm here to um, testify on SB 213, an act allowing medical assistance to administer um, vaccines. Uh, AFT Connecticut opposes it in its current form. However, we think with some modifications, we, we would be able to possibly support it. Uh, our concerns stem from the training needed to become a certified medical assistant, from the specific training needed to administer medications, and by oversight ability by the state of Connecticut. Training to become a medical assistant can vary from being trained exclusively in a physician's office to an associate's degree, and is a big difference. While this bill does require post-secondary training, it does not specify the length or the depth of that training. Post-secondary training for CMA can, can mean as little as 10 weeks. The bill also calls for specific training in the administration of, of vaccines, and we support that. We would suggest that in addition to the requirements already in the bill, that the Department of Public Health develop and administer a training and certification program that would specifically allow CMAs to administer medic, uh, vaccinations. It would be consistent with certifications that are need to be a certified nursing assistant or a certified med tech. Uh, we feel that this oversight is important because without it, the ability to revoke a certification from a CMA would not be possible, as, as is done with anyone who holds a state license or certification. Um, because CMA uh, certifications currently come from one of four private associations, not the state of Connecticut. We've worked with the Connecticut Nurses Association and educators who teach um, nurse medical assistants in the community college system to develop what we think are reasonable changes to this proposed bill. And we'd be willing to work with you um, in this endeavor. Uh, in closing, just let me say that our concerns stem from the desire to maintain safety in the administration of medication, a, a concern I know that you all have. And we would look forward to uh, working with you to address these concerns. And thank you for the service you do for the people of Connecticut. Thank you for saying so, and thank you for the services you provide the people of Connecticut. You know, a, a few years ago, before the pandemic, um, I think we were having the same conversation with, about 
education and experience. And at that juncture, I was fully willing to give you the benefit of the doubt on this, but I'm looking at it a little differently now in that we've had MAs uh, providing vaccines. We've had pharmacists in far less controlled settings than the typical situation where an MA finds himself in a supervisor in, in, a, in a supervised situation with nurses and doctors usually quickly at hand should something untoward happen as contrasted with a pharmacy which is crazy busy and it's even hard to keep an eye on somebody for 15 minutes afterwards to see if they've had a reaction. I just find it hard to say at this point with all the experience we've had that your concerns about safety, which have not been borne out in any substantial way anywhere across the nation, are warranted at this point. Well, you know, maybe maybe we should have taken the deal that you were offering a couple of years ago, sir. But um, I will say there's a difference in a doctor's office um, compared to a pharmacy. There's a lot of differences. You point out one difference, a big one. But if a, if a medical assistant is giving um, multiple vaccinations in a doctor's office, as they do, not just not just um, COVID vaccinations or flu vaccinations. There's a big difference between a, doing a COVID clinic or a flu clinic and working in a doctor's office where there's multiple medications um, that can be given. I mean, this bill does recognize that there needs to be um, a training class for um, giving before a certified medical assistant would be given to give the vaccination. We support that. Well, what I think we're saying is that because this, the medical um, CMA um, certifications are not given by the state of Connecticut, I believe they would be the only people in Connecticut able to give medications that are not overseen by the state of Connecticut as far as a certification or a license. And that, that's a concern to us because if something did go wrong, and I'm sure the doctor's office would dismiss the person, but then what? They would still have their certification to be able to move on and work somewhere else. So. Yeah, I see your point. And thank you for, for bringing up the point that uh, we added to this bill a change a few years ago, which tried to address precisely the educational requirements that the nurses brought up. So, uh, you know, if anything, we have listened to you. We have uh, changed the legislation such that it reflects that need. And now we have a vast body of data suggesting that the greatest concerns about vaccine reactions and uh, poor administration or identification simply hasn't happened. I don't know who's going to Yeah, I sent it in the I apologize for that. I hope you can agree over the, the um, all, all I'm saying is uh, I think we have greater confidence this year that uh, we're doing the right thing and we appreciate the input for everyone. Um, but uh, I feel like I'm in a different place this year than I was in the past. I have great confidence that uh, NAs can administer vaccines in, in, that, in those uh, uh, likely settings with the training that we're requiring um, so I guess we're just going to disagree, but thank you. Unless there's any other questions, thank you for your, your testimony today. Next up is Sarah LeMaster, followed by Alexandra Benista. Good afternoon, uh, distinguished leadership of the Public Health Committee. My name is Sarah LeMaster and I'm the manager of government relations and public policy for the Community Health Center Association. I am testifying today on Senate Bill 213 and House Bill 5045. Um, the Community Health Center Association is the Connecticut's primary care association. Um, throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, our health centers work to protect our communities and support our public health infrastructure. Our centers provided over 930,000 COVID tests and fully vaccinated over 395,000 residents since August of 2020. Our health centers serve residents in every legislative district. Health centers operate over 100 locations throughout Connecticut and employ over 4,000 people and have an estimated economic impact of over $800 million. We support Senate Bill 213, which would allow, which would increase the number of available vaccinators in Connecticut. Under current law, only doctors, APRNs, and pharmacists are legally permitted to administer vaccines. 
This bill would give health centers and other healthcare entities additional vaccinating staff, which would vastly expand the capabilities of our vaccine operations. Dur during the height of the vaccine, uh, the vaccine. Uh, during the height of the pandemic, when people were demanding vaccines, it was very challenging for health centers to meet that demand um, because we had low numbers of doctors and APRNs. And with those, the only staff available to give vaccines, those staff could not be redirected to offer other services. Additionally, we would like to testify in support of House Bill 5045 and Act Reducing Lead Poisoning. This would increase the threshold for or it, this would increase the threshold for treatment for lead poisoning, indicate, meaning that more people would have access to treatment if this bill was passed. In 2020, 106,000 children were health center patients and over 75% of our patients live at or below 200% of the federal poverty level. Lead poisoning is much more common in children who live in housing that has not been updated or repainted and chipping lead paint is a very common cause of lead poisoning in children. It is also more likely to affect children due to the, due the high amounts of heavy metal absorption in the early stages of human development. And early detection of, of elevated lead levels will lead to more children receiving treatment for lead poisoning. By decreasing the reporting threshold, this will also give healthcare providers better data with respect to population health and help more children access treatment. I'll add that exposure to lead can seriously harm a child's health, growth, and development and have long-term impacts on a child's life. Because lead poisoning is more prevalent among children living in older housing, it's an issue that overwhelmingly affects children living in poverty. I'll add that many, many years ago, I did a lot of work on childhood lead poisoning. Um, this bill is, is, is a very important um, issue for the committee to take up, um, and I appreciate the opportunity to testify today. Thank you, Sarah, for your testimony. I, I know you're not a medical professional, but since you followed the, the uh, nurse who just spoke, uh, how do you respond to the concern about vaccines beyond the flu vaccine, beyond the COVID vaccine, potentially presenting greater complications that an MA might not be able to handle? Um, we There are 48 other states that allow medical assistance to administer vaccines. Um, to my knowledge, there hasn't been a significant increase in issues in those states. Um, I am not an authority on um, the administration of other types of vaccines, um, but I will also add that uh, with the pandemic, there's been concern about the number of appointments that children have been going to and a decrease in overall um, uh, pediatric vaccinations because, because we're you know, we're, we're just now increasing the number of appointments that children can go to and so on and so forth. So I think that um, if we, have the ability to um, increase the number of staff that are available to vaccinate, it will result in more children being vaccinated and more people being vaccinated. Um, so I, I will also add that the the impact on, on staffing levels was um, in, especially during the sort of height of vaccination at the, this time last year, um, had a really strong impact on, on health centers. Um, it, uh, it was really, health centers would have to take doctors and APRNs off of, you know, re offering regular medical appointments to administer vaccines. Um, that's a procedure that 48 other states have trained their, um, have trained their staff, have trained their medical assistants in doing. Um, so the fact that we had to pull, you know, highly qualified doctors and APRNs to do something that medical assistants could do made the situate, made it more challenging to, to meet those staffing requirements. I think it is an interesting point that here we are talking about how desperate we are to find nurses to fill roles all the way across the board. And we're oftentimes obliging them to be the ones to administer vaccines when they might, their time might be better used delivering higher level care to others. So I think you make a very good point. I don't see any other questions. So thank you for your testimony. And we will move next to Alexandra Benzanista. I probably got that a little bit wrong, at least. Followed no, by got it right. Sandra Eilers. Thank you so much for the opportunity to enter my testimony as it relates to House Bill 5044. 
My name is Alexandra Bambinista. I am from Trumbull, Connecticut. I am a founder of Glorious Recovery Foundation, a small nonprofit that organizes diverse and super fun events for people in recovery, their families, their kids, and friends. I'm also a person in long-term recovery, which means that I have alcohol and substance free for over six and a half years. I'm a mom of three high school teenagers and an employee of a large corporation where I lead recovery-friendly workplace initiatives. Recovery, recovery, recovery. Let's invest to help people achieve long-term recovery. There is not enough done and not enough funding allocated to recovery. When I speak recovery, I mean also including families and persons of loss. I'm here to urge the committee to include individuals and organizations from across our Connecticut recovery community included in the discussions of funds distribution. There are many areas of recovery that are in dire needs of funding such as enriching life of recovery, higher education, employment opportunities, housing, peer recovery support. Please note, I'm not minimizing the need for better access to treatment, adequate financial assistance for treatment, or prevention effort, but I have seen millions of dollars already allocated to these off efforts, while small nonprofit organizations such as Glorious Recovery, Brian Cody's Law, Redemption House, and many others are 100% volunteer rise, uh, run Pay, get paid zero dollars, are in front lines every day helping anyone who asks, working nights, often using our own personal funds to help those in need, and often get donations from those who are already under poverty line. The, main, the majority of individuals who enter recovery face so many challenges. Here are some examples. Denial of employment because of criminal records, inadequate, inadequate employer recovery support for long-term recovery, no funds to pursue higher education, no scholarships, no internships, offering, after settling for subpar jobs but qualified to do so much more, are seriously underpaid and overworked because the only opportunities are in the treatment or recovery fields, which already are lacking funding, inability to enjoy simple lives, um, even going to movies because they can barely pay, pay their bills. These are the challenges that we, the volunteers of small nonprofits with minimal funds, continue to serve, solve um, in our spare time at night while most Americans are enjoying their beauty sleep. I urge you to consider the following. As a person in recovery, please bring us to the table and consider our unique perspectives. As an owner of um, small nonprofit, please allocate funds to us, the small nonprofits in Connecticut. As an employee of large corporations, please demand that corporate America steps up and helps us as well. Thank you for letting me participate in this public hearing. Well, thank you for your testimony, Alexandra. Uh, but more importantly, for turning your personal experience into positive help for so many other people. You make a, a number of really important points about how we do not value you and to, to a large degree even stigmatize your experience to the point where uh, we frustrate your ability to help others. So uh, uh, you, your successes are even more impressive in that light. Uh, certainly, uh, there's gonna be an opportunity which may not come again in a long while for us to be able to uh, allocate funds to take care of a lot of people who are part of the solution. And uh, certainly we will consider your testimony very carefully as we try to craft legislation that assures that the entire continuum of care is recognized and supported. Seeing no further questions, thank you for your testimony. Next up is Cassandra Eilers, followed by Lisa Winkler. Thank you, Chairs Abrams, Steinberg, and members of the Public Health Committee. My name is Cassandra Eilers, and I'm the president of the Connecticut chapter of the Association of Perioperative Registered Nurses, otherwise known as AORN. I'm here to express my support of Senate Bill 89, an act concerning surgical smoke. So here talking about surgical smoke in the OR, it's an issue that impacts operating room nurses and surgical technicians surgeons, patients, and all others who pass through the doors of an operating room. As a healthcare worker, I took an oath to cause no harm, and yet I'm often surrounded by the surgical smoke that's associated with numerous health problems. 
I warn my patients of the risk of cigarette smoke, and yet a day in the operating room for me can be the equivalent of inhaling the smoke of 27 to 30 unfiltered cigarettes. The very real chronic and damaging physical effects of surgical smoke, such as breathing problems, increased risk of lung cancer, and headaches affect many of us who work in the operating room. More painful still is that there's a wide variety of inexpensive products that are available to solve this problem, but they're not being used or they're not being used every time. As an operating room nurse, the hazards of sur surgical smoke are more than just statistics or data points in a study. It's a part of my daily life. Day in and day out, I'm exposed to this noxious smoke at my workplace. There are some doctors that refuse to use smoke evacuation equipment while there are others that will not operate without a smoke evacuation unit available. These particular surgeons will cancel a case and avoid the risk of exposure to themselves. But as a staff nurse, we have no option to cancel cases and walk out. If the surgeon is willing to operate without smoke evacuation, or if the surgeon is refusing to use smoke evacuation equipment, we have no tools at our disposal to protect ourselves from exposure. I'm hoping that this legislation can provide the necessary protections across the board so that I do not have to question my health and safety in the workplace. So most surgical facilities in Connecticut do have surgical smoke evacu ev evacuation equipment available, um, but many of these facilities may evacuate surgical smoke during some procedures. Few facilities evacuate consistently during all smoke generating procedures. The good news is that the facility I work at is currently in the process of purchasing the necessary equipment to cover every procedure room. They're engaged in contract negotiations, which ensure the cost of equipment is reasonable and agreeable for the budget on hand. I do wanna point out that the cost of purchasing a surgical smoke pencil is the difference of around 10 to $20 from a handpiece of a smoke evacuation versus a non-smoke evacuation pencil. It seems like a small price to pay for the safety and assurance of care for the employees. And at a time when healthcare workers are experiencing burnout and leaving the profession, Connecticut can take important steps to protect the health and safety of the operating room staff and support the workforce that Connecticut residents rely on for their health care delivery. So please support Senate Bill 89, which enacts a simple and accessible solution to a problem faced by everyone in the operating room while ensuring the flexibility of how hospitals and surgical centers can administer this solution. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. I think you, you uh, gave us a little bit more nuance than some of the things that we've heard earlier today. Uh, no surprise, it sounds as if the surgeon is boss in the operating suite and makes the final determination about whether they use it or not. Would you agree that it's necessary to, to compel the surgeon to use the equipment, assuming it's available, in order to assure that everybody in the operating theater is protected? So there are many different um, personalities and preferences from surgeon to surgeon. There, Like I said, there are some that don't want to use it at all, some that do uh, want to use it every single time. And it's not only about having the education for the surgeons, but also having the buy-in for the understanding that it's not just the surgeon's health and wellness that, you know, I think Senator Anwar had mentioned earlier that, you know, these doctors might come in and spend two hours, two, two, two to four hours, of, you know, of, for a case, but the staff that are in the operating room are in there eight to 10 hours a day, seven day, six, seven days a week. So it's really a matter of how much exposure uh, over time and really getting that education forward is important. But at this point, there's nothing for us to be able to fall back on and say, it, it's necessary for you to, to, help, um, to help our health and wellness. To repeat my question though, would you agree that the only solution beyond actually having the appropriate equipment available is to compel the surgeon or whoever's in charge of the operating suite to use it every time that surgical smoke is generated. Yes, and I'm hoping that policies and procedures will be able to hold the accountability um, for that. Thank you. Uh, Senator Summers has a question. Yes, hello, how are you, Cassandra? Nice Good to, to see, see you, Dr. Senator Summers. <laughs> So um, 
I know the smell of surgical smoke oh so well. Um, and oh, sorry. I don't know if anybody spoke to that because I've been bouncing between uh, two different committees, but um, it, it actually smells toxic when you're um, in that OR. You want to put icy hot under your nose just so you don't have to. Once you smell it, it's a smell you can't unsmell. But I have a, a question on why would surgeons refuse to use that? Can you, I'm, I'm really curious, just because of technique or, or why would they, if the equipment was available, um, why would they say that they're not going to use it? So a lot of the time that uh, I've experienced so far is that we just didn't have the equipment available. I know Dana had spoke earlier about having to fight over the equipment. I've actually played rock, paper, scissors with staff members to see who gets the smoke evacuation for the day. Um, but in terms of some reasons that I have heard uh, would be that the, the sound or the noise of the evacuate, the smoke evacuator is too loud or the hand the hand unit, the pencil is cumbersome or not, they're not happy with it. And with that, we've come a long way with the smoke evacuator units that, you know, the one or two ancient units that we have in our, that they might be remembering and having those big loud machines versus we just recently purchased a brand new batch of um, generators that are quieter than most of the other equipment in our room. So we've come a long way with uh, technology advancements on that front. And in terms of the pencils, there are opportunities for the providers to participate in the buy-in of this policy uh, creation and facility to facility, find out what works best for them um, in terms of trial and error on that. And then my last question, do you find a difference um, on the um, age of the surgeon as far as their willingness to use a smoke evacu evacuator versus not? Like some of the younger surgeons might be more um, abreast of some of the new technology that's out there, or is it just overall just? I think it's very, it's varied across the board. Okay. Okay, well, I'm very supportive of this bill. I think it's very important. Um, I, I know myself and Senator Underwood had put this in as a bill, and I, I think it's necessary for public health of our healthcare providers and, um, I, you know, I think that there's a way that we can work with the hospital association and the surgical centers to make sure that it happens. So I appreciate your testimony today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Senator. Thank you for your testimony. Next up is Lisa Winkler, followed by Marshall Smith. Thank you so much, Representative Steinberg. My name is Lisa Winkler and distinguished members of the, the Public Health Committee. Um, my name is Lisa Winkler and I am the co-executive director of the Connecticut Association of Ambulatory Surgery Centers. Um, thank you for the opportunity to comment today on Senate Bill 89, an act concerning surgical smoke. Just by way of background, surgical centers provide same day surgical care, including diagnostic and preventive health care procedures that are less expensive and reduce long-term health care costs for patients. In fact, ambulatory surgery centers are the high quality, lower cost option, saving patients millions of dollars each year through lower co-payments. For colonoscopy alone, ambulatory surgery centers, according to the ASC Association, saved Connecticut residents $6.4 million in one year when they received care in an ASC. Throughout the pandemic, ASC supported the COVID response, suspending elective cases, sharing staff and critical PPE and providing needed equipment like anesthesia machines, while standing ready to assist in providing care when needed. Connecticut surgery centers take safety very seriously. All are licensed and highly regulated and all belong to a patient safety organization. Unlike other states, Connecticut also imposes a gross receipts tax on surgery centers, taking millions of dollars out of centers each year that would usually be inv invested in cutting edge technology, staffing, and equipment. In fact, Connecticut surgery centers are taxed both as small businesses and as healthcare providers in our state. The legislation before you today establishes new requirements for hospitals and surgery centers designed to limit staff exposure to surgical smoke. Just to give you a little bit of an understanding, at present, many centers in Connecticut do have systems in place. Others like endoscopy centers that do not produce surgical smoke outside of the body cavity do not. And other centers are reviewing the technology and looking at the costs in connection with their capital budgets. So the good news is we're well on the path here. Surgical smoke is a complex um, issue, and according to information shared by the Joint Commission, legislation to mandate evacu evacuation units was first introduced 20 years ago. At present, I believe we've had three states that have passed the legislation. Um, 
I think starting in, in 2018, AORN has really led the effort um, across the country to, to raise awareness about this issue. Uh, the Joint Commission recently released the Quick Safety 56, The Dangers of Surgical Smoke. And the document includes specific recommendations for safety at actions to protect patients and healthcare workers alike. My testimony includes some of those recommendations, but really it's implementing procedures and policies and using standard precautions, masking, and things of that nature. Um, given the new regulatory recommendations being developed and, and promulgated by the Joint Commission, the costs associated with the ASC tax and its impact on ASC budgets, the current limitations of some smoke evacuation systems, and the need for education and training, I think that's an important point. I think the last speaker talked a little bit about some of the, the issues that um, arise when we talk about this. I think education and training are, are a really important part of this Issue and Excuse moving me, in the right Ms. direction. Winkler, your time is almost up. If you please, um, sure. Some... Thank you so much. So we have uh, just a couple of recommendations on this front. You know, to require surgery centers and hospitals to uh, to establish policies and procedures to address surgical smoke exposure rather than specific systems. Exempt endoscopy centers and eye centers where no surgical smoke is generated. We talked a little bit with AORN last week, and I think the difference in Connecticut is that we have an all encompassing definition of surgery centers. Um, so that was a, a little nuance that we'd like to address potentially, and we're working on some language that we can share on that front. Um, and then extend the implementation date. I think we heard a little bit from Jim Acabellis and others about acquiring the information. I think that's a piece of it, um, as well as the training and education, because you know when you use this, this suction and technology inappropriately, it can actually damage tissue. And so we wanna be sure that, that people are properly trained and using it effectively. But the good news is we're on the, on the right path. And um, I, I think as Senator Summers said during her questions, um, I, I think that we can get there with this, with these changes that we, we are suggesting. I, I think we must work together to ensure that we develop an approach that maintains the safety and well, well-being of our staff and continues our ability to provide high quality, lower cost care to our patients. Thank you so much. Thank you. I, I just had one question because I think I may have misheard you. You said that in the, it was maybe in the case of endoscopy that there's no surgical smoke generated outside the body cavity? Right, so when you're doing colonoscopy procedures, when you're removing um, you know, polyps or things like that, so the, the endoscopes actually, the, colon, the colonoscopes actually have suction available in them. And so it's not really generated outside the body. I think when we were talking with AORN, I think the issue is sort of protecting patients, uh, protecting staffing from the exposure to that smoke, but it's really contained there, so we really feel like there should be an exemption for facilities like that because right now they're included in that uh, requirement to to have those, you know, uh, systems in place based on the legislation. Well, I'm greatly relieved. I thought you were advocating that it's okay to leave surgical smoke inside the colon. Oh no, <laughs> they have. I'm sorry, my testimony. Yeah, we had, the colonoscopes actually have that suction, and so it sort of pulls it out, but it does not expose the staff to that. Um, you know, the smoke. So that's what we were asking to sort of carve those centers out of that requirement. Well, thank you for that clarification. I'm sure. <laughs> uh, seeing no further questions, thank you for your testimony and we'll take a look at your recommended uh, adaptations very closely. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Next up is Marshall Smith, followed by, I believe our last testifier, Carmen Myers. Uh, welcome, Marshall. Thank you, Mr. Chair and um, honorable members of the committee. Um, my name is, excuse me, Marshall Smith, and I'm the executive director of the Interstate Medical Licensure Compact Commission. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions um, that you might have about the compact. And um, I am the physician compact, um, and that's part of uh, Governor's Bill 5046 that I am speaking in favor of. Um, the compact was invited to participate, and we did actively participate in the work groups that were held um, and very much appreciate the opportunity to do that. Um, I think they were, they actually, quite honestly, were very impressive and comprehensive in their work and asked a lot of great questions. And um, I think they, they, I'm glad they recommended that you adopt the compact. Um, we are looking forward to our continued um, involvement should the bill pass and, and hopefully um, Connecticut will become state um, and territory number 37 in the compact. We've had two new um, states that have joined since um, 
that work, um, the state of Ohio and the state of New Jersey that have now joined the compact and we're actively working with them to get them onboarded and being able to um, participate. Um, the compact itself was created to answer a very simple question, which is what are the common standards of licensure that can be primary source verified by one state that would be accepted by all of the other states and would allow them to then issue a license outside of their normal um, traditional licensing process. And the compact was the answer to that question. And we, we've been operating for five years now. Um, we have um, received and processed over 20,000 applications. That represents about 12,000 physicians that have used our process. And there are over 30,000 licenses issued by our 36 uh, member states and territories. Um, we um, I, I guess I'm, I would like to put out four main points about the compact. Um, one is that we are a cost effective, streamlined way for licensing physicians for both physicians and states. Um, second, we um, states in the compact have increased their physician workforce while my, maintaining control over how those physicians use that, pra, uh, that license that they receive. Number three, physicians who use the compact have to meet rigorous quality and safety standards um, in order to, we have a very high bar by which physicians have to meet. Once they've met those, then they're allowed to get the licenses through the compact. And four, people who reside in compact states enjoy more access to specialists and receive a better coordinated care. There were several testimonies earlier about that and how, um, how important it is to be able to use, um, to be licensed in multiple states and, and follow your patients. Um, Excuse uh, me, Mr. Smith, your time is almost up. If you could please summarize, thank you. I will. Thank you very much. Um, the one, my last comment is to, to give you a rough uh, example example of, of kind of how the compact works. We, um, everyone goes to the airport, everyone has to go through the x-ray machine, um, but there are two ways to get there. You can follow the traditional way, which is um, very well established, or you can become um, a TSA pre approved, go through all this work and, and be allowed to quickly get to the x-ray machine. The compact works in a similar way. We have physicians that are known, have practice, don't have criminal background checks, meet high bar standards, and they can get to the licensing process quickly. We have, um, on average, it, a physician can be issued a license after they've met the qualifications within seven to 10 days. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you for your testimony. Yes, uh, you arrived late in the day and uh, you, you're a great cleanup hitter, uh, but a lot of this was covered earlier. We will look at your suggestions very carefully. Uh, Representative Pettit has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Marshall Smith. Doc, Dr. Smith? Nope, just a plain old mister. Mister. Um, the, the, uh, Haven in Connecticut, which is our health assistance program for most of the healthcare professionals licensed in the state, there is some concern raised potentially about interplay with different states in terms of confidentiality. Is that an issue that you, that, is that an area that you think will cause us difficulties? Um, no, there, there, there are several other states um, in the compact, two of them that, uh, that, I, that I know of specifically, Alabama and um, the state of Colorado that have similar type programs. Um, they are able to operate in the compact and it, it's not been an issue. Um, it, it, the, there is no intention of the compact to prevent physicians from receiving the, the care that they need through organizations like Haven. And um, I've, I've seen the um, proposed amendments from Haven. Um, we don't have an issue. The compact does not have an issue with the first um, suggested change. It's, it's providing clarification. We do have concerns about the second issue or the second recommended change to the compact, which is to change our rulemaking process um, that before that could become effective, all of our other 36 states would have to ha uh, pass a similar um, legislation. I think it can be resolved. Um, and we provided um, comments to um, Mr. Anderson um, about, about that. 
Beautiful. Thank, thank you very much, sir. That's very helpful. Thank you. Um, your clarifications really will help us make sure we get it right. Seeing no further questions, thank you for your testimony. Next up is Carmen Myers, and I understand number 92, Jean Ring, has come back, so she will be our last. Uh, first up is Carmen. Hi, my name is Carmen Myers, and I'm talking about the bill 5277, if I'm correct. I'm calling because I have a few things to say. First of all, I would like to talk about myself. Myself, my name is Carmen Myers, um, and I have been severely disabled since birth. And um, I've had a lot of surgeries, a lot of issues with radiology and CAT scans and stuff that I've been needing. But I've been denied an MRI. I've been denied a CAT scan because I couldn't get on to the table. Now, um, I really feel it's appropriate that um, they get maybe a, a Hoyer lift or a ceiling lift that would assist us to get on the table, which would help the tech who is normally alone, especially after hours, or but can be able to move um, move our time in a better manner and um, be able to come to a conclusion of having something positive done with our test um, so then we could feel better about getting better um, I also feel um, and I've been married for 24 and a half years to a beautiful young man, man named Robert Myers who was a quadriplegic and he whenever I brought him to the hospital who happened to be my husband whenever I brought him to the hospital um, they would need they would need a lift but they didn't have it and um, the only thing he had to pull him by was one arm, and they would hurt him. Um, he would get hurt because they didn't, you know, properly have the right tools to get him over to the table better than a sliding board, whereas a lift would work a lot easier. And I think they should have one in one radiology room, and you know, um, have them in in um, the facilities where they do these tests. Um, it would really help us all to be more comfortable and safer. And um, I want to thank you for your time and thank you for listening to me. And please, I hope you can take me in a serious manner, considering I haven't been able to, to comply, not because of me, but because I'm not able to walk. And I believe that I need accessibility. And um, I have COPD, I have arthrogyposis, congenital other muscles and joints, and I was found with congestive heart failure. And um, there's tests that I need to have done. I need to have my oxygen check. Well, I, I know, Carmen isn't there, but I will just say for everybody's benefit that, of course, we take what she says very seriously and appreciate her making that extraordinary effort to testify. Uh, we have Jean Ring, and I understand there's somebody on the phone who's going to be our final act. But first, Jean. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please proceed. Okay. Uh, good evening, uh, Chairman Abrams, Chairman Steinberg, and members of the Healthcare Committee. My name is Jeannie Ring, and I'm a perioperative registered nurse with over 40 years of experience. I am also a member of the AORN, and I'm here to express support for Senate Bill 89, an act concerning surgical smoke. I began my nursing career, as I said, more than 40 years ago. 40 years ago, as a young nurse, concerned for discussions of surgical smoke was non-existent, and to be honest, it wasn't something I even thought about. But today, in 2022, we now have the evidence that gives us the impact that surgical smoke has on members of the surgical teams. I have personally been in operating rooms where the smoke was so thick, it was impossible to take a deep breath. You have heard many of my colleagues testify on the dangers of surgical smoke, its long-term effects, illnesses and diseases, 
that we are exposed to every day, so I'm not going to repeat them. But for the last six years, I've been employed as a professional development coordinator, teaching the art, science, and skills that perioperative nurses need to have to become competent in this highly specialized field of nursing. The nurses that I am teaching today will be our future leaders, and we need to give them the tools to function safely in an ever-changing environment in the operating room. During one of my lectures on electrosurgery, the subject of surgical smoke was discussed. One of my graduate nurses would ask me the question, is it safe to work in the operating room? The question caught me by surprise, as we have the technology to evacuate smoke, but it's not always used as it should be. So I'm here today to ask this committee to support Senate Bill 89, help us to provide a safe environment for our surgical teams and our patients. The next time I give a lecture on electrosurgery, I want our new nurses who are just beginning their careers in the operating room to know that their health and well being is supported by the leaders in the state of Connecticut. We must advocate for our surgical teams and patients by requiring smoke evacuation systems to be used as they were intended. We need a smoke free environment, and I ask for your support in passing Senate Bill 89. And thank you very much for your attention on this matter. Thank and you, I will Jeannie, answer any questions. Thank you, Jeannie, for your for your testimony. As you've heard here, even in most recent witnesses, uh, we're all pretty serious about doing something about this this year. So uh, thank you for your testimony. We'll have uh, continued conversations about how to get this bill uh, the way it needs to be for passage. But uh, we really appreciate it. And uh, seeing no questions, we will hear from the person on the phone as our last act. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hello, everyone. Uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to speak. And thank you to the Attorney General's Office and Governor Lamont for the hard work that got us here. Now, I'm speaking on behalf of Scott Choquette. Uh, who is a on the board of directors of For Cameron. Scott represents For Cameron, a, non, a New Haven-based nonprofit that advocates for substance use disorder, harm reduction, prevention, treatment, and recovery, and to break the stigma associated with opioid addiction. He testifies in support of HB 5044, an act implementing the governor's budget recommendations regarding the use of opioid litigation proceeds. Today is the day to celebrate this victory. We have won a bottle, but the war rages on. Back in January, we presented a legislative proposal to many members of this committee, and I've had numerous conversations since. Overdose deaths in Connecticut are increasing dramatically. Every year, despite our best efforts, Overdose deaths exceed deaths by gun violence in Connecticut. According to the CDC, an opioid epidemic costs Connecticut over $10 billion annually. The following four specific problems require and deserve our attention. Number one, as we speak, there are dozens of families searching for inpatient treatment toward recovery who cannot find it. We have a devastating shortage of both beds available in the state, and this is unacceptable. According to the National Institute on Drug Abuse, research has shown unequivocally that good outcomes are contingent on adequate treatment length, generally for the resident or outpatient treatment. Participation is less than 90 days, and it is of limited effectiveness. And treatment lasting significantly longer is recommended for ma maintaining positive outcomes. After a course of intensive treatment, the provider should ensure a transition to less intensive continuing care to support and monitor individuals in their ongoing recovery. Insurance providers currently will fund only up to 21 days of treatment and limited following treatment and limited following on outpatient treatment. This must change. Number three, the Navigator Pilot Program that passed this body last year must be funded and extended to provide support for those with SUD to gain access and treatment in many cases. 
And number four, most overdose deaths involving illicit manufactured fentanyl go uninvestigated. The few that are and that result in an array and arrest carry a penalty similar to the one for the sale of other less legal recreational drugs. We've proposed an opioid task force to investigate these cases and harsher penalties for knowingly dealing drugs laced with fentanyl. I urge the, we urge the committee to go further than the bill that we're discussing today and complement it by acting on our proposal. Once again, I speak for Scott Choquette and his wife who have lost their son, for Cameron who has lost their son, to make zero that I have lost my son and Brian Cody, who's lost his son. Thank you very much for your time. I very much appreciate it. Well, thank you for your patience, but you can't leave yet. We have a couple of questions, questions for you, okay. starting with Representative Parker, followed by Representative Beck. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Lisa, is that you? Yes, it is. That I recognize my your representative, voice. Don Michael Lisa, Parker. thank you so much for, for being here with us and for finding a way to, to speak and, and share that on behalf of Scott. We're very appreciative. Um, and I want to thank you and, and um, the folks you're working with for taking the time to present to us a few months ago and to have all the follow-up conversations. It's been so helpful, and I'm encouraged by the work we've been doing and, and hopeful that, especially in the other opioids bill we're working on, we'll be able to move some of this forward. I just also want to highlight that um, you've noted some potential policy issues that fall a bit outside of the public health committee, and I think it's helpful mm -hmm. to be continuing to share that on the radar of the folks that are here. And I know that uh, we look forward to helping move those proposals along through other committees as well, to the extent that's possible. So mostly just saying thank you to you, Lisa, and to the folks that have been here with this um, and uh, looking forward to the, the next conversations with you. Well, I'm, I'm very honored to have you representing my district. Um, and I very much appreciate along with our group, so much hard work that you put in to this um, and as you know, it's very near and dear to our hearts. We can't bring back our children, but we can certainly do so much to help those that still have time. Okay, uh, thank you, Lisa. You made a very good point. Representative Parker has done a tremendous amount of work with regard to this subject, and we're not done with asking him to do more. Uh, next up is Representative Betts, followed by Senator Kushner, followed by Representative McCarty. You've generated a lot of last minute questions. Uh, Representative <laughs> Betts. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Lisa. I'm very sorry to hear the loss of your son and, and the others, too. It's, it's always painful and very tragic. But you were citing some numbers about the success of treatment. And the longer people stay there, the greater the chance of recovery. And I would agree with that. But there's one stipulation, as I understand it, that affects all that. Do these people who receive the treatment, are they there on a voluntary basis? Because my understanding is if they're over 18 years old, they can go in and they can leave at any point they so choose. Am I correct in that? That's absolutely the truth. Unfortunately, those of us who had children over 18 could not even get any information about those that we admitted ourselves and spent our own money for. Yes, they need to stay there voluntarily. There's no doubt about it. But during these 21 first days, it, I, and I, I'm sorry, I don't know the percentage, but it's high. Most of them are sober at that point, but they need to continue the treatment. It's absolutely imperative that they do. I agree. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank, Thank you very you, much. Senator Kushner, followed by Representative McCarty. Thank you, Lisa, for your testimony. And I too want to say I'm sorry for your loss. Uh, I always, when I hear people name the names of people I've heard of, it does really, I think it's so important. And um, I know you mentioned Brian Cody, Elvis Nova Sr., who is my constituent and my dear friend, lost his son and has been working with uh, Tony Morrissey and, and Tracy Morrissey on the Cody's, Cody Bryant uh, reform package that was presented. Um, but it also makes me want to acknowledge my dear friend who we lost, Jordy Lamb and 
my brother's um, stepson who he lost Asa. So, you know, I think it's really important to remember the people who have died and, and to do everything we can to make sure we're uh, preventing more deaths. And so thank you for being here and I appreciate all your suggestions. Thank you very much. And I'm sorry for your losses as well. Last up, Representative McCarthy. Yeah. Can you hear me, Representative? I'm sorry. Excuse me. I, I too wanted to add my voice to Lisa and thank her for being here and for her and to give my empathy for her loss. My family too has lost someone. And so I know very much that you outlined very correctly the needs that we need to do. I'm wondering, Lisa, if you could think some more and get back to us a little bit more on follow up, because I think that's very crucial. And I would look also to see what kind of counseling, grief counseling, we could add to some of that for the family members uh, going forward. And then just recognizing the leadership on public health committee for really helping to get the Navigator program through. So thank you for mentioning that we really have to follow through with that and be sure that the funding is put in place. So I just really and wanted we to thank will you be following up. understand this very well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, thank you, Lisa. We're counting on you to follow up. Uh, we wanna make sure that uh, all worthy programs are considered for allocation of funding. So, uh, you had to wait a long time to testify, but we really appreciate it. And thank you on behalf of Scott also. He had to go to a meeting tonight. He was all set and ready to go uh, this morning. But anyway, um, and that was Scott's proposal and we will absolutely be following up and continuing to work with um, John Michael Parker. Thank you all very much. Have a good evening. You too. Well, this brings us to the end of our day's hearing. I, I know this will disappoint all those people at home who are used to spending their evenings with us, uh, that we've only put in less than 10 hours today. And I, for all those shirkers out there, you, you, there's still more work to be done. Uh, we're next together again. Um, I know we have a hearings on Wednesday the 9th. We have a series of another series of bills to discuss. I want to thank everybody, particularly our staff, for dealing with the uh, newest technological innovation that of all the video testimony we received. Uh, despite the initial glitch, we did it very seamlessly and I'm very appreciative. Um, thank you all for your hard work today and for um, uh, helping us really elucidate the key points in a lot of today's testimony. That's it for us. We will see you all on Wednesday. Everyone, please have a great evening.